All right, good, good morning, everyone. Everybody hear me? Am I on? Okay, great. Um, I'm Mark McClellan. I'm the director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. And on behalf of the Duke Margolis Center uh, and the FDA, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's uh, public event on evaluating the presser effects of drugs and ambulatory blood pressure monitoring studies, which we at Duke Margolis are convening under a cooperative agreement with the FDA. Uh, as you all know, the issues surrounding blood pressure monitoring uh, are of uh, substantial importance across a wide range of clinical studies and have important downstream impacts on patient care and potentially uh, health outcomes for populations. In May of 2018, FDA released a draft guidance for industry on these issues titled Assessment of Presser Effects of Drugs. The guidance advises industry on the pre-marketing assessment of a drug's effect on blood pressure and addresses the precision of blood pressure measurements. The guidance specifically highlighted four areas in which FDA welcomes feedback from experts. One is the temporal relationship between changes in blood pressure and changes in risk. Second, the precision study and its relevance to FDA's recent draft guidance. Third, diverse developmental programs and the evaluation of blood pressure effects among different diverse, potentially, potentially diverse patient populations. And then fourth, uh, use of placebo groups in ambulatory blood pressure monitoring studies. Following the public comment period on the guidance document, today's public meeting is an opportunity for stakeholders to provide some further input on these subjects for FDA in this um, uh, interactive environment as they continue to refine the guidance. In addition, today, our colleagues from FDA will present some new internal analyses of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring studies with the goal of further discussing their role in clinical development. We're going to have time throughout the day for audience questions and answers and feedback uh, during each of the sessions. And then we have a final session at the end of the day that is an open comment period to make sure everything uh, that you all would like to raise has gotten covered uh, during our time together. Throughout the day, we hope to move towards uh, more consensus where possible and engage in discussions that foster the regulatory science advances that FDA wants to use to guide their evaluation of the pressure effects of drugs. So this is an important step in that overall process and an important area for clinical product development and management of potential safety risks. So thank you all for joining us today. Before we get started, just a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. As I said, this is an interactive meeting. We're gonna have time in each session for discussion with those of you who are here today. Uh, for, you, for those of you who are in attendance, we have a wireless uh, microphone set up at each table for use during the day. When you have a question in these parts of the sessions, please uh, uh, wave, stand, uh, do something to indicate, uh, to let us know that you'd like to, to be called on. And uh, the moderator for the session will make every effort to uh, get everyone engaged in the discussion. When you use that microphone, uh, there are a couple of different type, types here. I see some in the front tables that have kind of a square at the bottom. There's a button on the bottom that you press to turn it on. The mics are all live. Um, uh, some of the mics have a switch. Uh, just be sure to turn it on when you're making your comment. And uh, for those of you who are joining us by uh, webcast, uh, thank you uh, for joining us as well. And we encourage you to participate in today's discussion as well. Uh, if you have a question for a panel, you can send them to us. That's at uh, presser at duke.edu presser at duke.edu, that's the email address for questions or comments, and we'll try to incorporate as many of those as possible into the meeting as well. Um, for those of you who are here, uh, Wi-Fi information is on the table in the foyer outside the meeting space if you're having any trouble getting connected. Um, and again, we really appreciate all of you uh, here in the room and online taking the time to, to join us today. 
I want to remind everyone that this is a public meeting and the event is being broadcast, so everything you say is going to be part of the record for the event. For those of you who are in the room today, feel free to help yourself to coffee and beverages located just outside. Lunch will be on your own. We have a break uh, uh, period for that, and there are plenty of uh, very good options in the, uh, in the nearby area. There are some restaurant maps available at the registration desk. And finally, just want to remind you all, too, that although this meeting is being convened under a cooperative agreement with the FDA, it is not a federal advisory committee or a full Part 15 hearing. There will be no votes uh, or, or formal uh, consensus determination, et cetera. The meeting will be a success if there is a good, strong exchange of ideas and open discussion. So uh, that's the, the framing for today. Um, we'd like to get going right now with some opening remarks from Dr. Ellis Unger, who's the director of the Office of Drug Evaluation One and the Office of New Drugs, and then from Dr. Norman Stockbridge, the director of the Division of Cardiovascular and Renal Products, uh, to help set the stage for the day's discussion. So uh, Ellis, if uh, you can come on up, and uh, I'll turn this over to you for your opening comments. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Mark, and I'd like to uh, thank uh, Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy, and I'm thanking all of you for being here and also those who are joining us on the web. Um, I think that everyone in the room understands the importance of uh, blood pressure as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, and some of you might wonder why we put out a draft guidance last May about assessing the blood pressure effects of drugs, because this is hardly new, we've been assessing blood pressure effects of drugs probably since we've been assessing new drugs. Um, but we have a huge problem in this country in terms of unrecognized, undertreated, and untreated uh, hypertension. And um, the reality is that, uh, as all of you know, there are millions of people walking around in this country with blood pressures that are, that are too high. Um, and we'd like to do everything that we can to uh, lessen the problem. So we regulate the drugs uh, that are used to treat hypertension. Norm Stockbridge is going to come up. He's the division director of the Division of Cardiovascular and Renal Drugs, and they have a, a, uh, an assortment of drugs that are highly effective in treating uh, hypertension. But we also regulate drugs throughout the FDA, throughout Office of uh, New Drugs, that actually contribute to the problem, that, that raise blood pressure. Um, and given that one of our charges at FDA is to ensure that uh, when we label the drug, we provide adequate instructions for use. It's critically important that the blood pressure effects of drugs are well characterized and well described in labeling. The magnitude of the effect should be described in labeling. The attendant risks should probably be described in labeling. And then some management strategies should be provided in labeling for drugs that can cause or exacerbate uh, hypertension. And we recognize that through the years, we haven't all, always gotten this right, um, which I'm sorry to say, but it happens to be true. Um, what we've typically done through the years is companies do, as all of you know, do studies. You get cuff blood pressure measurements at multiple visits through the studies, and you put them together and you analyze them. The FDA puts their heads together with the company's heads figures out what the blood pressure effects are and makes some attempt to, to write a label, which may or may not talk about specific uh, blood pressure changes. Um, in preparation for this workshop, I took a look at uh, four new drug applications that are sitting, in our, uh, sitting on our server waiting to be uh, analyzed. And I counted anywhere from 11,000 blood pressure measurements in, in one for one drug to 40, about 45,000 for another drug. And that is very typical. So all these patients put out their arms and will have a machine general Dynamap or whatever, uh, measure blood pressure. And then the question is, well, what does FDA do with all this stuff? And what do the companies do with all this stuff? And I think that sometimes we don't do as good a job as we could in actually trying to, trying to untangle those and, and, and figure out what the blood pressure effect of a drug is. About a year and a half ago, a friend came to me because she, um, well, she has osteoarthritis and she'd been taking meloxicam for a while for her osteoarthritis and the arthritis got worse and somebody increased her dose from seven and a half 
to 15 milligrams a day, and she was subjected to some stress in her life, and her blood pressure, which had been pretty well controlled, I guess, got out of control. So all of a sudden, her blood pressures were high, and she's on a higher dose of meloxicam, and she asked me, well, could it be the meloxicam? So I took a dive and looked at the meloxicam label, which I think we approved in 2000. Um, there was nothing in that label about blood pressure effect to be uh, expected. There's a box warning that says the drug can cause cardiovascular, I don't know, demise, or it doesn't say MACE exactly, um, serious cardiovascular and gastrointestinal events. Well, great, thank you. Um, maybe all of that is mediated by the blood pressure effect. I, I, we don't know. We're going to talk about that when we talk. We're going to talk about precision. But at least tell me what the blood pressure effect is. You probably got 15,000 blood pressure assessments during the trial. I went to the FDA review and uh, in our archives, and I found nothing in the review about specific blood pressure changes. So I found this rather uh, disconcerting. We have all these data, and we don't always take advantage of them. Um, so my opinion is we need to try to do this better, and this, is, this was part of the reason for the genesis of the, the guidance and, and why you're here today. And we have some specific questions for you. Uh, Dr. McClellan mentioned them. Uh, you know, one is how best do we analyze the cuff data? We're going to talk about ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and, and how to analyze that. The draft guidance has a sentence or two in there about, about how to use the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. It talks about a time-weighted average over 24 hours. Okay, and then that, that presupposes that if you have a 10 millimeter elevation for, for 12 hours, it's the same as having a 5 millimeter elevation for 24 hours. That integrates the same. Well, is that true? Um, you guys know more than we do, but, you know, drugs don't necessarily, you know, have a, drugs with shorter half-lives might have shorter effects. So there, there are all kinds of things to consider uh, in terms of how to analyze the data. We want to talk about temporal relationships between changes in blood pressure and, and changes in risk. Um, when, we, when we drafted the guidance, um, we started out kind of in the mold of the thorough QT study. It, we, we, were, we, called, we called the guidance uh, the thorough blood pressure uh, guidance for, for a while. And we had the, uh, the idea that there might be some threshold of concern, regulatory threshold of concern for blood pressure, just as there is for QT. And I think we lost our enthusiasm as time went on, and, and we, we basically came to the conclusion that we should probably assess blood pressure effects of a drug and then look at the blood pressure effects in context and make case-by-case -case decisions in terms of what to do. And you all know, and as, and as uh, articulated in the guidance, one would think about the chronicity, well, the blood pressure effect, the chronicity of use, um, the indication for which the drug is approved, and then the uh, baseline risk of the patient population. So we have to think about all those things. Um, interestingly enough, after the uh, guidance went out or around that time, FDA approved uh, testosterone enanthate preparation for testosterone replacement therapy in adult males for conditions associated with deficiency or absence of endogenous testosterone. And the drug increases blood pressure, and the uh, division and office responsible for that drug uh, approved that drug with a boxed warning, um, which is probably the first time we put a boxed warning on a drug for uh, increasing blood pressure. We have a lot of drugs that increase blood pressure. We have a drug for orthostatic hypotension, mitodrine, which increases blood pressure. We have a warning, although I don't think it's boxed. But uh, at any rate, there are a number of drugs out there that are used chronically that increase blood pressure, and we don't have boxed warnings. So something we, we want to think about, um, labeling is, is our responsibility, but uh, we want to think about, well, how should drugs be labeled? Um, so these are some of the questions that we want to try to tackle today, and we really look forward to uh, all of your insights um, this morning and this afternoon, and uh, so I'll thank all of you uh, in advance for your, your thoughts, and we're looking forward to a very uh, interesting and, uh, and deep discussion. Thank you. All right. Thank, thanks very much, Ellis. And so next is uh, Norman Stockbridge. Uh, who's going to provide some additional context for today's meeting, talk about some of the key points from the guidance document, where FDA would like 
further feedback and share some insights from his division. Norm, thanks for being here. Good morning. I, I want to add my thanks to uh, people who helped uh, put this together, uh, the Duke of Margolis people. Uh, I want to call out particularly Naomi Lowy, who helped uh, from uh, the FDA side getting this put together. Um, all of you who traveled from uh, all across the country, at least, uh, uh, some from overseas, um, uh, to get here and participate in this. Uh, the weather gods for uh, having the polar vortex last week and not this week. Um, so, uh, uh, great, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Um, we've had an interest in uh, trying to get some guidance around uh, the presser effects of drugs for some time now. Uh, Rick Turner here uh, reminds me that the CSRC meeting on this topic, how many of you were here for that? That was 2012, um, and uh, since 2012, uh, Ellis, uh, Bob Temple, uh, uh, Doug Throckmorton, a bunch of us have been meeting for three hours a day, um, uh, uh, weekdays, weekends, and holidays, uh, to try and hammer out a guidance on this topic. Um, we didn't entirely succeed. Um, uh, we never got to a place where uh, we had consensus on everything uh, that needed to go into a guidance. And uh, the first uh, group of, uh, uh, first group of sessions here this morning uh, are around four areas that we call out in the draft guidance where we didn't, couldn't even get consensus in a small room. Uh, we'll see if we do better today. Uh, otherwise, I'm not sure how many years down the road uh, a real guidance is going to be. Um, uh, as you've heard, uh, there's a, a second session on trying to do uh, ABPM, which is what we think is critical uh, technology for careful evaluation of uh, presser effects. Um, that'll be in the second uh, uh, session. And then at the end of the day, uh, we've uh, uh, allocated some time for you to talk about issues that haven't come up. The four issues that come up early in the day are the ones we identified. Uh, you may have many more, and, and we'll need to hear those. Um, and then finally, I wanted to point out that um, uh, Doug, uh, uh, Ellis pointed out uh, some analogies with the QT business. Um, we have already gotten clearance through the Office of New Drugs to start treating uh, consults relating to presser effects of drugs much the same way. Uh, we are, in fact, uh, um, uh, treating the QT business. Uh, many of you know we have a, a particular group of um, uh, reviewers, some of whom are in the room here today, um, who work on uh, the QT business, um, have developed a set of data standards, a back-end database, have published uh, a large number of papers that help move that field forward and allowed people to uh, do those studies efficiently. We're going to do the same thing with the, Q with the, with the presser business. We're going to be collecting data, uh, trying to give uh, consistent advice, uh, researching the data that we collect to uh, make uh, the uh, advice we give uh, more uh, efficient. Um, so uh, I, I am hopeful that we'll uh, uh, resolve at least some of the uh, issues that we had outstanding and uh, um, that we uh, won't need another meeting in 2024 to uh, talk about uh, how to get a guidance done. Thank you.
All right. Uh, thanks, Norm, very much for, for those remarks, too. Uh, so uh, an important meeting today, and again, glad that you all are here. Um, we want to go ahead and start our first session on understanding the temporal relationship between changes in blood pressure and changes in risk. Um, this session will include a presentation from Dr. Michael Weber, who's a professor of medicine at uh, State University of New York, Downstate College of Medicine. He's going to provide an overview of the temporal relationship between changes in blood pressure and changes in risk, which is, uh, as you just heard, an issue that's uh, very relevant to the discussion today. Um, then we're going to have a panel discussion uh, related to this uh, topic. Um, and I'd like to go ahead and, ha head and ask the panelists to come on up so we can um, uh, minimize uh, disruption as we get through the session. And I'll introduce you while you're on your way up. Um, uh, William Cushman's the Chief of Preventive Medicine Section at the Memphis Veterans Affairs Medical Center and Professor of Preventive Medicine, Medicine and Physiology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. Patrick Toomey is Medical Director in the Oncology Branch of Licensing and Early Development Safety Science at Genentech. And Hector Ventura uh, is the Section Head of Advanced Heart Failure and Heart Transplant at the John Ochsner Heart and Vascular Institute. Uh, and so uh, um, uh, Dr. Weber is going to kick us off. Thanks, Michael. Well, thank you, Mark, and uh, a real pleasure to be uh, part of these uh, deliberations today. And uh, as you heard, I'm going to give a very quick overview of some of the issues that we face in trying to link changes in blood pressure during treatment of non-cardiovascular diseases that might have important cardiovascular consequences. Oh. I'm sure this button works eventually. I don't know if someone is... Uh, Need a little help? <laughs> I seem to have gotten... I think I'm the, the... Do we have a computer where yeah, the supporting slides computer are on? seems to have gotten off of slideshow mode. <laughs> Looks like a... Uh, Just a minute. Slide, a, uh, of course, there could be a new way of presenting. You put all the slides up <laughs> at once and say, there it is, and sit down. <laughs> okay, One so here we go. We all know that epidemiology uh, has taught us very clearly there's a strong relationship between levels of blood pressure and cardiovascular outcomes. And these are data from uh, Lewington based on a million people in placebo groups followed for several years. And you can see regardless of age, blood pressure is a powerful determinant of outcomes and a 20 millimeter of mercury difference in systolic pressure doubles the risk of major events. The problem with epidemiology, fascinating as it is, is that it doesn't tell you what happens if you do something to change the blood pressure. And that's why uh, we need to study each drug in each situation separately. And to make uh, things as simple as possible, I've tried to divide what happens when you use drugs that may have off-target blood pressure effects, I've divided into three temporal categories. The first is the obvious connection, drugs that raise the blood pressure dramatically and where we would expect major bad things to happen within days or weeks. Then you have the second category where you have modest changes in pressure, three, four millimeters of mercury, does that matter over a period of weeks or months? How long does it take to see bad events occur? And then finally, the most difficult and frustrating, what do you do with drugs that only occasionally, in some vulnerable people, might raise blood pressure or may only raise blood pressure slightly, but in a lot of people? So let's have a look a little more closely at these things. And the first category is the drugs that have big effects uh, and that sh should lead to early cardiovascular events. And the best example, and I've just chosen a few examples along the way of all of these categories, uh, is Avastin, the uh, drug that's used for treating solid tumor 
cancer, very effective. It's a VEGF inhibitor. And it raises a complication right from the beginning because, yes, it does raise the blood pressure dramatically, but it also has other cardiovascular effects. It destroys vascular endothelium. It causes tissue ischemia. It has all sorts of toxic effects separate from blood pressure. So what's hypertension or changes in blood pressure? What are other factors? No question that it has dramatic results. And here is a meta-analysis showing that it uh, increases by three or fourfold the probability of patients having strokes. And we all know that. It's a, it's a well-worn story with the anti-cancer drugs like Avastin. And cerebral hemorrhage, again, dramatic increase in probability. No big surprise. In fact, a very nice article from Mayo Clinic, just their own in-house uh, data, showed that they were able to report 10 strokes all within three weeks of starting therapy. Seven of the 10 did have a history of hypertension, so people with hypertension were particularly vulnerable. And, and nine out of the 10 patients had severe hypertension soon after starting the drug, and most of them died. So no question, this is an easy problem to at least understand. What to do about it is another story, but at least we don't have to spend too long arguing what to do or how to measure the blood pressure. What about category two? Blood pressure effects sufficient to be measurable, perhaps, particularly in a cohort, uh, and we can obviously note the cardiovascular events if we're doing large clinical trials, and these are events we expect to see within weeks or months. Perhaps the best known of these studies, because it, it helped actually the cardiorenal division uh, approve two drug combinations for initiating the therapy of hypertension, was VALUE, because VALUE was a trial where two drugs were being compared. There was a difference in the blood pressure reductions between the two drugs, and within weeks, there was a, different, a difference in cardiovascular outcomes. Here are the blood pressure data, and on the top, you can see that amlodipine in uh, brown was a little more effective than valsartan, the angiotensin receptor blocker in blue, particularly in the first two or three months of treatment. And in the bottom, you see that yellow line shows indeed there was about a four millimeter of mercury difference just in the first few weeks, and then the difference got progressively less. And the result is shown here, and you can see that during that early three-month period, when there was that three to four millimeter of mercury difference, there was a significant difference between the drugs in major cardiac events. So it didn't take long for a four millimeter of mercury difference in this large cohort, there were several thousand patients in each group, to demonstrate a cardiovascular effect. So this was very crisp and clean, and the FDA was impressed by this and agreed that getting treatment started effectively and quickly was a high priority, and for the first time, they approved two drug combinations as initial therapy for hypertension. A nice piece of history there. All had another study, well known to m most of my colleagues in this uh, room, comparing three different drugs uh, to see if there was any difference in cardiovascular outcomes. And the most interesting part, in a way, was the stroke outcome when lisinopril, an ACE inhibitor, was compared with chlorothalidone, a powerful diuretic. And you can see, overall, a benefit to chlorothalidone, a lower stroke rate. But when you look at the details and compare black and non-black patients, you can see the non-black patients had identical uh, stroke effects regardless of drug. But the African-American patients in whom a drug like uh, lisinopril doesn't work very well, in fact, it's in the label for ACE inhibitors that they do not work as well in uh, black patients as in others, you can see there was a 40% excess stroke rate based on a four millimeter of mercury difference between the effects of the drug. So here again, four millimeters of mercury, huge impact on a major event, in this case, stroke. And the last thing I want to show in this uh, category of three or four millimeters of mercury is the SGLT2 drug, 
amphagliflozin, as you know, new diabetes drugs now have to go through a cardiovascular safety study to demonstrate they do not cause an excess of cardiovascular events. Well, it turned out, and this is no surprise, amphagliflozin did reduce blood pressure by three to four millimeters of mercury uh, throughout the trial, and that began very early in the trial. How exactly it lowers blood pressure, other than perhaps getting rid of sodium, isn't clear, and it's, it's a fascinating story. But here we have a three or four millimeter of mercury difference in blood pressure almost immediately, and major cardiovascular effects beneficial to the drug in this case. I just want to point out that the effects on death, which was probably the most dramatic result of the trial, and on heart failure were seen within the first few months. So again, three to four millimeters of mercury quickly gives you a powerful result. I don't want to dwell on this, but amphagliflozin obviously doesn't just change blood pressure. It has effects on lipids. It has effects, obviously, on glucose. It has effects on uric acid and other metabolic factors. Is it all blood pressure that explains the cardiovascular outcomes? Not clear. And finally, category three, the most difficult. And minor changes in blood pressure, obviously, we don't measure them in clinical practice. Is ABPM the answer? And uh, we're going to talk about NSAIDs a little later. I know uh, Jeffrey Bohr is going to be talking about it, and uh, it's a fascinating area. So let me talk about another drug, Mirabegron, which is a drug used for overactive bladder. It's a beta-3 agonist, but it has a little bit of beta-1 agonist effect as well. And in young, healthy volunteers, it raised blood pressure about three millimeters of mercury. In older people, who are the people who usually will take a drug like this, it didn't raise the blood pressure as much because as we get older, we tend to lose our beta receptors to some extent. So how do we figure out, is there a blood pressure problem and what can we do about it? Well, this is ABPM, and uh, this is a study that uh, I did with Billy White, uh, with the people who manufacture Mirabegron. We have a beautiful placebo group with 80 patients and two doses of Mirabegron, and you can see no difference from baseline to, uh, I think it was 12 weeks of treatment with, between placebo and Mirabegron. A bit of a surprise. I thought there'd be a little bit of a difference, but you can see what, what doesn't help at all is the big standard deviations, even when you have 80 people in a group. Well, we thought, let's get a little more specific and look at it hour by hour. Could it be that for the day as a whole, you don't see much, getting back to what Ellis was saying early on, but maybe four or five hours after the drug is taken, uh, when you get the maximum plasma concentration, there you might see some troubling effects. And these uh, data are all starting from the time of dosing. And you can see placebo, lower dose, and higher dose of Mirabegron. Nothing really there. Frustrating. Um, that fall in blood pressure in placebo follows lunch. Right? That's the postprandial fall in blood pressure. You don't see it with Mirabegron. That's the only thing I could find uh, that would discriminate. And very difficult, isn't it? So we went to. Let's go to something cruder. Let's just go to outliers. How many people using ambulatory blood pressure monitoring had an increase of at least 15 millimeters of mercury in their systolic pressure? Placebo, 11%, which is amazing, isn't it? Because if placebo didn't change pressure much, it meant that at least 11% of people had a big increase in blood pressure, and there had to be another 11% who had a big decrease in blood pressure to offset it. And this is the frustration of ABPM. For a cohort, there's almost no change with placebo. But for individual patients, all over the place. Mirabegron, absolutely not different from placebo. So that was good news for the manufacturer of Mirabegron, and they got approval for their product and for some of their combinations. 
these are data I, I, uh, I've shown before, and uh, Ray Townsend uh, was the first author of this paper, and I don't want to waste time telling you the whole origin of this study, but those are individual patients in a placebo group subjected to ambulatory blood pressure monitoring all over the darn place, up and down, almost that, uh, nobody stays exactly the same. The cohort as a whole, no change. It was a wonderful success from the point of view of a clinical trial because it allowed us to compare it with an intervention and show a significant difference. But for individual patients, very, very difficult. So that's the, the, the story and, in a sense, the problem we're facing. So it's easy with severe blood pressure changes, like with the Avastin. We know what to do there. Not so easy with the NSAIDs, which we'll hear about in a moment. Not so easy with other drugs that perhaps have three to four millimeter of mercury effects. And very difficult for minor blood pressure effects in, in large numbers of people. Because as we've heard before, and, and uh, Norm Stockbridge and, and Bob Temple have made this point many times, from a public health point of view, if you've got hundreds of thousands or millions of people taking a drug, and it only has a half millimeter of mercury effect, that's going to translate into many people having strokes or heart attacks. So how do you find who those people are? And we have to remember that patients do have their own risk factors, which make, make them more vulnerable to a drug. And also remember that drugs don't just change blood pressure. There are other cardiovascular effects as well. Let me stop there. Thank you, Mark. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks very much, Dr. Weber. So uh, we're now going to turn to the panelists for some initial reactions and further thoughts about this topic. And we'll start with uh, Dr. Cushman. Yeah. I think I have some slides that I'd like to go through pretty quickly. So Michael has done a very nice job. And, uh, uh, and I, I'll go through this quickly. I, I want to say that I'm coming at this from the perspective of a hypertension clinical trialist. I've been uh, on the leadership of trials like the Accord blood pressure and Accord trial and, and SPRINT trial and, and others, but, um, uh, but I'm not a statistician, and uh, so uh, I look at it from that perspective. Uh, I, I do think, I believe that any drug that chronically raises blood pressure or chronically lowers blood pressure, uh, depending on what other uh, off-target effects or other effects it may have is likely to change the risk. Uh, I do want to point out that, that we've seen over and over again in trials that when you, and this was illustrated in the VALUE trial as well in the ALHAT trial, is that even if you are trying to treat everybody to the same goal, you can't totally overcome, at least in populations, a difference in blood pressure. Um, and that's something to keep in mind. Uh, so. Um, Yeah, and I think, I think pretty much um, I've said that for the second thing, uh, other than to say that, that we can't always explain the differences uh, in, in blood pressure. Uh, it, the, it may not be things that we can measure. It may be how long the hypertension was going on. It may be uh, adherence, and we see that a lot, and certainly non-adherers do worse in terms of outcomes as, as well as blood pressure. So we have to keep that in mind. In most randomized controlled trials, uh, of blood pressure uh, lowering, event differences often begin to appear over one to two years. And most of these trials were putting thousands and thousands of patients into those trials um, with an expected outcome within maybe three to five years, uh, except for the most severe uh, types of, of situations. And I, and I want to quickly go through some uh, Kaplan-Meier or similar kind of curves uh, to illustrate the time course. This is one of the, the most extreme examples. This was the uh, VA study. We don't have a Kaplan-Meier curve for the uh, 115 to 129 group. Uh, they were stopped after about 18 months, but there wasn't a DSMB and it wasn't looked at. So who knows, it might have been stopped at six months. Uh, but clearly for anybody with that high of a blood pressure, with huge differences in blood pressure, and, and for example, even the mild to moderate diastolic group 
the differences were 31 over 19 uh, at four months. So huge differences leading to, to marked differences in outcomes. Uh, and again, this was stopped at 3.3 at years uh, and was looked at somewhat earlier. So, uh, but it's a pretty small study. Uh, so clearly big differences when you have big differences in blood pressure, as Mike has alluded to. Uh, the HDFP study looking at mortality, and this just starts to illustrate that, that it really, and notice that these are, this is not 100% axis. So these are very small percentages, even though you start seeing differences uh, after one to two years. But HDFP was not stopped early. It went to uh, four and a half years. Uh, here's the SHEP study. Uh, uh, after a year is when the stroke started separating. There are other studies we'll, I'll just look at briefly where it took even a lot longer than that to see differences. Um, clearly, though, uh, it, it takes a while to see some of these outcome differences. Here's from the uh, HIVET study. And again, if you look at the um, uh, stroke over there, it's somewhat after a year where the curves start separating uh, and, and did go on to um, uh, uh, it's um, uh, four or five year, I'm, I'm sorry, this particular study was stopped at about two years, uh, average follow-up, uh, median follow-up, but it took a very long time to recruit the patients. So there were a lot of patients that were in for a lot longer, which is why you see that the events mostly were separating beyond two years. I did want to point out that, that there are some outcomes that, that there are differences in how quickly the outcomes seem to show up in hypertension studies. Heart failure, uh, we have several examples where after about six months, and sometimes even within six months, we see differences in heart failure outcomes. Uh, whereas for stroke, um, it may take a lot longer. For coronary events, it may take even longer. Um, so here's the SPRINT uh, primary outcome, comparing 120 to 140, uh, about a 14 millimeter mercury difference in blood pressure. And the primary cardiovascular outcome, we started to see separation uh, after about a year. The um, um, O'Brien-Fleming uh, boundary started being exceeded, uh, suggesting significance at about two years. And then ultimately, when the study was stopped, it, the average or median follow-up was 3.26 years. Um, and then here's the uh, all-cause mortality. Uh, one of the outcomes that not unexpectedly takes a little bit longer when there is a difference to see a difference. And this also was significant. Uh, and the curve started separating after about two years. Um, here's another example, the heart failure. This is in Sprint, uh, where you see the curve start separating after six months. Now, these are still fairly small. They're, they become highly significant, but, but notice that they're pretty small uh, differences in percentages. And so that's something that does have to be considered. Uh, this compares Sprint to the standard arm, standard glycemia arm in Accord, where the outcomes were virtually similar in terms of a 26 percent reduction. And again, the uh, you're seeing the separation curves after about a year or so. Um, I did want to point out, in Accord, we did see a significant reduction in stroke uh, in the blood pressure study, but nothing else. Um, again, fairly low event rates, uh, but it took over three years to see that separation. Uh, we did not see a significant difference in Sprint, and maybe that's because we uh, had to stop the study before that time period. Um, Hope three I wanted to end with as an example uh, to give us some caution. And that is, this is a very large study, uh, over 12,000, almost 13,000 individuals, uh, given somewhat modest doses of blood pressure medications, getting about a six over three millimeter mercury difference, and over quite a few years did not show a difference. I think most of us would expect that, that over time, and certainly the investigators thought there would be a difference, um, but I think when you, when you get even this small, but this much of a difference, six over three, if you're looking at a drug and expecting uh, a company, for example, to do a long-term trial, this is a very large study, didn't happen to show a difference, and therefore you might miss what might really be an important difference. And I think that either a, a higher risk population or a bigger difference in blood pressure or longer follow-up, I think most of us would expect that this would have eventually uh, been significantly different. But I think it raises a, a caution about even having a very large study showing, if you will, non-inferiority to a drug uh, that does raise blood pressure. Um, I'll stop there with those comments. Thank you. Um, uh, 
Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Uh, uh, Cushman. Uh, next is Dr. Toomey. Yeah, whichever you'd rather. I might just stay do from here. I, I don't have any slides, okay. so it's, it's much easier. Um, yeah, thank you, Dr. Cushman. I think um, that's a great overview of many of the studies that I've been looking at in preparation for this. I think from my, my background, um, more in the oncology setting um, and in the safety setting, I think more what I will bring up today is just more, more of another facet of this, more of another question that um, that I think of as a safety science officer as, as we approach these types of, um, of side effects is it, not just the temporal aspect, but is there something of the mechanism of action for how blood pressure, for how the hypertension comes around that could be, that could be influencing this? Is there a difference between a medicine that might cause a temporal increase in blood pressure because of uh, interaction with nitric oxide receptor block, you know, blocking not nitric oxide, or is there something that's impacting the renin angiotensin aldosterone sy sy uh, system that, uh, that may actually have much more lasting effects, even, even if the blood pressure is only raised for a short period of time. Um, so those, those types of questions are things that we tend to look at from the safety science way. You know, how, how are these, you know, how, how, can we think, how can we think of the mechanism for how, this, how it might be increasing blood pressure and what can we do to either mitigate that or to be able to predict that it might happen in certain patients and, and, um, and potentially address it there with, with new drugs. Um, but I think from, from my standpoint, that's what I would offer for the discussion. Great. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Timmy. Thank you. And, uh, Next is uh, Dr. Ventura. It'll be, it'll be brief for me. The, the only thing I wanted to add in regards to this, I, I think it's a very important clinical question. At least I hear it in the clinic every time somebody will ask, if I take this medicine, what is going to happen to my blood pressure? You know, I was one of them in the 80s. I didn't pay attention to it. I said, well, don't worry about it. Just take it. Well, <laughs> might not be right. But then I came up, it came up to, the, uh, to the world of cyclosporin and, and, and Prograf because of my work in heart transplants. And, and then, you know, I realized that what I was saying before, it was, it was wrong. You know, but, but you can't stop cyclosporin, you can't stop Prograf, you can't. Now, I didn't become a nephrologist, uh, George knows that quite well, but, you know, so the nephrotoxicity toxicity of these drugs are important. And how do you mitigate those, those problems in patients that they have to take it forever? Now, I take, I take away cyclosporin at least, I'll say 100% of the people that take cyclosporin, they have hypertension. It seems that 110% they had it. Then Prograf will lower a little bit, but the, still the effects are important. And you can't stop it. And think about this. If you look at the transplant world, more likely the people that die will long-term, trans, heart transplants at least, that's what I do, they tend to die of problems that are not related to the heart, right? They're related to blood pressure, renal failure, so on and so on. So part of the, you know, obviously in the 1980s, we didn't pay attention because people didn't live 20 years post-transplant. But now we have to pay attention more and more. So I think it's an important question, one or two millimeters, and it compounded to this, the people that have a transplant and they have cyclosporin, well, not anymore, Prograf at least, they also take insects because they have pain. So, you know, I thought for a while in the 80s that was not an important question. And then the guidance is great because it's a, it's a very common question patients ask. And, you know, you cannot treat cancer, but you got into case of blood pressure. So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. And I'm, I'm glad now I have to measure it. Michael is knowledgeable about this. It's difficult. But in cyclosporin prograph, you know, it's easy. You go to the clinic and you take... Most of them take a calcium channel block, and most of them take an X inhibitor. Most of them take everything. So that's, that is a, a, my contribution, small contribution to this. Uh, I think it's an, it's an important question. It's here to stay. It's not going to go away. I know, I know all of you know what I just said. And last but not least, I wanted to thank for the invitation to this, to this uh, meeting. All right. Th thank you all for your opening comments. Um, let me first ask the panel if uh, they've got any reactions to what they've heard uh, this morning so far from, uh, from the other panelists or, or otherwise. Any additional points that you would like to make about uh, uh, this topic of the, the, the change in blood pressure, change in risk relationship? Seems like a... George, did you have a... 
and then and then yes, I, I did. The, that was the next thing is to open this up to comments from all of you who are, who are here. Um, so just uh, uh, put your hand up or something so I know to, to call on you if you're in the room. Uh, if you are not in the room but have a comment for us, again, you can send any uh, questions or comments to pressor at duke.edu, pressor at duke.edu. And uh, George, over to you. So uh, thank you very much for a nice overview. Um, I want to make, I want to add another perspective to this, not that there's not enough perspectives on this. <laughs> um, but I think it's important to understand that one size does not fit all. So if you come up and say, you know, anything greater than two millimeters, your risk goes up, I, I think is a mistake because that's naive. At the, and, and Bill did a beautiful uh, example by showing Hope 3, which is what I've made the point of as well. So I think we need to look at this in terms of what is your established absolute risk for cardiovascular events day one when you're starting. If you're at very high risk, then maybe two or three millimeters is what you need. If you're at very low risk, clearly it's not. Or it may take you a lot longer to get to that point. I think that's an important perspective that we've missed in a lot of these data analyses. So I would actually go back and reiterate the latest blood pressure guidelines that say it's not about the numbers as much as it is about what your risk is when you're starting. And I think that's really a key point. You know, I, th I, I thought the fascinating thing about HOPE 3, and as Bill pointed out, they did not find a difference between placebo and active treatment, was they did have a pre-specified uh, subgroup analysis. And people who were truly hypertensive uh, did get a big benefit, and people who had low blood pressures to begin with actually were trending the wrong way and they were having an adverse effect uh, from the treatment, which I really don't understand. I, I have trouble with that. And in fact, sometimes these large, simple trials are perhaps a bit too simple. <laughs> uh, yes, sir, over here. That's right. There is a button somewhere there. That's a good question. No. Yeah. Uh, hello? There you yeah, go. There we go. go. Yeah, no, hi. Uh, Jeff Auburn, Bioclinica. I have to agree with what Dr. Bakris just said. And I think when we're looking at risk, not only is it not one size fits all, there is an immediate risk concept based upon the therapeutic area that you're treating, and then there's the long term. So as Dr. Tomey talked about your area's oncology, if you start to look at the different patient populations that you're working with, whether it's adult, adolescent, or pediatric, it's the long term risk that can be associated with that increase in blood pressure. Not so much hypertension, but the actual increase in blood pressure and looking long term downfield. So you have to look at both the population, the therapeutic indication, as part of the risk profile when you're, when you're assessing what level of risk and what level of risk benefit should we accept and what therapeutically can we do to treat that. And we know that coming from the oncology area that there is a lot of uh, prophylactic work that could be done in cardiac safety when we're dealing with oncology drugs. So just wanted to add that to the discussion. All right, let's see, see a lot of nodding and seems like a comment in a similar direction. Um, further comments? No, I, I, I just make the point. That, uh, you're right, a change in blood pressure does not have to make you hypertensive to be potentially dangerous if there are other risk factors going on. Nevertheless, when you start at a high blood pressure, even modest changes are going to have a relatively large effect because you're in a, a region now where absolute risk is high. Is, is high. Yeah. So uh, those are patients, and uh, getting back to what I think everyone's agreeing on, people at high risk obviously are going to have more events, and high risk includes being hypertensive already, being old is, an, is another bad thing to be, uh, 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 people <laughs> with renal insufficiency. You can make this list, having diabetes and so forth. So I, I think we can define the people who we want to worry about, and I'm sure that comes into the thinking uh, at, at the agency when they figure out how, how big a risk is and, and how they should put out warnings. See so, yeah, a couple more comments here and then there. Yeah, go ahead. I think um, we're, we are a little too quick 
to, um, uh, I think there's been a failure to make a distinction here between elevations in blood pressure caused by drugs, which, and elevation blood pressure caused, can, caused by a variety of factors, exercise, excitement, and what have you, and essential hypertension. And the overwhelming amount of evidence we're showing here is that if you treat essential hypertension, you get various benefits. But it's not the same thing, uh, but drug-induced blood, uh, blood pressure rises are not the same thing. In many ways, hypertension is a biomarker for things like atherosclerosis. And uh, one of the reasons that we see in some studies, for example, uh, well, you see the HOPE study where the people who had high blood pressure benefited, but not, but not necessarily people with lower blood pressure from lowering blood pressure. Uh, you're picking out the people who had this disease of essential hypertension. And, uh, you know, and there are other studies where you only see benefits, for example, in stroke and maybe just hemorrhagic stroke where, you know, and you don't see benefits in things as clearly or as much benefit from in, in reductions in terms of myocardial infarction or um, ischemic stroke or thromboembolic uh, events from the carotid arteries. And I think that's important to keep in mind. It's, and we, we, because the numbers were there and we could speak to numbers and, then, and we can measure numbers and we can treat numbers, we, I think we make the assumption that it's all about the numbers. Yes. Yeah, two quick comments. One is to, um, don't know why, but it turned out that in Sprint it was almost the reverse in terms of the blood baseline blood pressure relationship to, to benefit. And uh, so, and I don't know why that's different. It would be nice, you know, if the whole picture put, was Put, you could put it together and say, well, gee, if you're normal intensive, then it doesn't matter. Um, but I don't think we can quite say that. Obviously, it's a different population than Sprint, but I think a lot, some things may have happened by chance, in, which happens in various studies that we can't really explain. Uh, the other thing is that, um, the, and I'm sure we'll discuss this uh, further. I mean, on the one hand, to, to do a study to exonerate and show safety for a drug, um, then you, you probably need a very high risk population because those are people that probably are going to be treated long term with that drug. And if you, to do a feasible trial to be short enough and, and adequate size, you need to do it in a high risk population. Uh, I think many of us, though, believe that if you started making changes uh, of a few millimeters of mercury in children and they were on some medicine for decades and decades that were causing that blood pressure difference, that's very likely to have a profound effect on, on risk long term. Uh, it's a hard thing to study uh, other than observationally, but, uh, but I do think you have to keep those two things in mind in terms of who's going to get it, and I know I'm sure you all have talked extensively about this, who's going to get it and how long uh, is it going to be ta taken, and um, certainly drugs that are approved based on a few years or five years trials often are taken for decades, and, uh, and we don't always know the risk. Uh, excellent discussion. Philip Sager, Stanford University. The, this session dealt with uh, temporal relationships. So I'd like to try to maybe bring back the panel and get a little more feedback on that. I mean, I took from the presentations and the data that uh, a drug that increases blood pressure, a small, relatively small amount, except maybe in a very high risk population, taken for maybe a few weeks probably isn't a, a made, isn't going to have any major effect. I mean, it seems like it takes really a period of time, even in relatively high-risk populations. Obviously, something that has profound blood pressure increases, you know, that would be a different story. But, I mean, I think this is kind of important to talk about as we think about, you know, where we're we going to put our energy in terms of evaluating drugs. I mean, a five-day course of antibiotics that increases blood pressure a little bit probably isn't going to be a major public health issue. but. So I, I think it would be great to just get the panel's input on this. Yeah. No, sure, sure. no I agree. Short-term treatment is one issue. And also there are some <coughs> drugs, uh, some of the antidepressants, things like ketamine, that raise blood pressure quite sharply, but then it comes back down again within 30 to 60 minutes. Does that matter? Or do you say it went up 20, 30 points? Divide that by 24. That's an average of one millimeter of mercury an hour. That, I mean. We, uh, I, I think Alice brought that up, uh, uh, and I, I think that's... Uh, Other comments? 
Yeah, I would I would definitely agree that there's there are differences there. I mean, the um, I think just from the oncology world as well, there's it, it still is important I think to recognize which drugs may even have those small increases, even if they are given. I mean, with our drugs, I think much like Dr. Ventura was talking about with oncology drugs, these patients do have to take them regardless of what the side effects might be, and understanding them helps us mitigate um, potential downstream effects. But um, the um, the, what, what's important to, to recognize is that the changes in blood pressure, if they're occurring, how do I word this? <laughs> um, if they're occurring over a period of time that, I had the thought in my mind and I'm <laughs> trying to think about how to, how to actually word it correctly. But uh, I guess the, the, the point really just remains that, that there, are, there are differences between, um, between drugs that might just, it might just increase blood pressure for a short period of time versus ones that patients will be on chronically or for an extended period of time, several months, that may have an impact down, down the road. I would agree. So the, the, I wanted to make the comment about the, uh, the antidepressants, which is the most common medication prescribed in the United States. I don't know about you if you see patients, but they're taking 15 medicines, but one of them is a statin, and the second one is an antidepressant. And so the antidepressants had a question that had been asked several times. And, you know, what Michael just said in regards to that, you know, there's some very few, few studies, small studies, I guess. The one I remember, it was three months, and there's no change in blood pressure with the antidepressants. So they might increase it, and then they make it the same. Now, this is one, I think it was randomized in, this, in a psychiatric population. So... And the last thing I want to say regards to the risk, for example, if you take people on prograph or cyclosporin and you have the same age, one, let's say, is non, non-ischemic versus ischemic, the, the progression is the same. Though as far as I know, I mean, at least, again, it may be that you have in the people that have vascular disease, they're worse. But, you know, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a very um, it's very common to see these things, and, and, and we... We make assumptions that are no. For example, nobody knows what the blood pressure is in a transplant patient should be, 140 over 90, 130 over 80. You know, so there's a lot of assumptions that we make, and you know, it's a very important question. Every time, the more I hear the conversations and the more I read the whole thing, it's a very important question that we don't have. Sometimes we don't have a clue, regardless of the trials. I'm talking about from the clinical point of view. Okay. Thank you. Oh, more yeah, comment. just a quick, quick yeah. addition. I, I think we're going to get to this later, but I did want to point out that. All those trials uh, that I showed in, in uh, blood pressure differences, pretty much most of them, uh, if not all, use very standardized methodology for measuring blood pressure, even though they were clinic blood pressures and not ABPM. Uh, some of them had ABPM substudies, uh, but all of the eligibility and intervention was based on, on well-done clinic blood pressures. Whether that's the ideal or not, it certainly, though, we know that if the blood pressure is taken sloppily, that it, it, it's really difficult to know what that means. And, and we are going to get to that issue in a later session. So over here, and then I see uh, uh, more to come. Okay, great discussion. Thank you all. Button on the bottom? Not working. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I guess that works. Hi, Bob Kleiman, ERT. There's a temptation to sort of simplify this and view it as a akin to the problem of drug-induced delays in repolarization and sudden death, and Q, what we all measure is QT. And we've learned that QT is a biomarker that has some weaknesses, and I think we're not really discussing very much that blood pressure is a biomarker and is a surrogate marker for the things that we do care about, which are renal failure and MI and stroke and death. But, you know, we talked to, people have said a little bit about the time course is an hour a day versus a mean of 24 hour blood pressure increase different. There are also very large differences in the way drugs may have effects on blood pressure. And I'm wondering if any of you know if there's any data that would show that of an X millimeter increase in blood pressure independent of mechanism has the same effect on outcome? Or 
is there any evidence of the opposite, that with different mechanisms, same blood pressure increase has very different results? Is there any data? Well, uh, some people will justify the innocence of, a, of an increase in blood pressure by saying, golly, you know, every time you go out and exercise, you go to the gym and work out hard on a treadmill or an elliptical for 40 or 50 yeah. minutes, your pressure, your systolic pressure is going up 30, 40 millimeters of mercury. That doesn't seem to do any harm. But of course, it's a totally different mechanism of raising blood pressure. It's an increase in cardiac output. It's driven by tachycardia and so forth. It's basically dependent on epinephrine, whereas I think most of the drugs we worry about are raising blood pressure through vasoconstriction, more of the norepinephrine mm -hmm. kind of effect. And as far as I know, exercise is, is harmless. I hope so. <laughs> um, yeah, over here. Mm -hmm. I've been put in my 40 minutes this morning. <laughs> um, uh, Papa Dmitry of uh, Washington, D.C. and the VA in Georgetown. Um, I just wanted to comment a little bit about the ground rules on how to evaluate patients who are, are with hypertension and what kind of blood pressure we need to consider in the long run to determine whether it has adverse effects on outcomes. Uh, we talk about the blood pressure of two millimeter or five millimeter increase and having detrimental effects. And that's probably true for large populations and, uh, and uh, large uh, you know, studies. However, the important thing is for the individual patient uh, that we need to consider how much uh, change in the blood pressure do we need to see in order to worry. Uh, that has an effect on outcomes. And we know from many, many studies that I've uh, done through the years, even in the SPRINT study, that patients have different pressures at different days, uh, even without changing their regimen. I mean, I, I looked at several patients in the SPRINT study, and uh, without changing their regimen, well, in one visit, they were 130, the other were 145, and the, and the third, they were 128. So which pressure should we consider to determine whether we should worry about that pressure that day? Yeah. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, the, the second thing is, uh, which pressure should we consider, the systolic or the diastolic, both the average? Uh, how should we measure the pressure? Should we measure the, uh, with the auscultatory uh, uh, methods, with the automated uh, device, with the ABPM at home? How? Which pressure? I think we need to consider all those things before we decide what we consider important and which, what we don't. Um, we know from uh, all these studies that have been shown, and we have uh, a lot more to, to show, that uh, changes in population uh, of uh, five millimeters in systolic or three millimeters in diastolic can translate into change in 15 uh, percent of strokes. But in the individual patient, how many uh, pressures do we have, have to see uh, that are elevated to, to worry? I, I did a little survey in our large uh, VA population of uh, three and a half million patients, and we tried to determine uh, the effect of blood pressure changes on outcomes, uh, uh, considering the last pressure in the, in the record. So the last one before they uh, had an event, a stroke or a heart attack, or before they die. And uh, we found that uh, there was a big difference in the, in the determination of the outcomes if we considered the last pressure versus the average pressure over a 10-year period. And the average is a much more a uh, stronger predictor of mortality and cardiovascular events. And I think we should take this into account when we are deciding uh, how to evaluate the blood pressure of our patients and what to uh, consider important. You get, you got a very nice comment. And we are going to come back to this issue uh, late, later on during the day, too. So thank, thank you for teeing it up uh, uh, over here. OK, so I've uh, uh, so maybe remaining hands. So Bob here and there and there. So OK, so I'll go this way, and we've got about 10 minutes before the break, so uh, try to get in these four comments. Yep. So your first uh, cognitive test of the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Too early in the morning to make a microphone work. Um, just following up on what Dr. Weber was talking about, um, I don't think these are mostly individual decisions about whether your blood pressure went up four millimeters of mercury or three or what it's like in the morning and stuff. What I think you're talking about is populations. We're talking about long-term outcomes. This isn't going to be acute. And it's sort of been shown if a, a drug like um, ibuprofen, say, that you take for five years raises your blood pressure by four millimeters of mercury, 
that had a consequence, at least in the in in uh, in the one study where that was uh, that was done, and we're and uh, two similar drugs with many similar pharmacologic pro uh, properties that didn't raise the blood pressure didn't do that. Now we don't know how they compared to placebo because there was no placebo or APAP study, um, and I think. Mostly what you're interested in is looking at the effects of drugs that are going to be used chronically uh, because anything used acutely isn't going to, a modest effect isn't going to change anything. But you really do need to know what to do about drugs like NSAIDs that raise your blood pressure. And it seems to me the obvious thing is start somebody on a low dose of a diuretic uh, to control that. The other thing is the early curves you showed show that depending on where you start, there's a huge difference in what, in how bad the place you get to is, but it's worsened at all levels. And for a drug that's going to be used for 20 years, maybe that matters. I mean, that's not trivial. It, it's true that the effect in any one year is nothing, but over the course of time for a chronic drug, these things matter. And even and if, especially since it's not that hard to uh, take care of a small increase. There are, there are benign antihypertensives and things like that. So I, I don't, I don't, it's not the individual case so much, I don't think. It's the, the chronic effect of these long-term drugs. Well, is, is, if I may, just, isn't that the question that we're trying to address, though, is when, when is that cutoff for the acute, the, an acute treatment period versus a chronic treatment period? Is it do we all feel comfortable enough to say that if you're on a treatment for three to six months and it increases your blood pressure X amount, um, that that's okay, if, especially if we can put you on other drugs to, to mitigate that, versus if you're going to be on something for years and years. I think we can all agree that yes, for the chronic drugs, that might raise blood pressure, of course, but that's the question is what, at what point does having your blood pressure raised for a certain amount of time impact mechanisms further downstream, you know, if you're, if you're, uh, mess, if you're, if you're affecting the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone sy uh, system for several months, that might have an impact even when you stop the drug, drive you into further blood pressure issues. I mean, does, I think that's the question that we're trying to address. Why would it, it would have a further effect because of something else it did, not the blood pressure effect? True. Well, that's a perfectly good question. I mean, we sort of know that raising blood pressure a little bit for a couple of weeks isn't going to do anything. You sort of know that. If you raise it by 20 or 30, maybe, yeah. but, but you're right. The, I mean, that is an important <laughs> question everybody has to talk about, but I do think we have to worry, and I, I have to say I don't think we worried enough about the insects um, and what they did and how they did it. Uh, in retrospect, that's, uh, it's easy to get smart after somebody does a mm -hmm. five-year study. Um, but that's, that's sort of a message, drugs with modest but um, persistent effects on blood pressure need to need to have attention paid to them. And even people who don't get up to 150, just going to 140 turns out to be bad. We, we know that from the curves you showed. In fact, one of my questions is uh, whether those curves suggest that most people ought to be uh, pushed down a little bit. Maybe 130 is not so great either uh, over 20 years. Yeah. So great points. I want to uh, try to get in three more comments of here, there, and over there. Um, we are going to have some more time later in the day. Well, we're going to keep coming back to some of these same issues that have been brought up here, and we'll have some time later in the day to get in other comments, too. Really glad to see the, uh, uh, the, the dialogue here, though. Please go ahead. Good morning. Karen Hicks from the Division of Cardiovascular and Renal Products. Uh, Dr. Weber, I'm so glad you brought up uh, the example that you brought up, which is really the fourth scenario where um, a drug product could be given chronically, but it might only be administered once or twice a week. Yet there are changes in blood pressure uh, on average of over 10 millimeters of mercury that last for a number of hours. And, uh, and by the way, um, also there's a lot of outliers with systolic blood pressures uh, greater than 180. And so I hope that today we can hear a little bit more from the panel members uh, you know, about what to do um, with the these individuals as well. Good point. Yeah, thank you. Me? No. Not yet. No, you can't. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. OK. I'm Dr. Frederick Sanagers from Merck Research Laboratory in West Point. I'm more a clinical pharmacologist, but I would like to say we are here to understand that we define 
a threshold in systolic or diastolic blood pressure effect of any drugs. But we are looking at the integrative system. And for example, us in preclinical, in GLP dog or monkey telemetry studies, as well as human, we have the technology now. Why we don't consider heart rate variability? Why we don't look at circadian rhythm? Because people that are less deeper at night, for me, are more at risk. You know, we are testing drugs, but it's NS drug that are canceling the circadian rhythm of blood pressure, systolic or diastolic. And that I'm very concerned. Secondly, you could look at the bioreflex by measuring fina press and doing some tests. That can give you a better predictivity of what could be the impact, whatever the population of patients. You can have young patients, you can have older one. So if you integrate systolic measurement reliably, diastolic, heart rate, and you look at heart rate variability, you've got software can do that easily, can look at bioreflex too, extracted. I think we need to integrate that to have a good index of predictivity. I'm surprised that we are not considering this integrative platform as a better tool. I don't know what the thinking of the panel about that. I know it's more work, more expenses. When you have some 150 uh, phase one study and you have to do all that, it's cost uh, a lot. But I think we should consider more an integrative approach at a very reductional approach. Thank you for bringing up that even more integrative approach. And I'll try to get in a couple more comments here. Please go ahead. Um, Peter Bacher, AppV Medical Affairs. Um, <coughs> one element I think uh, Dr. Weber showed very nicely was this placebo circadian curve. And I think um, an impact on, for example, blood pressure drops at night could also have a significant effect over time if that doesn't occur versus just measuring peak levels. So I think, I think the overall circadianism component, I think, could be a very important element. And also the, the uh, measurements from patients who are normotensive or have no high, high blood pressure um, versus those who start a study with hypertension. I think there also needs to be a differentiation between those different populations. And I think we need to be more differentiative on that end. Uh, thank you. Was there another? Yeah, did you have a? Well, I will say if the question will okay, be simple, ahead. we won't be here uh, because, you know, what we, what we see here. I think you mentioned the point about the QT and the simplicity. It's not that simple. If it would be simple, we wouldn't be talking here in Washington, D.C. today in February 4th. And so, yeah, it's complicated. Let, let, let me say one more thing. Heart transplant, for example, you put a 45-year-old heart in a 65-year-old uh, vasculature. So it's something called that is a, you know, there's a lot of interactions, blood pressure might be related to that. Who knows? I mean, so yes, I, I think I like the, the, the concept that is not a simple concept. <laughs> Uh, the comment I want to make is, uh, is on the short increases of blood pressure versus the long-term uh -huh. sustained uh, sustain increases. I think the short-term increases probably are benign and they do not have any effect on cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And as an example, I wanted to offer the exercise. Patients who exercise or individuals who exercise, they always have increased blood pressure. In fact, it can go to 170, 180, and if they run for, for half an hour or 45 minutes, it's sustained to uh, that level all, all, all during that, their, their run in, around, around Washington, especially. Um, and uh, <laughs> and I, I, I have to say that these patients actually become lower cardiovascular risk. They don't have increase in their uh, yeah, um, yeah, risk of uh, cardiovascular outcomes. So, um, so uh, I think it's the long-term uh, increase of blood pressure, the sustained increase of blood pressure, um, as much as it may be, that uh, increases the cardiovascular risk. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So great, great discussion. I just want to see if uh, any of our panelists have any quick final comments. So it seems like a lot of consensus around uh, long-term sustained, even small increases, and some concerns about even in, in lower-risk patients um, uh, uh, trying to get evidence on that. but understand the, the difficulties from the standpoint of uh, trial design. Um, some uh, uh, questions that you all raised about, well, what, when does short term become moderate and, and long enough to, to care about? Uh, any other final thoughts you'd like to raise? Well, I, I, the, uh, one of the things that uh, Bob Temple mentioned uh, uh, about a mean change 
uh, or population change in blood pressure of three or four millimeters, whatever it might be. Of course, what does that mean? It's, it's made up of many patients, some of whom actually have falls in pressure, <coughs> no change in pressure, small increases, medium increases, and large increases. And I think in, in many ways, we have not helped ourselves by over-analyzing data and pro providing means and that sort of thing. We should actually present results from our clinical trials that involve hypertension or blood pressure uh, in, 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 in very nice uh, uh, increments, whether it, it's stratified for in different categories of change in blood pressure. I think that would give a much better understanding and perhaps in the end, what we need to do is to find ways to advise clinicians how to handle this. As long as we warn them that this drug may increase blood pressure, then at least they'll be on the lookout for changes in blood pressure and be able to do something about it. And final thought? Yeah, I, I think this was brought up. I couldn't, I apologize, I couldn't hear all the comments, but um, clearly we know observationally that nighttime blood pressure is as or more important than than the rest of the 24 hours. We've never done our clinical trials, though, to assess what our therapies did on nighttime blood pressures. Uh, hopefully that will be done at some point. But so a drug that is taken once a day in the morning and raises blood pressure uh, for a few hours during the day may have much less increase in risk than a drug that is taken at night and, or whenever it's taken and it raises blood pressure consistently at night. We don't know that for sure, but the observation Observational data might suggest that, and that's certainly, I think, um, a good aspect of looking at 24-hour ambulatory monitoring uh, when assessing uh, drug safety. And I do think that will come up in our uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring session, if not before. I want to thank all of our panelists for an excellent start to the day and all of you for the contributions. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to take about a nine-minute break, so start around 10.30 or thereabouts. Thank you, Barton. That was good.
first panelist to go ahead and join me up on stage. Just um, so. Waiting for uh, Dr. Boyer. Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back from the break. I'm Greg Daniel. I'm Deputy Center Director in the Duke Margola Center for Health Policy, and I want to echo Mark's welcome from this morning. Uh, during our second session, we'll be turning to the discussion of the Precision ABPM trial, which has already been uh, referenced pretty extensively, a substudy of Precision to determine the blood pressure effects. Um, of selective COX-2 inhibitors versus uh, non-selective NSAIDs. Um, uh, and we're going to be discussing that trial and whether its results and interpretation provide useful context for FDA's uh, guidance for industry. Our presenter um, kicking us off will be uh, Jeffrey Borer, uh, Professor of Medicine, Cell Biology, Radiology, Surgery, and Public Health at State University of New York Downstate Medical Center. And then following his presentation, we have two panelists, um, Robert uh, Blankfield, clinical professor of family medicine at Case Western Reserve University, and then unable to make it in person, but joining us via phone, uh, I think is on the line, um, William White, professor of medicine and chief of the division of hypertension and clinical pharmacology at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. Um, so I'll go ahead and, uh, and turn things o over to uh, Dr. Borer. Okay, I, I think probably everyone here is familiar with precision and how it came to be. It was mandated by the FDA after a 2005 meeting about NSAIDs because there was a controversy uh, with one school of thought being that NSAIDs were very bad because of an, uh, that, that uh, non-selective NSAIDs were maybe bad, but selective COX-2 selectives were very bad because of imbalance between thromboxane and prostacyclin activity caused by those drugs. That was called the Fitzgerald hypothesis. But some of us looked at those data and said, no, hey, all these drugs make, many of them make blood pressure go up. Maybe that's the problem, not, not the, the Fitzgerald hypothesis. And so uh, we put together, uh, after the FDA mandated precision, so that it could know whether there was a difference between COX-2 selective and non-selective NSAIDs, we put together a substudy looking specifically at blood pressure to see whether maybe blood pressure really was the culprit. Uh, and that study was completed, was reported shortly after precision. The sub-study was reported shortly after precision. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Here is the design of uh, the overall precision study. As you know, there were three drugs compared. The FDA wanted more than three drugs prepared. They want, uh, compared. They wanted a placebo, which was not possible. Uh, and the size of this study turned out to be 25,000 patients. So to add another drug would have meant the study would still be going on now. The, uh, uh, the overall design was here. It was nothing unusual. Uh, the minimum follow-up was 18 months. The patients included had either uh, osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, which was a problem because the NSAIDs uh, were being prescribed at different doses for those two types of arthritis, and, and uh, that created a little bit of a difficulty in analyzing the data. Uh, but the important point is that all of them had to have established cardiovascular disease uh, or have a clearly increased cardiovascular risk because of abnormal uh, because of multiple risk factors. Uh, they require, they 
had to require non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for at least six months for symptom relief. So these had to be symptomatic patients who also had cardiovascular disease or at high risk of cardiovascular disease. They were randomized to one of three regimens. The regimens were chosen because that's the way the labels were written. Uh, the uh, celecoxib dose seemed to be a little low to some people who practice in rheumatology and think you should give more, but that's fine. The label said you couldn't give more than 200 a day to somebody with osteoarthritis and 400 a day to somebody with rheumatoid arthritis. So that's the way it was done. Uh, there was optimal preventive care for cardiovascular risk according to local standards, including giving aspirin and whatever else you chose to give, statins, whatever. Uh, and there was an option to increase the dosage for unrelieved symptoms to the maximum approved by local regulatory authorities. Everybody was given uh, a uh, proton pump inhibitor because of the concern about uh, effects on the gastrointestinal tract, and, and some data were collected regarding that problem, but I won't talk about those here. The trial was event-driven, follow-up was 18 months. Now, the, that was the overall precision trial, which included 25,000 patients. The ABPM substudy to determine whether a blood pressure increase might have been uh, a reason for whatever we found from the big trial included only 444 patients. Uh, everybody in, in a single center had to be included for the center to be included, so no cherry picking could go on. Uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, study only went on for four months. So this was short-term, and what we found would qualify as a short-term study, I think. And here were the results from the ABPM. There was clearly a difference in the blood pressure effect of celecoxib versus ibuprofen, and a little bit of a difference versus naproxen. But the difference versus ibuprofen uh, was about four millimeters of mercury, not quite, uh, of systolic pressure which is what we've heard about before as being associated with some bad things happening to some people. Here are the changes in mean 24-hour arterial pressure from baseline at four months. Uh, and again, you can see that ibuprofen and to a lesser extent naproxen uh, caused more of an increase in ABP uh, in arterial blood pressure than did celecoxib. Uh, and in fact, that the difference in the least squares mean change in uh, arterial blood pressure uh, followed the same pattern. Now, how about patients who started with normal blood pressure and who had hypertension at month, month four? That was significantly greater. People who were normotensive and developed hypertension uh, did so much more frequently with ibuprofen and also with naproxen than with Celebrex twice as frequently with ibuprofen, a little less than that with naproxen. This, however, speaks to one of the uh, major issues that was discussed earlier. How long does it take to see the effect? Here we have uh, months since randomization here on the, uh, on the abscissa. Oh, I don't have a... Uh, and patients with the event, the percentage of patients with the event on the ordinate. And you can see that uh, it took several months for the curves to separate. The outcome event here is the risk of ho is the hospitalization with hypertension. It was increased by 69% with ibuprofen compared with celecoxib, but you really didn't see that happen until several months after the, uh, the trial began. It took at least 10 months uh, to 12 months before the difference became clearly apparent. During the mean follow-up of two and a half years, there were 22 APTC events, seven with celecoxib, nine with ibuprofen, and six with naproxen, clearly not a difference there, uh, just a tendency towards more ibuprofen. So uh, with these 444 patients followed for two and a half years, we weren't able to see a difference in events, and the overall event risk was relatively low. From the overall precision trial, the big trial, however, with more numbers, the tendency that was suggested by the ABPM substudy was seen more clearly. Here, for example, 
uh, non-inferiority trial, intention to treat for the APTC endpoints, Celecoxib had uh, was non-inferior to the others, or the others were non-inferior to, to Celecoxib. Uh, but there was, it looked like something was separating there, and so a superiority analysis here, uh, what we called modified intent to treat, uh, there were fewer events on celecoxib than on ibuprofen, no real difference compared with naproxen. And when all-cause mortality on treatment was assessed using a superiority design, uh, the celecoxib clearly had fewer deaths than, than, uh, than the others. Uh, so, the conclusions that we drew and would draw is that the nested blood pressure study showed that celecoxib uh, is less hypertension inducing than the two NSAID comparators. And though cardiac outcomes were relatively few, there were fewer with celecoxib than with the other comparators. The outcomes of the nested study were thoroughly consistent with the results of the larger study of which the nested study was a part. So for future evaluation, nesting, nesting a blood pressure study within a larger phase three trial for whatever uh, the primary outcome of that trial might be, and pre-specifying blood pressure and cardiovascular outcomes should help to define a regulatory position about approval or at least about the need to warn in a label about blood pressure effects. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, th thanks, Dr. Boyer. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, turn things over to our first panelist, uh, Dr. Blankfield. I brought some slides. I want to thank the Duke Margolis Institute for inviting me today. <clears throat> I hope that by the end of my presentation, there might be a little agreement as to what thresholds <clears throat> would warrant a requirement for cardiovascular safety data. And <clears throat> I'm going to make my case that those thresholds should be two millimeters systolic and one millimeter diastolic. <clears throat> These three drugs have been taken off the market in recent years uh, because of cardiovascular safety concerns. Could I see a show of hands? How many people in hindsight wish that the FDA had obtained cardiovascular safety data before approving these drugs? How, ma how many people wish that that data had existed prior to approval. All right. <clears throat> if one is going to use blood pressure data as a determinant of whether to obtain data, then the threshold <clears throat> for all these drugs is a systolic of two or more or a diastolic of one or more. And any other criteria would not have generated a requirement for cardiovascular safety data. So two and one is a sensitive screening test for cardiovascular risk if one is going to use blood pressure. The TZDs, Actos, and Avandia have generated a lot of concern about cardiovascular risk. I won't elaborate much other than to point out that these drugs have a negative or zero effect on blood pressure. A number of diabetic medications have required, have, the FDA has required cardiovascular safety data. Most of these drugs, apart from low dose on Glyza, um, have a negligible or negative effect on blood pressure. <clears throat> Other diabetic medications, again, negative or negligible effects. <clears throat> cardiovascular data has been obtained on all these drugs and they have negative blood pressure effects. So this is the point in the presentation. I know you're eagerly been asking and wondering, when is he going to get to naproxen? So this is that portion of the presentation. 
This is not a definitive slide. There's, I probably missed some studies. But <clears throat> the important part of this slide is that there's some data here comparing blood pressure changes to baseline and to placebo. And the effect of naproxen in these studies on systolic and diastolic blood pressure is variable. Most of them are, are different lengths. The precision trial is the last slide. Precision trial, the change to baseline was 1.9 systolic and 0.7 diastolic. And so if one is going to use a threshold of 2 and 1, then one could make the case that, that Celebrex shouldn't warrant a requirement for cardiovascular safety data. I think that's the wrong interpretation of the data. And the reason it's the wrong interpretation of the data is because you can't use base, uh, the study drug against baseline as the criteria. If one looks at some other studies, the Schwartz study from 2002, the change in systolic blood pressure compared to baseline was 3, and compared to placebo it was 4. In that same study, the change in diastolic blood pressure compared to baseline was a negative number, but compared to placebo, it actually goes over that one point threshold. The Bearwald study, similar pattern, <coughs> compared to baseline, the, the changes are minimal, but the changes are higher compared to placebo. And in those instances, if one were using a two and one <coughs> threshold, then one would conclude that using baseline data does not require cardiovascular safety data, whereas comparing the drug to placebo does require cardiovascular safety data. So I think it is a flaw of the precision trial to make the case that one can compare a drug against its baseline. So it's my recommendation that the FDA require cardiovascular safety data for drugs, at least drugs used for long term, that compared to placebo, raise systolic blood pressure two or more points or diastolic blood pressure one or more point. Now, if I have another couple minutes, um, there are a number of drugs on the market for which there is no cardiovascular safety data. A number of the SNRI antidepressants all have considerable effects on blood pressure. Um, the only one is bupropion. <clears throat> I remember as a young physician hearing Dr. Thays talk about Effexor XR. And it was brought on market. And in his presentation, he said the, there's data that the 375 milligram dose increases blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, seven points. And I thought, holy mackerel, that sounds like a lot. And I said, well, to myself, I guess that's okay because the FDA, they, they must have safety data on that. Little did I know. <clears throat> a number of the ADD, ADHD medications, and to the FDA's credit, they have safety data for children. But I assure you that adults are using these drugs, and there's no safety data with adults. And these drugs have significant effects on blood pressure. Um, and then some miscellaneous drugs, some of the, the drugs for narcolepsy, uh, New Vigil, Modafinil, have a considerable effects or noticeable effects on blood pressure, and there is nothing on the warnings of those drugs regarding cardiovascular safety. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Blankfield. So we're going to turn to our next panelist, uh, William White, who is, uh, I think, joining us on the line. Um, uh, Dr. White, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You can hear me? Oh, that's just wonderful. 
I'm really sorry I can't be there in person. You know, I was, I worked on the planning committee for this meeting for many months with uh, Duke Margolis and, and Norm Stockbridge and his team. So I, I really am sorry to not be there. Um, so if we could have my first slide. I only have four slides, and I can see them on the WebEx. Uh, if you um, can bring that first slide up. Uh, okay, we're gonna we're gonna get to those. So let let me just say parenthetically that uh, you know Jeff Bourne and I worked together on um, off-target effects of uh, NSAIDs and COX-2 inhibitors starting about I don't know 17 or 18 years ago, and um, you know we pooled data, you know far way before precision was even a concept, and and actually found a signal for ibuprofen. Uh, back in, in those days uh, from uh, a pooling of about 20,000 people in development programs for these COX-2 inhibitors. Uh, so so the findings... Uh, Dr. White, just to um, let yeah. you know, we're, we're still trying to pull up the slide. You can go ahead, but um, I just want to let you know that you're yeah, not, I know, not I'm, quite up yet. Yeah, I, I realize the slides aren't up. I'm just I, I'm making some introductory comments. Okay. Um, and... Uh, we also knew that we saw no no real signal with celecox. The problem was is that the uh, proportion of people who were on placebo in those development studies was smaller and also shorter term because arthritis patients can't take placebo for more than a few weeks or months before they will bail out of a study because they're in pain. And this is a big challenge of doing cardiovascular safety studies for um, you know patients who have symptoms. So do you see my slide now? Um, it's not yet. Um, sorry for the glitch. We thought they it's were not, online, but they're, they're, they're getting loaded up uh, 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 relatively well, soon. Well, they're on YouTube right now. It, the slide is on YouTube, <laughs> but it's not on the web. Back. YouTube won. Um, and it looks like 130 people are watching this program on YouTube. I have no idea how many people are actually signed into the WebEx. But... You can't see them in the room, I assume. Right. Yeah, we're, uh, we're, in, we're getting them. I'll let you know as soon as it's up. Okay. You know, that's a great advertisement for it YouTube, is, that is. you can it's actually awesome. see the slide on YouTube, but you can't see it in the live room where the meeting is occurring. Yeah, okay. Um, we got it up now. So <laughs> I can, we're, we're, okay, that's, that's wonderful. Um, all right. Okay, here we go. So... Uh, Thank you. So a number of years ago, um, there was a uh, study done by a fellow from Scotland named Tom McDonald. And, um, you know, there was a drug that was a little bit like clofenac, but it had more COX-2 selectivity called Lumericoxib that was um, being developed for arthritis. Unfortunately, the drug had significant hepatotoxicity, so it never came to life. But this drug was studied in a uh, pretty sizable ambulatory blood pressure monitoring analysis uh, involving several hundred patients and published in the journal of Hypertension. And I, one of the things I wanted to show you was that it does matter who you are when you're getting these drugs as far as the excursion upwards of blood pressure. So, uh, for example, if you're older, uh, versus if you're younger, your blood pressure increase uh, is greater on ibuprofen than it was on Lumericox. And we're, I'm looking at the estimated differences here on the right-hand portion of the screen. And really quite importantly are uh, the types of drugs you're on for hypertension. So, you know, one of the things about uh, all NSAIDs, including ibuprofen, is that it doesn't just raise blood pressure by itself because of a little inhibition of naturesis. It also interferes with the antihypertensive effects of some of the classes of the antihypertensive drugs. Most importantly are the renin angiotensin blocking drugs, like the ACE inhibitors or the angiotensin receptor blockers. You see that the, the increase in blood pressure is much more substantial in that subgroup than it is in patients, for example, taking a, a calcium channel blocker or a diuretic, in which there doesn't look to be, you know, very much increase in blood pressure. So I think we have to, like, when we look at the data from precision and we look at the data from NSAIDs in general as a class that is known to have this uh, increase in blood pressure, uh, this has to be taken into consideration. 
we could have the next slide, which I can't see on the WebEx, but I can see on YouTube again. So hopefully that slide can be changed. Yeah, we're, we're there. The study. Oh, now I, yeah, yeah okay. That's, I'm seeing the stability trial. So um, I'm not sure what you're showing, but I know that my next slide is a slide of, uh, that evaluated celecoxib in the early days. Uh, I think the publication was in 2002. Yeah, we're right. showing that. Thank you. I see it now on YouTube. Thank you. And uh, so this was interesting because uh, the FDA, in fact, recognized that there was this potential um, when this new class of drugs known as COX-2 selective inhibitors came out on the market that it would actually potentially increase blood pressure in people who were taking an ACE inhibitor. So we designed a study to take people with, um, uh, who were on ACE inhibitors, in this case lisinopril, we standardized them, and we found that uh, 200 milligrams twice a day compared to placebo, because these were not arthritis patients, could, and so they didn't have, we didn't have that confounder of pain, cause some transient increase in blood pressure relative to placebo, but it wasn't all that bad looking. And this was with 400 milligrams a day, which would be the maximal dose of this drug, and probably more in alignment with the 600 milligrams three times a day that was given on average to patients in precision. And, and just parenthetically, uh, historically, the doses of ibuprofen used in osteoarthritis trials and in rheumatoid arthritis trials in the past was 800 milligrams three times a day, and there's clearly a dose-related increase in blood pressure, edema, heart failure, and all that stuff with the NSAIDs, particularly with ibuprofen. So if we go to the next slide, you know, I think somebody mentioned an outlier analysis, I think it was Michael Weber, that we really do need to understand individual responses when we're looking at data uh, that evaluate off-target effects. And in this situation, the, the finding for this same study was a bit surprising. Hopefully you're seeing the bar chart now yes, yes. that shows the outliers in which there's bins of blood pressure. And you'll note that the, the main finding was not that there was these huge increases in blood pressure on the drug at all compared to placebo, but actually a few less patients went down in blood pressure and a few more went up kind of in the 5 to 10 range. And that was the individual increases. And so if you were to characterize a, any drug uh, in which there was ABPM or clinical blood pressure data was taken precisely, as Bill Cushman mentioned, you would have a different sense if the drug increased blood pressure in all individuals by about three or four or five millimeters as an outlier versus 10 or 15 or 20, which would be more onerous for a population in a shorter period of time. I think this is a very important part of the way the analyses should be carried out when, when we're looking at drugs effect, off-target effects on blood pressure. And if we could go to my last slide, just to make a comment about two millimeters of mercury being a threshold for uh, asking all sponsors to do cardiovascular outcome study. Um, well, Tylenol does that. Uh, so Tylenol is a ubiquitous drug that is used over-the-counter throughout the entire world by millions and millions of people. And uh, this small study was done by um, uh, a group in um, Europe who looked at acetaminophen at doses of uh, 3 grams a day, which is a, is a pretty standard osteoarthritis dose. Uh, or might be taken for a couple or three weeks if you have a pain syndrome. And it raised ambulatory blood pressure by about uh, 2.7 millimeters of mercury systolic and about, about 2 millimeters diastolic versus placebo. And it's not thought, most people don't think that acetaminophen does this because nobody really studied it thoroughly before. But this group did. And these, were, these by the way, was in, was in a population of people who were... Um, had coronary disease. So theoretically, their risk might be uh, more than a population at large who's just taking acetaminophen or Tylenol for um, OA or just general 
uh, pain conditions. Do we have a possibility in this world of doing a cardiovascular outcome study in patient with Tylenol or generic acetaminophen right now? Do we need to? Uh, do we need to study any drug that has simply a blood pressure increase without other mechanistic concerns? NSAIDs are not a clean class of drugs. They do not increase cardiovascular harm only because they increase blood pressure. They do all kinds of other things to tissue factor, to coagulation profiles, and so forth. They cause the retention of salt and water that has other effects other than just increasing blood pressure. In contrast, uh, there are other drugs which may do nothing but increase blood pressure and not cause other harmful uh, comorbid issues with regards to their off-target effects. So I think that, you know, in thinking about the patient population, the targets, the group of individuals for whom this off-target set effect might be seen, uh, we have to really strongly consider that. I mean, there are, as Dr. Blankfield said, numerous drugs that are registered, approved, and have been on the market for maybe 50 years or longer that raise blood pressure and don't have cardiovascular safety data. But I think that we understand that increases in blood pressure are a very clean and powerful surrogate all by themselves to show that they increase cardiovascular, that increases cardiovascular events. Do we really need to perform a study uh, that almost is going to be impossible to do to prove that point? So I'll leave it at that and open up for any other discussion. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. White. And uh, thanks for bearing with us as we got your slides up. So I'll go ahead and open it up to the um, room around uh, comments and feedback on the presentations that you saw re regarding the precision ABPM data, but also the other uh, trials and data that the, that the three presenters um, put forth and implications for uh, uh, draft FDA guidance. Uh, um, so, uh, Ellis, do you want to? Um, oh, I've heard some discussion about outcome studies, the need for outcome studies. So I, I'd like to make a point, an important point from FDA's perspective. So if we know that a drug increases systolic blood pressure by, by four and diastolic by two for a drug, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you guys a rhetorical question, which is do we want a company to do an outcome study? to show that that increase uh, translates into an in increase in uh, stroke? I, I think the point has already been made. Okay. Uh -huh. So, so the, the point, but I did hear a lot of discussion about, well, well maybe it hasn't been made. Okay. I, I've heard a difference of opinion this morning on that very question. I've heard a lot of people say that it's a nuanced question that we need to know more about the populations, the who, who's at risk or not. And much of the comments that I heard in the, for, in the first session could be answered with more data, that we don't have more data. So I, I do think that a blood pressure of four and two uh, is, is likely to, to translate to increased cardiovascular risk. But that's an assumption, and, and if we make that assumption, then it's not fair to go back and say, well, we, we don't know about the risk group. Yeah, it's, I don't even think it's, it's ethical to do a study to, and say, listen, Mr. Jones, we'd like to figure out if this drug could cause strokes. Um, that's the end point, is strokes, and we want to know if it, if it increases your risk of a stroke. That's not an ethical study. Um, and you know it's 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 okay if you're saying well we want to see if it helps your arthritis and by the way we'll we'll look at so, so four and f at, at four and two there's no equipose. Well, I don't know what the numbers are, but my point is that where we're not, where is the equipose? Well, the equipoise can be if if there's a benefit that you, like that less you're four. less. Well, I said less than four. I mean, so if you if you're if you're saying oh we want to look at the effect on your osteoarthritis and by the way, 
that's fine, but to do a study purely to see if it causes strokes, um, that's, um, that's not the kind of study that we, uh, we really want to want to encourage. Bob, you, you, you're, you're saying? I think we already know that increasing blood pressure compared to nothing is bad for you. Um, what the cutoff should be, whether, whether two is enough to reach that conclusion or it needs to be more than that, I don't know. But my view is it's a continuous function. We know higher blood pressure. I mean, all, of the, all the epidemiologic data shows that. Higher is bad. Um, it's worse for you if you already have underlying disease. It's worse if you're older. It's worse if a lot of things. But we sort of know that. And I'm not sure you need a study to do that. It's worth remembering the studies that have been required for uh, 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 diabetic drugs were not because of blood pressure anxieties. It was because probably an erroneous assumption that some of the early drugs were bad for you in ways that we didn't understand. So they all got that requirement, and almost all of the studies have been negative, except for the ones that have been positive lately. So there's been a lot of attempt to reconsider that. But that wasn't because of an anxiety about blood pressure effects particularly. Um, I, I guess I think everybody knows that raising blood pressure is probably not chronically, is not good for you. Um, so I'm not sure you need a study. Okay, so we'll go to George and then right. back to this table and then over there. I, I want to just expand what, what Bob said and, and view it from a clinician standpoint because I get all these people in the hypertension center because nobody can control them. So one, first of all, has to appreciate what these drugs are doing in the first place. So if you have pain, if you don't think pain raises blood pressure, we can do that experiment in you and you can tell me. All right, so that's a competing risk. So you need to control their pain, and there's a lot of other immune inflammatory processes which drugs do raise blood pressure, but they actually balance out in terms of the benefit long term. So I think to try to put a number on it is almost impossible if you want to do it accurately, and you can get truckloads of data. You may come closer, but it's still not going to be the same. I think the oncologists actually got it right, and it's rare that I publicly praise oncologists. But I will say that I was, I was privileged to be part of a group invited by the oncologists to put together a consensus report, a guidance in terms of blood pressure control for the VEGF inhibitors. And what we looked at the data at that time, and this was 2011, but basically the, the essence of that came out on top of understanding the mechanisms was as long as you can keep the blood pressure below 140, so know it's going to go up, how much it goes up is almost irrelevant. You can't start therapy unless your blood pressure is below 140. How you get there is your business, but you've got to stay below 140. That, to this day, still exists in terms of these protocols. And it seems to have worked out well from a safety standpoint. So I'm just putting, keep it simple, because it's going to become unwieldy if you try to make it too precise. Okay, uh, there's a, uh, back at this, state your yep. name. Yeah, uh, Jeff with Bioclinica. Um, I, I think I agree with Dr. Backers and Dr. White, and I, I don't think an observational study actually adds value. Uh, I think what we've been doing so far in the industry is really trying to characterize the potential effect of the compound in the therapeutic population on the change in blood pressure. Because at the end of the day, it's what is the clinician, he or she, going to have to do and know about the compounds? that they're treating the patients with. So questions might come up with, okay, I've got a drug for the osteoarthritic population, my population is hypertensive, and do a, a focused assessment on that more so than say a healthy population because this is the population that the drug is gonna be exposed to and what's that change? Likewise, if it's gonna be a short-term exposure to a drug, not a long-term exposure, you might wanna consider, okay, using ABPM, what's my baseline, what's my expected on treatment and half-life of the drug, and what happens when I remove the drug? In fact, does the blood pressure go back to baseline? Does it stay elevated? You know, that becomes important more in a longitudinal look of the impact of that blood pressure change on that patient, that population. And you start to differentiate between the long-term exposure to a compound and the short duration exposure to the compound. So I, I think we're already in the right direction, and the goal is to really to characterize that change in blood pressure and then specifically look at the therapeutic indication. And Dr. Backers just explained, I think the oncology group really does have a good focus on things because we're talking about risk, but we also have to look at benefit risk. 
um, when, we're, when we're looking at these medications and the patient population. Okay, great. I've got uh, two comments over at this table. Uh, no. I think we've got an, another mic coming your way. Thanks. Sid Wolf, um, Health Research Group. Uh, comments on both what Dr. Blankfield said and Dr. White said in the context of what the question is, it, is it appropriate to look upon the findings of the precision study to make the link, which if it's not the complete explanation, is one between hypertension and increased cardiovascular events. So 11 years before, 11 years before precision was published, there was a study published on the same drug, not in people who had RA or osteoarthritis, but in people who were being experimented on, in the best sense in this case, to prevent colorectal adenomas. And in this trial, A, a placebo was used as the comparison, which is a point Dr. Blankfield made, and B, they collected data on both blood pressure increments up, or blood pressure increments period, and cardiovascular risk. And in 200 milligrams twice a day with silicoxib, they had a 2.6 highly statistically significant increase in cardiovascular events and a two millimeter increase average versus placebo on the blood pressure. And when you went up to the higher doses, as in 400 twice a day, the cardiovascular risk went up to three plus and the, <coughs> the increment up in systolic blood pressure went up to 2.9. So here is a older study, it is not on it is not on people with osteoarthritis and so forth. And they have a nice correlation which, except for one point, shows A, a dose response increase, dose response cardiovascular risk with celecoxib, and also shows a dose response increase in, in, in blood pressure. So I think for some of the reasons that Dr. Blankfield alluded to and maybe others, the idea of working on a guidance that will help in the future identify increased blood pressure uh, should be done versus placebo. And the, one of the slides Dr. White showed did show in certain circumstances increased uh, blood pressure with, <clears throat> with celecoxib. Uh, the other comment, which is what Bob Temple made, is I think that we know from ever, Bob and I debated this about 25 years ago in terms of, of placebo-controlled trials for hypertensives, how long they could be. But I think th that we agree fully, it is established that increased blood pressure uh, is a strong signal for cardiovascular risk. And so back to Dr. Blankfield's slide or two, showing all the drugs with clearly, in most cases, more than just two systolic increases in blood pressure versus placebo without any kind of black box warning. I think that the idea of putting a warning on the NSAIDs, particularly after in a trial that had nothing to do with, with, with cardiovascular risk, the, the, the class and the Vigor studies were done to try and get a better label on the gastrointestinal risk, as you mainly remember, and yet the finding was in a different area, and it had a profound input, impact, as it should, on the labeling, black box warnings on all these insets. So I think that the challenge, I agree with Bob that it is a well-established risk, and on the ones where we already have the data, the data are already there in terms of the blood pressure increase, why is there no black box warning? Okay, uh, thank, thanks for that comment. I think there's another one as well. Hi. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I have to put it a little closer. Uh, it's Mark Schott again. Um, I think there's two things. First, in terms of the two millimeters versus over one millimeter, um, there's a question of precision, not the study itself, 
but the statistical power you need to establish that and the meaningfulness of, uh, you know, if I have, if I can get enough data to show that there's a one millimeter increase and the standard error is four tenths, or it's 1.1 and the standard error is four tenths, and I have another study drug where it's 0.9 and the standard error is, is 0.2, you know, th w w there's one meaningful and one not meaningful. It, I, I think it, it, it gets a little crazy when you start to talk about these numbers, particularly I think when you look at it from the standpoint of a practicing physician, if I have a patient who I think is on, all the medications are on, are useful to that patient, and their blood pressure is, one, say, 160 over 100, I'm going to treat that blood pressure. And if I have trouble getting that blood pressure down, even, you know, with reasonably maximal treatment or, you know, the, the blood pressure treatment, uh, antihypertensive treatment is not causing serious adverse uh, events with the patient, then I might ask myself, could it be one of these drugs? And let's see what happens if I stop one of these drugs or I, I look at an alternative and see you know, what, the, what happens if I stop drug, what happens to the blood pressure, what happens to the other things that they're treating. And I can, can then make a decent risk benefit assessment. And that, for that, all I need to know is something in the label that says, this drug has been shown to increase blood pressure. And we know it, and even whether it's one millimeter or five millimeters on average, isn't that important? Because we have out, you know, because of the variance, because we have so many outliers. It may only on average increase it in two, two millimeters of mercury, and the guy's blood pressure is 160 over 100. What difference is two millimeters gonna make? But maybe in this patient, patient it makes 10 millimeters of mercury difference. Or maybe at this patient, it's zero. So I think, I, you know, I think there's a real danger in getting too hung up on these exact numbers. Yeah, so um, great. So we are um, a bit out of time for this session, but I do want to turn back to our panelists um, um, and, and Dr. White on the phone, too, to um, any, any lasting comments or um, you know, feedback based on the discussion that we just had. A lot of um, uh, input on uh, thresholds and whether or not uh, events, uh, cardiovascular events, would be in indicated for further collection or if uh, further characterizing the impact on blood pressure is um, is sufficient, and then questions about then, then what, and what, what does that necessarily mean for the labeling? So I'll turn to um, uh, Dr. Uh, Bohr, Blankfield, and, and then White uh, for, for last comments. Thank you. The, uh, first of all, I, th I think the point was just made very well. I, the, the issue is not, was it two millimeters, three millimeters, one millimeter? Uh, the issue is, does the drug raise blood pressure? If it does, then it's really up to the, to the patient's doctor to measure the blood pressure and see how high it goes and treat the patient for it if it seems like that's, uh, that's an, uh, an inappropriately high response. Uh, we, we know what the epidemiological uh, data show, and, and, and individual clinicians have to make judgments based on, that, uh, based on those. Uh, the idea that every, every drug has to be studied, every drug for blood pressure, uh, uh, where blood pressure effects has to be studied against placebo is a wonderful idea, and the FDA really wanted that to be done for precision, but it was impossible because, in fact, uh, people with arthritis were being studied and they would not tolerate walking around with pain, so they had to be on something. Uh, the use of Tylenol was suggested as a, as a control, uh, but Tylenol isn't as effective as the NSAID, so couldn't do it. Uh, so, you know, it, 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 it's good to be a purist, and it's nice to theoretically believe that placebo-controlled trials are better than non-placebo-controlled, and I agree with that, except you've got to be reasonable. It can't, if it can't be done, it can't be done. Uh, and in this case, it couldn't be done, and we came up with some good data, I think. So I, th those are the, the final um, observations I would have. The, um, the last gentleman, I, I agree with all those comments. Uh, I agree that two and one is trivial in any given individual. I agree that standard deviations sometimes are above and greater than the, the number itself. Uh, I understand all that. I agree with the point that raising blood pressure increases cardiovascular risk. Uh, I think everybody in the room agrees with that. I agree that the starting point in blood pressure, whether it's controlled or not, and you add a couple of points, I agree with all that. However, the bottom line must be 
that a drug like Vioxx, a drug like Meridia, a drug like Bextra ought not to get on the market without some warning to physicians and patients regarding cardiovascular risk. Great. Thanks. Uh, Dr. White? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I, I, I've been listening to this commentary closely. I, I really you know, believe there has to be some pragmatism with the development of drugs and, and if there are off-target blood pressure effects. Uh, first of all, nobody's been talking about absolute risk, and the population at large has a risk. We understand that, and I, and I understand Dr. Temple's uh, concerns in the population at large. And the duration of the drug, who's going to get it? You know, if a drug raises blood pressure two millimeters of mercury, and most people who take it are 35 year olds who have fibromyalgia and don't have any cardiovascular risk, the harm it's going to cause is vastly different from a 75 year old with osteoarthritis who has multiple risk factors. You'll see the harm in a much shorter period of time. To set up Clinical trials in young, healthy people who might be taking a drug which has an off-target blood pressure increase is not practical. Uh, it just has to be a labeling issue, if you ask me. And I think that we have to take all these things into consideration throughout this day when, if we're going to be you know, going outside of the idea of diagnosing hypertension with the drug versus what you do with the information that you're going to get from the data uh, in which you're studying. So I think that's just my final comment uh, with regards to the issue. Thanks a lot. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to uh, go ahead and thank all of our uh, presenters, panelists, for um, a, a great discussion and all of you for uh, uh, contributing to it. Thank you. Um, so we're going to uh, go ahead and roll right into our next session, which would be the, the last session before the lunch. And so uh, as we're changing the table, I'll just invite the next set of uh, panelists and speakers to join us. Uh, okay, so during our uh, third session, we're going to turn to a discussion uh, regarding whether pressor risk and tolerance among um, diverse uh, development programs and how to look at that. As you've heard, as part of uh, FDA's overall benefit risk assessment uh, of investigational drugs, uh, FDA does acknowledge that the draft guidance, uh, um, in their drafting guidance, that uh, increasing blood pressure can be um, acceptable uh, or, or can be managed satisfactorily. Um, in certain particular uh, situations. In this, in this session, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the discussion on the best um, regulatory approach uh, to interpreting drugs' potential uh, blood pressure effects. So um, uh, joining us uh, in kicking off that discussion with presentation is uh, um, uh, George uh, Backris, Professor of Medicine and Director of the American Heart Association Comprehensive Hypertensi Hypertension Center at the University of Chicago. Um, following uh, Dr. Ba Bacris's uh, presentation, we'll have uh, um, panelists. Uh, um, Vasilios uh, Papadimitriou is professor of medicine at the Georgetown University School of Medicine and staff cardiologist at the VA Medical Center here in Washington, D.C. Um, Dr. Uh, Brandon Atkins, senior principal scientist at Merck Research Laboratories. Philip Sager, uh, adjunct professor of medicine at the uh, Stanford University School of Medicine. And then, and then finally, um, uh, Mitch Krukoff, professor of medicine and cardiology at Duke University Medical Center. Uh, so uh, welcome to our panelists and presenters, and I'll turn things over to uh, Dr. Backris. Thank you very much. Um, actually, in, in some of the previous talks, they've been great setups for this. And um, this is really a continuum from what I can see, certainly uh, with regard to the comments that I've made. Um, so the question is here, is there a blood pressure increase concern applicable across all development programs or should each program be individualized? And I think you've already heard very clearly that different drugs have different effects. And also it depends on the setting in which these drugs are being used as to the magnitude of the effect 
And then we've also heard consistently that absolute risk is probably more relevant here than relevant risk, although if you're coming up with a population uh, uh, generalizable kind of comment, then relative risk is probably as important. So I think we've already talked about this. Oh, okay. I think we've already talked about this in terms of um, a variety of different classes of drugs and what their effects can be. I didn't put testosterone on there, that uh, I apologize. Uh, it should be on there. But I, I think it's important to keep in mind that there are a variety of settings. Uh, one of the big settings that everybody, I think, kind of has in the back of their mind, but don't, only the hypertension specialists really see this, are people with ADD, adult ADD, that are on a number of these sympathomimetic uh, kinds of drugs. And when you start messing around with their blood pressure, then you have CNS symptoms that you have to actually see. So it's, it's, it's practical in terms of the consequences of the patient, not just the blood pressure changes. And again, it's about chronicity. It is not about something that's gonna give you an effect for a week or two weeks. It's something that you're gonna be taking lifelong. And let's not forget, let's not forget that these effects are also affected by sodium intake, which we know is variable. And one of the other things I didn't put in there, but also as important and has really become more, more important recently is quality of sleep. And many of these people with pain, many of these people with psychiatric disorders have sleep disorders. I'm not talking about sleep apnea, that's a separate issue. I'm talking about people that actually can't sleep. And trust me, that contributes in a major way to blood pressure variability, which is far more predictive of stroke than any elevation in blood pressure. So I think that's very important. So I found the stability trial. I am not a cardiologist and I'm not a lipid guy, although I play one on TV. Um, I thought this study was quite interesting because it actually was, the focus of this was LPA2 in a double-blind placebo-controlled 15,000 patient study with coronary disease. And they looked at blood pressure variability in this study, and the primary outcome was MACE. So that's fine. What is that? I just want to show you the characteristics here, because one of the things they did, and, and I apologize if you can't see it well, but they actually looked at changes in blood pressure variability. And they looked at tertiles, much like what was suggested earlier, in terms of less than 7.1, 7.1 to almost 11, and then greater than 11 millimeters of mercury. And they looked at this in the context of all the different patients that fit. They're not necessarily obese, but they're overweight, and they're primarily uh, Caucasian, not African American. And I think, look at the blood pressures at baseline. You're talking a range between 128 to 134. So these are not wildly hypertensive individuals. So I think that's the, to get back to the point earlier about, well, you have to be hypertensive to really see these effects. These are older people with reasonable blood pressures and certainly diastolics that are in a reasonable range. If we then look at what happened to the cumulative incidence of the primary composite, MACE outcome, by tertiles, you can see, to the point made earlier about two millimeters, that even the people that were less than seven systolic, uh, had a rise of less than seven systolic, still had significant events. And this is one year, the data starts here, one year after the trial was finished in terms of long-term events. So you can see this goes out, of course they wanna be dramatic, so they measure it in days. So it goes out to 1,200 days. So you can do the math and figure out this is years of follow-up. But it's pretty consistent and it starts about a year after, so kind of two years after, so what you were seeing from some of the older data. That's for systolic, and then the bottom is diastolic, and for sure, as far as diastolic, those that had greater than seven millimeter uh, rises that were sustained really had uh, relatively higher drama than the people that had less. But even people at four, less than four and a half had increases, it just was not as great. And this is long-term follow-up uh, as a result of this drug. So I think, you know, to try to put a number on it, as I said earlier, I think it's very difficult, and we have truckloads of epidemiologic data that will tell you two millimeters of mercury is a bad thing, and you can increase cardiovascular risk by 14%. I mean, that's a seminal paper in over 50,000 patients. But again, I think the, to be pragmatic, oh, this is just to show you it didn't really matter 
whether you had diabetes or not, pre-existing hypertension, um, and, and I just basically, if you're at the highest tertile, the risk was there. There was no uh, discerning uh, variable there. So the question comes up, is there, should we have a specific plan for specific drugs in a specific program, and if so, what should that be? And I think it's actually very difficult. I think each development program is unique and has its own unique risk tolerance, not just because of blood pressure, but because of other factors. And I think that needs to be considered when you're considering this. And, you know, fundamentally, we were talking about QT increases. You know, you could, you could make this reminiscent of that, but this is somewhat different anyway. So I, I think fundamentally, if you, uh, again, I'm gonna reiterate this, I, I have to say, maybe taking a page out of the oncology literature is a good way, that regardless of what your blood pressure is at baseline, if you see increases over time, and especially if you're hypertensive, you need to have the blood pressure at least below 140 before you really can say that you've reduced risk. Because most of these people are gonna have higher pressures. The comment made earlier about somebody walking around at 160, well, with all due respect, that should have been treated way before any therapy was started. So I think these are important points that have to keep kept in mind from a practical standpoint. And I'll just set the discussion up with that. Thank you. Okay, go, go ahead. Um, George, thank you very much for uh, an excellent overview of the topic. Uh, uh, the changes in blood pressure uh, obviously have uh, consequences uh, and they have significance. And small changes in, uh, in blood pressure, either systolic or diastolic in large populations, may uh, shift the, the risk profile of, the, of that population. But uh, before we make um, uh, definite um, um, uh, decisions or recommendations or guidelines, uh, doesn't matter how you want to call them, um, we need to consider a number of things that go along with the changes in the blood pressure. First, the population that we uh, are, are targeting, and uh, these changes are, have different consequences in different uh, patient population. Um, in high-risk patients, uh, small changes in blood pressure may mean uh, may meaningful. In low-risk patients, may have no consequences. Uh, and I just wanted to bring the MRC study, for example, that showed that for mild to moderate hypertensive, uh, five or, te or te five uh, millimeter of changes in the in diastolic pressure or ten in in systolic, uh, we needed to treat 850 patients uh, for a year to see a change of for, for one stroke. Um, in, the, uh, in the HOT study uh, that targeted diastolic pressure, uh, changes of uh, two millimeters, uh, if you remember the achieved blood pressure uh, in the three groups in the HOT study uh, was 81, 83, and 85, and had no consequences on outcomes. So in different populations, the changes in blood pressure may have uh, different um, um, effects. Nevertheless, if we um, have um, confirm and definite data that uh, changes in blood pressure uh, in a population that uh, is uh, uh, targeted by the new medication are uh, consistent and significant. I think uh, they're meaningful for the long run and we should t take them into account. How much that uh, blood pressure should be? Um, in my opinion, one or two millimeters probably uh, within the, uh, the uh, uh, range of, uh, of error and Probably we need we need confirmatory data before we consider them as uh, as definite uh, uh, changes and uh, as having an effect on outcomes. Um, but uh, if we confirm a trend of increasing blood pressure at any level, even two millimeters, uh, should be of concern, should be taken into account. Okay, oh, great, thank you, uh, Dr. Atkins. Great, thanks. Um, so if there's a theme. Um, so far today, at least the one huge take home that I um, have gotten so far is that blood pressure is extremely, extremely complicated. Um, this obviously is not as simple and even QTC isn't, but this is not the same situation as QTC where arguably a certain prolongation in QTC gives whatever patient who receives a drug an immediate risk of a potentially lethal arrhythmia. Um, and interestingly, the current draft guidelines, um, which again, the FDA should be applauded for putting together, really do outline this. And I just want to read line 117 to 123. Um, 
because I think it's really germane to what we're discussing. It says several factors can influence the importance of an effect on blood pressure, including one, the seriousness of the condition being treated, two, the effect of the drug on the condition, three, the underlying cardiovascular risk in the patient population most likely to use the drug, four, the availability of other effective therapies that do not raise blood pressure, five, strategies that can be used to mitigate the blood pressure effects, and six, the anticipated duration of treatment with the drug. Um, and then also in this room today, we've heard <clears throat> several others that aren't even, aren't, aren't listed here. Um, and some of these, including things that are addressed in the, in the current guidelines, such as acute versus chronic, are not as straightforward as they may sound. For example, um, if you're developing a drug for an oncologic indication, where lifespan, um, it may not be um, as extremely long, the potential risk of a long-term cardiovascular uh, effect is, is really, really questionable in regards to the potential benefit of the drug. Um, so all in all, I, th I, I have significant concerns about a, a one-size-fits-all approach to this obviously very complex issue. Um, my concern is by going with a one-size-fits-all, you may inadvertently create significant barriers to the development of arguably life-saving drugs that are otherwise safe um, and clinically efficacious. Um, and so obviously some, some thought, I really applaud again the group for coming together to, to address this, but I, I think it is a very, very complex issue, and I think every single program really has their issues, and it needs to be done on a drug-by-drug -drug basis and a case-by-case a -case basis. A couple other things I just want to mention, because I don't see them on any place else on the um, agenda, are some discussion about um, de-risking these things in the preclinical context. Um, I recognize that there is some literature that suggests that um, what happens preclinical may not translate to clinical work, but there's a large amount of work that we do in, in drug development to de-risk various issues, and does preclinical uh, assessment play a role in, in determining what the next steps should be? And then finally, you know, one of these barriers that are, can be significant are if we're talking about de-risking in, in the current document suggests that these de-risking should be done early in early stage programs. If we're talking about de-risking a two millimeter systolic blood pressure, one millimeter diastolic blood pressure in early programs, we're talking about exponentially increasing the size of those studies. A typical phase one study can be anywhere around 10 to 20 patients. Um, by our kind of back of the envelope calculations, looking at the variability of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring in studies that we've conducted at Merck, we're talking about studies um, that are upwards of 100 or more patients. Um, and so these are all the things that need to be considered. Thanks for the time. Great. Yeah, thanks for those comments. Uh, Dr. Sager? You know, it's always great to be on a panel when there's disagreements and you can have some kind of hot discussion. I, I think we're all in extreme agreement here. Uh, <laughs> George, I, I really enjoyed your talk, and I think all the previous comments. I, I would add that um, I think this is really different than the the issue around QTC, which is both a uh, risk that's uh, instantaneous and correlated to the degree of QT prolongation and the Cmax of the drug. Though we also are now well aware that the degree of QT prolongation is also, in terms of its risk, is drug dependent for drugs that affect multiple ion channels. Um, this is a very different situation in terms of chronic risk and uh, much more highly dependent on the underlying risk of the population, both cardiovascular risk, their blood pressure. I, I think um, I'm in agreement that we really need to have not one size fits all, but it be individualized uh, for the individual drug. And of course, drugs also may exert benefits that counteract the uh, any risk around blood pressure increases. So I, I think thinking of this in terms of, you know, is there an individual number? I, I don't think there is. I think we really have to do it um, drug program by drug program, integrating, you know, all the different uh, critical aspects. And I, you know, there's been some discussion about two or one millimeters of mercury. I think we really want to get away from those kind of specific numbers. And also trying to do this in phase one, obviously, as Brandon has said, is to totally unrealistic. This is something that would have to be you know, evaluated uh, later in development. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Mitch? 
Well, I, I guess in some senses the fierce agreement club makes my job a little easier. So what I, I think is worth doing is stepping back to really understanding that the whole part of this discussion is focused on developing a guidance whose major concerns are safety related. And at that level, I do think that particularly respecting the fact that uh, Ellis, Norm, Bob, and Doug have already put this many hours into it, that it's not a slam dunk. However, I still think there is sort of a four-dimensional roadmap approach where we could think about the high, 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 high risk corner and create some basic principles that, in fact, would apply across all programs and then dichotomize or individualize further down. So for instance, as we've said a, a number of times, and I'm, I'm going to ignore for right now the modalities of measuring a one to two millimeter change in a population and the technical side of that. We can get into that maybe later. I think we have to respect that even with ambulatory blood pressure, human liability with blood pressure, we're taking snapshots. So just to respect that the measurement itself has its own technical features. The baseline substrates, what are really the, so I think maybe we could all agree, if you already have hypertension, then further blood pressure elevation, you're probably in a higher risk category than if you don't. And write down the list that's been gone. So age, whether sex hasn't come up, but actually there's some interesting data that that may be different. If you already have heart failure, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there are certain categories of what is the patient baseline substrate? What is our understanding of what is normal and abnormal that blood pressure would provide a risk to is something we could potentially create what is a high in this particular domain. The objectives of therapy, I think, weigh in there too. So if you're curing cancer, then even if you have high blood pressure, and I think the guidelines that, were, that came out, control the blood pressure, go with the drug, et cetera. But again, if you have... A, a severe effect and you're only going to be on the drug sporadically or if you have a moderate degree of change but you're going to be on the drug persistently or if you have a modest effect or if you have a modest effect and sporadic you could you could see this as again an area where you could say what's the high high risk and long-term exposure or a very high reaction would be two. The mechanistic rat's nest, I think we also really have to respect though because whether it affects vascular tone or whether you're affecting heart rate and cardiac output, or which, which can actually be good for you when, if it's from exercise, whether it's metabolic changes if you're burning out the thyroid, you know, th these are all really different ways of creating elevated blood pressure. And that takes me back to the fact that a lot of the data we've looked at is epidemiologic where correlation and causation are not the same. And I think we've got to be really careful about lumping. If my drug elevates heart rate and I take Bob's approach and I treat with some diuretics, I can probably make the blood pressure normal. But ultimately, the overdrive of my atrium puts me into atrial fibrillation. I still have a stroke. So I think we have to be careful that we're on the right track with mechanism if the key recommendation is if the blood pressure is up, just treat the blood pressure and everything's going to be fine. I, I don't think that's a given. And I think actually the NSAIDs are another example or thrombotic complications. In fact, if you look a little deeper, how many of these are embolic strokes versus hemorrhagic strokes? How many of these are hypertension-related strokes? as opposed to other mechanisms, I, I think is another question. And that comes to the final part, which I think we'll also talk more about hopefully later, which is statistically, I'm all in on population-based statistics when it comes to public health questions and, and, and sort of getting cued in. But this is a particularly interesting circumstance where I think we really have to correlate that with much more of a personalized type of statistic. So people who on the drug have blood pressure elevation and people who otherwise seem to be matched who on the drug don't have elevation or actually have lowered blood pressure is telling us something that we should not overlook by averaging it into a population statistic. And insight into mechanism, I think, would be 
by best using both statistical rubrics, not just one or the other. So the last part of this is ultimately what does it drive if you're in the high, high, high risk zone toward the guidance telling you what you need to do next. And I think that's where, is it an outcome study? Is it a study where you randomize to treating the blood pressure and seeing if you make people and events go away? Is it something that could be done in a real world evidence oriented progressive universe uh, in a post market environment? But what is the barrier that comes with the signal? Uh, I think is, is another part of, a really important part of the guidance where separating out the higher from the lower risk scenarios could lead to understanding higher barriers versus lower barriers and what they are and when they come. Well, gee, Mitch, um, I thought that uh, with everybody on the panel agreeing with each other that this was going to end uh, uh, quickly. <laughs> but, uh, um, you put forth a, um, what I think is a really good um, sort of uh, um, not a compromise, but a um, sort of set of principles for how to think. I think, you know, everybody on the panel seemed to agree that a one-size-fits-all is not going to work, uh, but maybe for certain categories of the population that are in that high, 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 then you could think of a sort of pan-drug uh, development program that something that has to be done versus if you're not in those um, high, high, high categories, then, um, uh, that, then there would be a more of an individual uh, drug development program approach. But just to clarify really quickly before I move on, because I see even panelists here have questions about that for your, um, when you say high, 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 that's taking into account the um, duration of the therapy, the um, potential um, effect of the blood pressure, and the underlying uh, risk characteristics of that population. Is that the, are those the, th were, were you uh, implying three different dimensions of that high, high, high? At least, yes. At least, okay. Um, so, uh, Dr. Sager? Yeah, so Mitch, I just, you know, you brought up in this high, 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 maybe needing to do additional studies. You don't feel like this could be handled through labeling and identifying to practitioners risk and, you know, need to be aware of blood pressure and trying to control it. I mean, do you think a guidance should really mandate additional studies here? Or do you think, again, this would be handled on a very highly individualized basis, but usually this could be handled through labeling? Well, I won't go down a rabbit hole, but I will say that I think fragmenting our thoughts about what's real evidence as requiring studies per se is wrong thinking for the future of public health. I, I think continued evidence and electronic evidence analytic techniques and tracking signals in the real world shouldn't be setting up another study and another study, but it should be a continuum of evidence, and if we have a signal, we should have much more facilitative ways, more efficient, more in informative, and much less expensive to continue to track those specific signals and sort some of these things out. So before I turn things over to the audience, any other um, comments uh, you know, on, on this last proposal or, or other things that came up during the presentations from our panelists? No, no. <clears throat> I think the, um, the changes in blood pressure should be viewed in the context of risk and benefit. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, when uh, uh, we, we should estimate how much benefit the patient is expecting from the treatment, the new treatment, and how much risk that new treatment is, is providing to him. Um, and and the, the risk of small changes in, in blood pressure are... Um, sometimes negligible in low-risk population. You need to treat 10,000 uh, patients uh, before you can see a change in one stroke. One, one example I'm going to bring up is the, is the, is the VA studies. When Ed Fries, my boss, did the first studies uh, at the VA hospital, he only needed 180 patients to show benefit from treatment of severe hypertension versus placebo. Today, we need uh, 40, 42,000 patients in all had to try to see if there is difference between uh, the different drugs. So uh, the risk, obviously, of this population is much different. And uh, we should consider that uh, when we are uh, considering the risk uh, that's associated with the new treatments or with the new uh, uh, drugs we, we are uh, bringing on, on, on board. And also, we should also consider the uh, availability of other drugs that can do the same job. Is the patient going to benefit enough to uh, 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 make it possible for us to absorb the uh, small risk that we are adding to his uh, therapy or not? And I think we should be examining uh, the uh, changes in blood pressure in that context. 
Uh, okay, so I'll turn to the audience. I think we had, we had first over here, t two at this table. <laughs> so I think that you all appear to agree because we did a bad job, I think, wording this question. We made it a yes or no question. Um, and had we made it a, a what or a how question, I think it would be have been more clear that you all don't agree. Um, but um, so two thoughts. Number one, I think a lot of discussion is kind of bringing out perhaps that many of these issues straddle FDA guidance versus clinical practice guidelines. Um, and I think that would be um, helpful to kind of bring out a little bit more. But also a question specifically to Dr. Bakris. You're touting this oncology model of doing things that, well, with their clinical practice guidelines. But I'm wondering um, for drugs, in some ways, that's an easy category of drugs uh, because the benefit risk is quite clear. But for drugs that are, um, in which benefit risk is not as obvious, um, what would be your approach there? Well, I, I would put the onus on you to tell me what you're talking about because, for example, for example, <coughs> if you have severe arthritis, um, it's arguable most rheumatologists would say that the NSAIDs are giving you great benefit and they usually need more. If you're talking about psychiatric conditions, depression, et cetera, uh, clearly uh, those drugs are, if it's true depression, those drugs are really working well. Additionally, I can tell you in the adult ADD patients that I have, uh, if you start messing with those drugs to, for blood pressure, you're going to be in deep trouble very quickly from the patient's perspective. So I have not come across drugs that are not perceived or actually are of benefit to the patient. And so the reality is to balance off, uh, I, I realize that the, the perception and part of, on the part of the public is uh, drama with oncology. You're either dead or alive, and these are life-saving drugs. Well, I invite you to think about cardiovascular risk. Those are life-saving drugs, by the way. So I think that really what we're talking about is where is the happy medium here? What can we tolerate? And, and again, Forget about acute effects. This is, I'm talking about chronic, long-term effects. You're gonna be on this drug minimum six months and probably for years. That's what I'm talking about. And so those drugs need to have some acceptable safety level. And the reason I like the oncologists is they don't care, well, don't take this the wrong way. They don't necessarily care about the mechanism of why. They just know that if you're above 140, it's not good. And in fact, they're confident enough that their drug's gonna have you live much longer. So they want the pressures to be below 140 because they know the totality <laughs> of the data. Forget about nuances about 120, 140. They know if you're below 140, that's a good thing. And you're gonna do better than if you're above 140, period. And I like that level of simplicity because everybody can understand it and you don't get lost in the bushes in terms of subtleties. <laughs> So I, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next question. Great discussion. And uh, Dr. Kukoff, I was so glad that you actually brought up this other um, piece of information about the heart rate because so many times, you know, the drug products that we review uh, affect not only the blood pressure but the heart rate. And um, as you know, the uh, cardiovascular risk calculator that we have actually doesn't have a place for heart rate in there. And so while we have all these experts together, uh, if I could get um, further uh, guidance about how heart rate would uh, increase risk uh, in addition to the blood pressure. So, so I'm going to jump right in on that. And I really, really, really want to thank you for bringing that up. <coughs> this has been a pet peeve of mine for a long time. And then the original guideline that I chaired for the Kidney Foundation on blood pressure management and kidney disease, I actually put heart rate in there as something they needed to modify. And my colleagues said I was an idiot and I had, what was I talking about? It was irrelevant as far as kidney disease goes. And it is, but it's not irrelevant as far as heart disease goes. Steve O'Julius, to his credit, has always maintained that increased sympathetic tone is a key underlying variable. And he did an analysis of the value trial where he went back and looked at tertiles of heart rate. So he took all the people with blood pressures of less than 140 and then looked at heart rate 60 to 69, 70 to 79, and then 80 or greater. And then he simply looked at mortality. And guess what? If you were above 80, even though your pressure was less than 140, you had higher mortality, and the lowest mortality was at a heart rate in the 60s. And that was published in the American Journal of Cardiology because apparently it was post hoc and not sexy enough to get into the major journals. But I think the point is 
that heart rate needs to be looked at, and certainly for the weight loss drugs and those that modify sympathetic tone, heart rate is a big deal, and I make it at least a part of my regimen to try to get that down. So I would agree okay, completely, because I, 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 I think that we have to recognize that one of the... Com so, uh, Mitch, go ahead. One of the complexities of uh, Karen that I think blood pressure brings us to, in fact, we could have the same meeting about heart rate. And that's because there are end common pathways for so many human signals. I mean, normal physiology of exercise has been mentioned a couple of times. We elevate our heart rate and blood pressure. It's good for us the way we, it happens, blah, blah, blah. But if we have a fever and an infection, we elevate heart rate and can elevate blood pressure until we go into septic shock and then we drop blood pressure. And I think it was mentioned earlier, heart rate variability is another level of when you get to continuous evaluation signaling. So I think we're on a slippery slope because there probably quickly could become too much requirement for too much information that gives us too much buried individual information in population means of very high density sampling of information from human beings. On the other hand, we can't ignore that blood pressure and heart rate, that we're, where we're seeing changes in evaluating a new molecular entity, are also incredibly affected by everything else in our lives, stress levels, diet, activity levels, et cetera, and diseases, vascular disease, hormonal diseases. So somewhere we gotta get smart. And I think uh, understanding at an individual level, who are the responders? Who are, who are the patients exposed to a compound who show us today's signal, elevated blood pressure? And who are the folks who are exposed to that same compound who don't show us that response and get some much more personalized insight? Uh, and, and unless we're gonna go down the road where we've been before where Barrier, we provide barriers to new entities coming forward that get failed early on for the wrong reasons. That's a great point, Mitch, and uh, we'll go to the rest of the panelists too. Um, um, and also sort of related to the earlier point of um, what's relevant for FDA guidance versus uh, you know, clinical practice guidelines and, and treatment. Um, but Philip? Yep. Yeah, we're here today to discuss blood pressure, but since heart rate has come up, um, Clearly, higher heart rates on a population base, particularly older patients, re may reflect more risk, but it may have to do with underlying physiology. We've actually held two public meetings that have discussed, spent sections of those meetings discussing the data that supports or doesn't support drug-induced heart rate increases as being a cardiovascular risk factor. And, you know, for these increases under 10 beats per minute, the, the data the determination in both of those discussions was the data really didn't support a risk. Now, we could come back and have a, another meeting to discuss that, but drug-induced heart rate as a risk factor is, you know, the consensus was in those two discussions, which were DIA meetings uh, a number of years ago, um, seven or eight years ago, <laughs> you know, was not, did not really indicate a, a clear risk. So I think we, you know, wouldn't jump on that bag, bandwagon, but, Today we are here for blood pressure. Um, okay, so uh, okay, so uh, Vasilios, uh, go ahead. And yep, we'll uh, back a, a comment on, so, on 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 heart rate. Okay. So I I only mentioned heart rate not to increase barriers. Okay, but just to get it out there, uh, uh, just to throw you guys a can of worms. But um, but that perhaps it might be reasonable to have a line in this guidance for industry. Um, that uh, addresses something about heart rate, even though, um, uh, yeah, and that uh, it, it may impact risk. Well, I think it well, may I think the data to... doesn't support the data. You're, I think you're telling me it's not, but, but Dr. Backer is it telling me that guidance. it does. Uh, 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 well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking at a guidance level, what you may want to do is account for the importance of understanding the mechanism of blood pressure elevation. This is about blood pressure, but uh, if it's heart rate related. If, if every time you see blood pressure elevation, you see a heart rate elevation, then I'd be careful about using hydrochlorothiazide to treat the problem. 
Uh, in that context, I probably ag agree with uh, with Mitch, but uh, the the heart rate uh, is definitely a marker of something going on with the patient with hypertension. Uh, increased heart rate is it may be due to underlying heart failure, and that's why the patient is going fast, so he has higher risk. It may be uh, indicate uh, an increased sympathetic outflow, and that's increased risk. The problem with uh, using heart rate as a measure or as a as a, uh, an endpoint to treat our patients is that there is no study and there are no data indicating that reducing the heart rate benefits the patient. Just remember the MRC study again that compared diuretic to beta blocker. The beta blocker reduced the heart rate much, but the diuretic was better in preventing outcomes. So we don't have any solid evidence to support using the heart rate changes as a measure for our outcomes. Okay, um, okay. comment. Okay. Um, I, I, the point I was going to make is just what you made. There are a lot of data about heart rate, and I've spent 20-some-odd years producing some of them. Uh, we know that in patients with HEFREF, reducing heart rate to between 50 and 60 leads to optimal outcomes. We know that in people with coronary disease, chronic stable coronary disease, reducing heart rate does nothing. So, you know, one of the key points made at the beginning of this conference was we have to define in a guidance what we need to do about what we find. And I, I think that heart rate, as Mitch said, maybe it's too much. Uh, you know, blood pressure seems to be the topic. We gotta figure out what to do about that. One point about mechanism. I gotta tell you, I, I've been an advisor to the FDA since 1977. Uh, <laughs> so you're as old as Bob? <laughs> no, no, but he was the one who asked me to do it. The, the, um, uh, the point is that in all those years, in all those 41 years, or however many years that it's 42 years, I don't know how the mechanism of action of any drug. I know pharmacological effects of drugs. I know what's associated with what, but mechanism? very little information about that. So I'd, I'd be a little careful about talking about identifying mechanisms of action as a basis for, uh, for guidance. Uh, okay, back table. not working. Uh, there you go. Um, no, I, I want to go back to blood pressure again uh, as the topic, and, and it doesn't have to be part of the, the guidance per se, but um, and it's not one size fits all. But we do know as an industry, a drug development industry, as a clinical practice industry, and as a regulatory component, um, that pediatric and adolescent drug development and care is a key consideration. And that's an area that, again, doesn't have to be covered by the guidance. We can, in, in fact, do some longitudinal studies, as, as Mitch spoke about, where it doesn't have to be additional money. We can have the ability to follow these patients over a course of time. There is a study that was done on 17 oncologic patients that were treated when they were eight and nine years old. Now, statistically, it may not be that significant, but you could see off of that data that they developed heart disease earlier. Uh, they de and you could, you could watch the trend, and they, and, and they passed away earlier than what would be projected. So I do think, um, as an industry, uh, that there is a, a different population management than there is when we look at adult and maybe taking Mitch's component when we start to take a look at a quote unquote elderly, whatever that would be defined at, and then an adult population, and then <clears throat> pediatric. And again, it doesn't have to be part of the guidance, but it is a consideration if we're talking about the safety and the effect, the, the, the blood pressure impact on safety, looking at a long-term exposure. So just wanted to clarify that. Okay, time for uh, one last comment here. I think we all agree about drugs that have a huge blood pressure effect, but for drugs that have a small effect, I'd like to work backwards and, and try and just bring up whether 
this guidance is going to be helpful or not. Now, one, the FDA has a choice of approving or not approving a drug. And it doesn't sound like we're talking about not approving a drug simply because it has a small blood pressure effect. It don't, doesn't sound like we're talking about requiring a cardiovascular outcome trial for all of these drugs. And it sounds more as though it's about making sure that the effect is characterized properly and then that the appropriate language goes into the label so that a physician prescribing the drug has some inkling that it might be increasing blood pressure. But let's, let's ask what happens after that? Let's say drug X is approved. It produces a two millimeter increase in systolic blood pressure, one millimeter increase in diastolic blood pressure. You're going to take it for years. What is the prescribing physician supposed to do? My presumption from what everyone has been saying is check the blood pressure, and if their blood pressure is in the hypertensive range, you should treat it. But isn't that true without there being a guidance or any language in drugs label? Yeah. Should so, you be doing that anyway? Let's, um, Ellis, do you want to? <clears throat> so wait. I'm sorry, I don't know uh, your name, but Bob, Bob Kleiman from ERT. Okay. Well, you're you're right. So we're not talking about whether that this is the basis for an approval or a, or a turndown. Um, that's correct. We're not talking about outcome studies. We are talking about you know how to measure the changes, how to interpret the changes, and then what to put in the label. Um, people around the room have said, oh, well, you can monitor blood pressure, and people do it, and you treat it. I mean, there are a lot of uh, people in their 20s who uh, uh, have ADD, and they go to psychiatrists once a year or once every six months to get their drugs refilled. Most psychiatrists don't have a sphygmomanometer. They just don't. They don't check the blood pressure. Right, and there's and then there's not a prominent piece in the labeling that says, "Hey, you know, before you refill, you know, your your uh, Concerta." Oops, I used a brand name. I'm gonna go to jail. Um, <laughs> before, <laughs> uh, okay, I better stop. Um, so before before you use your stimulant, uh, you know, check the blood pressure. Um, I myself am on a number of drugs for chronic conditions. Don't worry, I'm not going to die anytime soon. But they, some increase blood pressure, some decrease. My doctor's office is six blocks from here, but I haven't seen her in more than a year. Nobody's checking my blood pressure, so that's why it's important to get something in the label to alert people that hey, you know, the drug actually could affect the blood pressure, and you need to watch it. Well, I, I don't know that it's so clear that. Putting this information in the label will necessarily change the behavior of physicians. And all you can do is try. That's true. But I, I would ask the question, should a physician, if they see this in the label, be more inclined not to use this drug? Because otherwise, <laughs> they should just be treating hypertension and checking blood pressure more often. Okay. And you don't need a guidance. Um, comment on this? Give it a minute, John. Yep. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think, one, a lot of what's been talked about today is almost irrelevant in the clinical practice setting. Number one, you have almost no chance in picking up individual small changes with how inaccurate blood pressure is measured in the clinic. Okay. The interperson standard deviation is, is huge. It's even sobering looking at ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, which we mistakenly believe gives everybody a stable baseline. It gives the group a stable baseline with people basically at the extremes having random changes that are unpredictable. I do think, though, it is worthwhile to figure out what these drugs do to blood pressure and warn physicians about it without necessarily saying they, they can't be used and giving them some guidance. But in a clinical practice, if you're trying to pick up three or four millimeters of mercury, you're not going to pick it up. You're going to be fooled by randomness in both directions, and it's just going to be really, really hard. So I do think it's worthwhile to, to get the information, get the guidance and all. But I don't think a lot of this has a much applicability to somebody in clinical practice outside of making broad recommendations. And if they see the blood pressure is not at target, 
may be understanding that this may be contributing to it, you may have to live with it and intensify therapy. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for those comments. Um, that will wrap us up for this session. This was a great discussion. Um, we're going to go ahead and go to lunch and come back at 1 o'clock. There are a number of restaurants in the area. If you'd like a list, uh, see the registration table. Um, and we will continue to discuss these issues uh, in the afternoon. And then there's a, a, a sort of an open public session to bring out any other a additional comments or issues that we didn't, weren't, weren't able to address. So thank you to the uh, panelists and presenters for this uh, great session. Thank you. If you, if you want to change what's going on here, no FDA policy is going to do it. No, I, I talk to us. I talk to you. Okay, but I'm just saying, the, the one thing that I found most influential. Yeah.
there at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Milton Pressler, Vice President, uh, Clinical Development and Operations at Pfizer Global Product Development. And then um, uh, Frank Rockhold, Professor of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at uh, Duke University. Um, okay, uh, and then, our, so our first presentation uh, to uh, Dr. McDowell. Okay, good, good afternoon, everyone, and <laughs> thank you for being here. This is the first section in the afternoon. I hope uh, everyone had a great lunch. So my talk uh, is going to uh, share with you some of the analysis that uh, we have done internally at the Division of Cardiovascular Renal Product to evaluate whether or not there is a need to include possible controls in ABPM studies. So this so in the current drive guidance under section five study design, there is a small paragraph talking about the control group. So the guidance clearly states that I mean it is desirable to uh, include to have a placebo control in ABPM study. Uh, the concern raised here is that there could be a change in blood pressure with time that mask the effect of a drug, make the placebo control more desirable. Uh, however, I mean, there's still a degree of uncertainty around this topic. And even internally, FDA, um, some people have a different <coughs> opinions on uh, what to recommend. So that's why there's a box below here that, so the further discussion on this topic uh, is encouraged. So my colleagues and I, so we decided to look at this issue further uh, to assess the impact of the placebo control using the ABPM database that we have at FDA. So uh, this database contains about 16 very old antihypertensive studies between uh, 1986 to 1994 and also a six more contemporary uh, ABPM study. Most of them are safety studies. So of these 22 studies, uh, 11 studies includes a placebo control, which is what we are interested in here and is including in our analysis. So a little bit more background about this project. So the objective is to evaluate <clears throat> the consistency of the change from baseline in placebo arms between studies. So as I mentioned, um, the 11 studies with the placebo, we include the 11 study with the placebo arm for a total of uh, 456 uh, subjects in this database. And all this subject had the baseline ABPN data and at least one post-baseline uh, ABPN data. Some subjects had up to like three post-baseline visits. So the median uh, duration for among this trial is uh, among those trials about six weeks. So we look at the mean change from baseline for both systolic and diastolic blood pressure, and we look at the blood pressure within three weeks, three weeks of 24-hour daytime and nighttime, which are the conventional ABPN endpoints. So this slide just show, uh, show you the hourly average blood pressure. So on the right is systolic blood pressure. On the left is systolic blood pressure, right is diastolic blood pressure. And here I'm just using the data from uh, two studies as an example. And so the black line indicates the hourly average blood pressure data from a uh, antihypertensive study, and the yellow line indicates uh, data in a study in normal tensive populations. So we think the study, um, I don't know if you can see clearly, but the solid line indicates the baseline data, and the dashed line indicates the post-baseline data. So as you can see clearly from this graph is that the diurnal blood pressure pattern uh, is very consistent over time uh, for baseline and the placebo basic. So the dashed line and the solid line, they are almost um, overlapping to each other. And this is the case for uh, hypertensive population and also for the normal tensive population. And um, this slide shows you the systolic average, I mean, average systolic blood pressure across studies uh, by the population. 
And as you can, uh, the, I mean, the baseline data is showing black and the post baseline data show in yellow. And as you can clearly see that there's no difference uh, in average systolic blood pressure uh, compared to baseline and uh, placebo visit. And this is also, the similar findings are also found for diastolic blood pressure. <coughs> so to evaluate the consistency for change uh, from baseline uh, across the studies, and we calculate the mean change from baseline within each study, and then we illustrate the results here in this forest plot. And as you can see that uh, across the study, uh, the mean estimates are centered around zero with 95% uh, confidence intervals across uh, zero, which indicate that there is no, I mean, there's no difference between baseline and placebo visit. And this result is particular for change from baseline for 24 hours systolic blood pressure. And we found the same, I mean, similar finding for using daytime and nighttime. And we, did not, uh, we do not see the difference between baseline and post baseline data. Again, this is the result from, for change from baseline for 24 hour diastolic blood pressure. The same pattern, you can see that all the estimates are centered around zero and they seem to suggest that there's no difference between baseline and post baseline visit. So we also look at some subgroup of interest, including age, uh, race, and the sex. And subgroup results are, I mean, in general, consistent with the overall results. Uh, however, you may note that uh, there is a numerical higher mean change from baseline among blacks with an average about two millimeter mercury increase. Um, I want, however, I want to point out that this subgroup is quite small. And in, uh, in general, we do not want to um, overinterpret this type of, I mean, this type of subgroup analysis unless we have a very good, good reason uh, supporting the observed findings. So the next slide. So up to this point, our data seem to suggest that uh, it is not um, necessary to include placebo control in ABPN studies. And this particular analysis um, show you that there's actually a price to pay. So for example, if you want to exclude a study with a four millimeter increase in blood pressure, uh, one would need about like 30 subjects in a single arm ABPM study, and uh, more than 100 subjects is needed if uh, you want to I mean, include the placebo control. This is like more than doubling the size of a single arm study is nearly fourfold increase. And so whether or not to include uh, placebo arm is a very important element to design uh, efficient uh, ABP studies, which uh, my colleague, Dr. John Henderson, is going to uh, talk about that topic in more details in the following section. So here are like some points I would like to bring up for your attention and perhaps just to facilitate some discussion after this talk. Uh, first of all, uh, findings of a lack of a placebo effect uh, is actually not new. I mean, this finding has been uh, reported in some uh, small antihypertensive studies about 20 years ago. So our project with a much larger size uh, confirmed this early findings. And in addition, uh, we also found that the lack of placebo effects also are observed in the normotensive population. So if you think about uh, the nature of the study design, uh, which it makes sense that the placebo effect is less likely, especially for the drugs that are taken orally. Uh, this type of APPM study uh, has minimal interaction uh, between the patient, clinician, and treatment environment. And we all know the um, no advantage about ABPN compared to the in-office cuff measurement in terms of uh, uh, reducing the white coat syndrome. And all this, I mean, if you think about from the design aspect, it seems it somewhat supports the finding. So the third point I want to mention is um, that we know that some ABPN vendors, they routinely 
exclude uh, the first few hours of data because of the concern that there may be an early placebo effect uh, in the earliest part of ABPN. Uh, that is because the subject may have a transient reaction when, when, they first, when you first put on the device. Uh, however, uh, we do not know how consistently uh, this approach has been done across uh, different vendors. And from our end, uh, we note that uh, this approach is not clearly described in the protocol or study report we received. And so we would like to hear uh, from some of you uh, to share the experience on this subject. But having said all this, uh, we do not think that this early placebo effect, if it exists, has a mean, I mean, has a very, I mean, have a significant impact on 24 hour average or daytime. It's just too trivial for the average data. So the last but not least point that I've been talking about the placebo control in APPN studies as a whole, but are there any different concerns regarding placebo effect in an efficacy study compared to a safety study? And so that's just some of the points. And the last, um, so, so far, although we do not think that placebo control is necessary for most of ABPN study, but we think there are some scenarios that uh, placebo, where placebo group is uh, very helpful. And the first is whenever we want to target high-risk patient population using blood pressure as an inclusion criteria. For example, systolic blood pressure greater than 160. And in this case, uh, we have to worry about the regression to the mean phenomena. That is that if we select subjects based on the extreme blood pressure, so from the tail end of the distribution, and then this, I mean, the part, um, patients is going to, their blood pressure is likely to be closer to the average for the following um, the measurement. So that's why uh, placebo, uh, including a placebo control is important here, just to minimize the risk of a regression to the mean. And another approach in the design phase is that uh, we should always have a separate screening phases and that you, uh, you shouldn't use the baseline ABPM data uh, to select your subjects. So the last uh, the second scenario is that whenever uh, you are interested in using APPN study to assess a long-term uh, effect of drug on um, uh, blood pressure, then the placebo control may be helpful here to control seasonal change. However, we do not think that this scenario uh, applies to type of ABPN study we are interested in, uh, because uh, for the safety ABPN study, we Usually, we just try to quantify the blood pressure effect when drugs reach a steady state, which it doesn't take that long. We are talking about uh, study duration in weeks. And next. So in summary, and our data uh, shows that the di diurnal pattern appears very consistent over time, and we do not see a difference in blood pressure uh, between baseline visit and the correspond, I mean, between possible phasing and the corresponding baseline phasing. That's it, thank you. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Z. Uh, so we'll hear from uh, uh, Raymond. Oh, great. So knowing time is always of a premium, I had one slide I wanted to show and uh, John Black took most of my thunder uh, just before lunch with respect to the uh, impact of that, assuming it uh, shows up here somewhere. Um, so there should be a fan plot somewhere in that slide set. I can keep flipping through these, but I'm probably going to give somebody else's talk if I keep doing this. And so <laughs> I may have to do the Mr. Rogers thing here if that doesn't show up in a couple of seconds. But let me, let me, while we wait for this fan plot, let me prompt your memories to rewind about five years ago in March of 2014. A couple blocks away, the American College of uh, Cardiology was holding its annual meeting here, and the results from the renal denervation study were released. 
If you looked just at the hypertension denervation arm, you would have seen a 14 millimeter office blood pressure reduction and a seven millimeter ambulatory systolic blood pressure reduction. And at the time, Medtronic had parallel reviews going with FDA and CMS. And if you looked just at the denervation effectiveness, you would have put a little tick in the plus column. What boogered up that study was that the placebo, the sham control arm, had a 12 millimeter office blood pressure reduction and a five millimeter ambulatory systolic blood pressure reduction. So one of the caveats I wanna make sure we all have somewhere clearly laid out here is that sometimes that placebo arm can uncover for you perhaps off protocol phenomenon that occur that can taint your placebo, taint, T-A-I-N-T, taint your placebo control group. So we learned a large lesson from that and had to build in safeguards to make sure that any drug usage for blood pressure in a denervation, a device trial, was carefully not only monitored by our study centers, but surveilled with urine and blood screening for any hypertensive drugs. What I would have shown you had the slide come up was a just the raw data for what a, you know what ambulatory blood pressure monitoring data looks like before and after in a placebo group. It's one thing to see bar graphs and to see summary data with nice standard deviations around the thing. It's another thing to take everybody's 24-hour systolic blood pressure baseline and then measure it again at three months or six weeks or whatever. And that fan plot looks like this. You've got people that go up and people that go down. The miracle is that usually the ups and the downs balance one another. But when you do consulting for industry, especially if they're developing a drug for a non-blood pressure related indication, and maybe someone noticed that there was some office pressures, but maybe this is a urologic drug, and who knows how well blood pressures are done in a urologic setting, or a derm setting, or even what you heard a little earlier about a psychiatric setting. You see this office signal, you say, okay, we should do an ambulatory study. And you do the study, and maybe it comes out showing less than a millimeter of change before and after. But then you have people that want to take apart the data. And then they look at a fan plot, and they pretty much freak out when you see people that have 20 millimeters of systolic blood pressure increases in the placebo arm over a 24-hour period. So my plea is that when we begin to interpret the issues with respect to the need for a placebo control arm, always keep in mind what kind of population we're dealing with and the fact that there is a certain amount of biologic variability in a phenomenon like the 24-hour blood pressure that you see really well when you actually look carefully at the data, not just at the summary statistical data. There it is. Here it is here. This is what I'm talking about. You see people that go up 20 points and down 20 points in the sham control arm. So that's my final picture worth a thousand words and that kind of thing. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks. And there was your slide. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, Milton? Oops, thank you. Well, um, I would say, first of all, uh, speaking for for our company um, we've operated under the view that uh, using ABPM uh, did not have a significant uh, a placebo effect and uh, and so uh, dr. McDowell's uh, presentation doesn't take us by surprise that that said one always has to uh, whenever one uses the word lack uh, you have to know uh, the precision around the use of that, and uh, we we never felt that you could exclude uh, a millimeter uh, that there might be as much of a millimeter or or thereabouts effect. Um, I would say that uh, our view is also that uh, we have some concern about being prescriptive across all indications for use. Uh, a lot of the data that we are uh, that we've been examining today are in hypertension, diabetes, and so forth, where one might be able to have a placebo control. Um, but uh, uh, as uh, we went through precision and we had people with intolerable uh, arthritic pain, we didn't feel that a placebo was ethical. 
uh, particularly for months uh, of use. So uh, quoting Dr. Bohr, a placebo is good, but sometimes can't be done. And um, so that's, uh, I, I think for us, placebo is very valuable trying to put context onto safety, um, but trying to measure uh, uh, small differences in blood pressure, I think we almost need to discuss with the agency case by case as to what use the ABPM study is going to be made. If you're trying to quantify uh, uh, the, the blood pressure effect in a, a chronic condition, the placebo helps to reinforce your finding, uh, and uh, that, that might be good to include. Uh, but uh, if you use it across the board, now you're creating a potential barrier to uh, developing new uh, treatments uh, in, uh, in considering uh, all of the various domains at which uh, companies are developing drugs. So, okay. Good points. Uh, great. Thanks for those. And um, Norman, I didn't uh, introduce you at the beginning, but uh, for. Um, anyone in the room who may not know you, uh, Norman Stockbridge, uh, Director of Division of uh, Cardiovascular Marine Products at FDA. So our, our interest is in trying to get some information on the blood pressure effects of drugs um, without it being uh, any more burdensome than it needs to be to get uh, a reasonable uh, uh, evaluation done. And if there is no uh, effect, uh, uh, no placebo effect um, that you can tell by looking at a large series of trials, large, large numbers of um, uh, placebo or untreated uh, subjects in trials. Um, if you then do a study with a small number of subjects in it, you will sometimes see something that is um, uh, statistically does not look like zero, um, you know, but that's as likely to be a statistical artifact as it is to be anything uh, uh, related to your study design if you've done a couple of sensible things. Um, and uh, Z pointed them out. Um, th there appears to be a true seasonal difference uh, that you need to compensate for if you're looking at studies uh, run uh, over many months. Um, that is with baseline and on treatment separated by months. Um, and then uh, there, because there is day-to-day -day variability in an individual's blood pressure, um, it is subject to regression to the mean. So if you screen your trial using your baseline blood pressure, if those are the same thing, even if you did ABPM and not cuff, if you, if you screen based on that, you will see regression to the mean, uh, and that may look like a placebo effect. Um, I don't know what happened in the small device trial uh, that seems to show a treatment of uh, uh, a, a placebo effect. Um, I don't know whether it was a design feature or a statistical fluke. <laughs> Um, but I wouldn't use that to undermine a large series of trials that seem to say there's little or no placebo effect with ABPM. And just one postscript, the hypertension 3 trial was hundreds of patients, 500 and some, I think, were randomized to to denervation, one to sham. So it was actually a very large trial. Um, much larger than any of the individual trials you've seen here. And um, the lesson and the point I was trying to make is that sometimes things happen, despite good protocols, to a control group 
especially when you're dealing with something that they can self-medicate outside the protocol. That was the only caveat I was laying on the table. And, uh, great, thanks for that. And I think we have um, Frank Rockhold on, on the line too to, uh, to chime in. Yes, thank you. Uh, I am not Kevin Anstrom. Kevin got called away to a family emergency on Friday. Um, I was not able to see the WebEx. Apparently, WebEx is only good for people who are not actually at Duke, so um, I couldn't get in. But um, I was able to, to follow the slides from the presenter. I didn't, unfortunately, see Dr. Townsend's thousand-word slide. Um, I, just a few comments. Um, just to go back to Dr. Stockbridge's comment, clearly regression to the mean is a, is a good utilization of uh, placebo for any number of reasons, and he highlighted some of them. So any kind of screening, whether it's screening for normal or, or hypertension patients, um, placebo would be a good, uh, a good use. Um, I, I guess we also need to be careful about is clearly you need to use a lot more patients, but also recognize we're not testing the same hypothesis here as we're testing a between patient versus a within patient hypothesis. So it shouldn't surprise anybody that we're going to use a lot more patients. It's not actually a direct, a fair comparison because you would get a lot more information about between patient variability in the placebo study. I have a, I have a couple of observations which may be more, you may have talked about these earlier in the day. Uh, we're, I've heard a discussion about looking at average blood pressure during the day. If, there, if there's interest in looking at um, the variability of the blood pressure during the day, um, rate of rise, say from night to daytime, peaks, because if I look at the slide, it was presented um, by uh, Dr. McDowell, um, the diurnal variation in the hypertensives looks actually different than normal tensors. So if there's a, a reason to want to to pull that apart, that may be another reason to want to include placebo in these studies. Um, the other issue is um, these were six-week trials, as I understand it, um, and I, whether or not if you had looked at placebo in a longer-term uh, longer scenario, I would be able to tease some of the things apart that Dr. Stockbridge was talking about. So those are the, the uh, observations I have from Dr. McDowell and listening to Dr. Uh, Townsend and um, Stockbridge's comments. Uh, great. So um, uh, a lot of really good comments from the from the panelists. And um, before I turn to the audience, I'll give uh, uh, you all a chance to react or respond to what you heard from your fellow um, panelists or presenters. So, um, Z, any any um, mm -hmm. sort of reaction to, yeah. to the last comment? Uh, I'll answer his second question first, because <laughs> I about the daily variability. No, no. I think the second question is about whether or not we have a look at the uh, longer yeah. studies. I mean, in our study, the median, I mean, duration is about six weeks, but the longest, longest trial is about 12 weeks. And at least up to 12 weeks, we do not see a difference between the baseline and the placebo visit. And in terms of uh, the earlier questions, and we have not uh, looked at this, I mean, using the variability as a specific endpoint to um, assess the impact of a placebo control. Uh, I mean, for us, we just try to uh, use the, the conventional measurement and just to try to see whether or not we can um, observe a difference between baseline and placebo basis. So variability is not, um, we have not done that yet. Okay, great. Um, any other comments from the, from the panel? Just one short sure. one. Yeah. So just, just keep in mind that when we manage people, we're typically managing an office-related blood pressure with all of its shortcomings. When we use ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, we're doing a very selective procedure that typically is not reimbursed except for the sole indication of elevated blood pressure in the absence of hypertension. So when we try and translate whatever recommendations we make from this day forward, we always have to bear in mind that there are some um, limitations in terms of using this kind of recommendation to actual inpatient uh, in-office encounters with patients because of the different kinds of modalities that are being used. That's a good point. Uh, Norman? I, I, I wanted to latch on to something that, uh, that Frank raised as an issue um, and see whether or not those of you who live in the hypertension space uh, have have some better insights into this. My impression is that 
for the vast majority of drugs that lower blood pressure, the, you will see a uh, within day response that looks something that tracks somehow the, the uh, plasma level versus time response. But that if you looked four or eight or 12 weeks out, you don't see that anymore at all. For most drugs, you get a, uh, an effect on the blood pressure that even, even if it's not a um, uh, drug that has plasma levels uh, significantly high uh, throughout the interdosing interval, uh, the blood pressure effect is the same. The ABPM curve is shifted up, shifted down by some number of millimeters of mercury, but the time course of that has been lost. I think that's true of most drug classes. Uh, that, is that other people's impression as well? Uh, George, <laughs> and, then, and then we'll go over there next. So just to let you know, since we were having issues this morning with the microphones, there's a delay for even the light to turn on. So you press it, and then you wait a little bit, and then the light turns on, and then it turns on. Um, so I know that that was kind of well, good right news, now, that should be The good working. news is, yes, the good news is by operant conditioning, we've, yeah. we've come to this point. <laughs> but uh, let me, let me uh, build on Norman's point, and then I want to get back to Ray's points, because they're actually related, believe it or not. The, the, the data from Simplicity 3, and we've looked at this in great detail, PI trying to explain this, has a lot to do with behavior that you cannot control, independent of pharmacology. The word is known as adherence. And that also relates to some of the things that you said. And when I'm talking about adherence, I'm not talking about they're not taking the drug. They're still taking the drug. But by the way, their thought intake changed. Or oh, by the way, their sleep behavior changed. Nobody's accounting for these variables. They assume this is a canceling out event, and it's not by any means. This is why in the studies we're doing today with ABPMs, we're using dot ABPMs. So we're giving the drug, like the old psych units, the drugs are being taken in front of us. We're actually seeing the patient swallow the drugs, and then we put the ABPM on. So we can actually see what's going on, and they've been advised about salt and whatever. In that setting, in a short-term setting, I think it is meaningful. But I think you, you have to also appreciate that these are the limitations of ABPM. You also have to appreciate the underlying vascular biology because a lot of these people are not going to dip at night. If you look at 24 hour, then that's going to give you a different thing than daytime ABPM. So there's a, there's a gold mine of information in there, but it becomes very murky unless you tease it out in a way that I think is meaningful. And these variables have to be taken into account. Okay. Um, and Point. Mike. Okay. Yeah. At the. I think there were two back there at that table. Okay. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Figured it out. Uh, Norm and, and, and Bob will probably remember this, but a number of years ago, the cardiorenal division did an analysis of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring from the placebo groups and a large number of hypertension registration studies, thousands of patients. And you came to the conclusion back then that there is in fact no placebo effect when you use ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, almost to a point where I seem to recall Ray Lepicki, don't know whether it was or an ad hoc comment at one of the advisory boards saying that it may not even be necessary if you use ambulatory blood pressure monitoring in a clinical trial to have a placebo group because what the changes in ABPM are meaningful. Now, what Dr. McDowell has shown is it's sort of along those lines as well. And I, th I think most of us, as George just pointed out, 
believe that for at least over the short haul, a matter of weeks or maybe up to a couple of months, uh, ABPM is going to be very consistent in a placebo group. The troubling point is the point that I brought up this morning and Ray expressed very strongly now. For a cohort, the reproducibility is terrific. For individuals, it's all over the place. That, that's a problem. But I'm sorry, Bob, I'm, I'm sure you had a comment to make about that. And then I paused. Hello? Yes. OK. No, I wasn't going to comment on that. I, I'm, I'm impressed by what you described and what Z described, that the, if there's a placebo effect, it's not very large and, and, and so on. And if what the study is designed to do is show the blood pressure effect of a treatment, I'm perfectly plausible, I find it perfectly plausible that the small potential placebo effect won't obscure that. But what we're talking about here is safety studies to a degree to find out whether the drug has a very modest effect of two or three like that. And my bias is that, and even in some of the studies he showed, there were effects of that size, two millimeters of mercury, and that could target, a, that could tag a drug as increasing the blood pressure when it really didn't which doesn't seem a very smart risk to take. Um, so I just wonder about that. But you know, if, if, if you're trying to show that a drug has a six millimeter mercury effect, this isn't gonna obscure it. I'm not remotely worried about that. So maybe ABPM alone is fine there. But I'm still worried about the safety things. We're yeah. even a couple of millimeters the wrong way for whatever reason, maybe because you screened them for having normal blood pressure at the beginning, you know, sometimes. I, I don't know what they do. I think we need to think about that, too, because the safety situation seems different. Okay. okay. I, of course, w we don't have studies with three placebo groups, you know, in the same protocol. But I suspect that if you did, they'd show as much variability as the within, with, as the between study variability is here. So I don't think that the trend of one study to look a little lower and a little higher and those, that's just, that's just statistical artifact. That's not, that's, that's not, that's probably got nothing to do with the trial at all. Well, I just think that whole thing ought to be looked at. Where, 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 the, where a positive study is a two or two and a half millimeter difference between the two, are you somewhat likely to get that as a spuriosity uh, more than if you actually had a concurrent placebo? Because yeah, that would be the, a, that the, would be the question isn't whether whether bad. whether whether a group might look like it's got a two millimeter effect when there really isn't. It's it's that that's as likely to be true regardless of the group, right? No, no, and and, I, and to take two two samples and subtract them isn't, isn't reasonable. No, I don't know if it's as likely. That, that depends on a lot of the assumptions you make about the population you put into this study. As, as uh, Z said and others have said, if there's any selection of the patients and it isn't correct, for example, if you tried to exclude anybody who was too high, so you people who are relatively low and they go back toward their their baseline then it could look like the blood pressure increased and it really wouldn't be the drug it would have been back to where they were normally I'm just saying you got to worry about that because a spurious finding of positive blood pressure effect is absolutely not what anybody wants right. but all, all of the studies that Z talked about had blood pressure selection criteria in them but they were all based on the cuff blood pressure, not on the ABPM. Right. And some of, them, some of them showed a change in the placebo group, too. Yeah, well, sure. Yeah. But in the case that I'm describing, you really mostly, first of all, if it went down, you might obscure an effect, leaving that aside. But if it went up, 
spuriously, you'd be then targeted as a drug that raises blood pressure, which probably is not what most people want. Okay, so Mitch, do you have weigh in on this? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> with, with patients, I would. So maybe I'm missing something, but it seems to me we're talking about two things. One is, do you need a placebo because in a population you might subselect a group that wouldn't show something you want to see from a safety point of view? So randomizing might make that a little more visible. The other, to me, as, a, as an ex sort of uh, mechanistic guy or core lab director, is do we have the ability, the sensitivity within the test to see the threshold confidently that we think is a meaningful threshold. And for that, I, I guess my question to the panel would be, well, so why not think about just doing, uh, using the patient as their own control with an internal crossover and, and just put them on drug, have them on placebo, and have them back on the drug, and if there's really a, a very fine tune because we're using the same methodology, the same patient, and then a two millimeter change would probably be visible, at least something you wouldn't miss. Uh, Vasilios, uh, and yep. then the, the, the table back there. I, I think all, all these are very important points, and uh, I wanted to elaborate on the point that Dr. Tempo uh, uh, pointed out earlier. Uh, the uh, ABPM is. Uh, is probably more reliable than office pressures because it averages uh, overall about 70 pressures in 24 hours. There is variability of blood pressure to, to during 24 hours, but there's also variability longitudinally from visit to visit, and that's applicable for office pressure and for 24-hour um, monitoring. So that I think the, the variability that we see in different studies is not so much because of the technique, it's because of the uh, selection bias of the studies, it's because of the design of the study. If you design studies to have a cutoff of inclusion criteria, like the, most of the denervation studies that require systolic above 160, you are selecting patients on their highest uh, uh, visit of uh, blood pressure office. And the next time they are doomed uh, to have a lower pressure, so you are going to see variability in both, in the office and the ABPM. If you look at the denervation studies uh, that uh, lately were designed with more, more vigorous uh, uh, design plans, uh, there is no uh, placebo effect, or there is no difference in the uh, placebo arm, in the sham arm, either in office or in ABPM. So the design is probably more crucial to see the variability rather than the technique itself. Uh, the only difference or the benefit I see from the ABPM is that it averages a lot of our blood pressure over a 24-hour period and is more reliable and more, more reproducible than the office. But it is subject to the same variability from visit to visit. And in that respect, we need to take into account and probably if we want to see small differences, we should be doing more ABPMs and average them after intervention to see if there is a, a, real, uh, a real difference. Or if we are comparing the two uh, treatment arms, we should uh, uh, do uh, more than one ABPM uh, for the intervention and more than one after the intervention to average them and see if there's a real difference. Uh, we have time for one last comment. At that time, um, a couple things. You know, you're talking about the intervention trials and with the renal denervation. You have to, I hate to say this, put that on a separate shelf. Uh, there were challenges in that trial, and all of them, specific to maintaining consistency and quality of the data collection. Sites were able to do all kinds of things on their own with the ABPM. And what you need to do and what we had done historically, if you're going to look at hypertension, is similar to what Dr. Papadimitro was saying was, and, and others, was that it's very controlled in the sense that a patient comes in between uh, 6 and 10 o'clock in the morning. They're dosed, uh, you know, in that window. So you're able to show a delta. You're able to show that change based upon response to the therapy. With the renal denervation trials, that was not held to the same level you didn't have to have X number of readings per hour. So I'd like to put that on the shelf 
uh, as a comparison when you're trying to look at placebo effect or not. The other component when you're looking at trial design um, that you want to take a, a consideration of is the fact of who you want to include and exclude, especially if you're going to look at uh, your 24 hour meetings and your day and your nights. Not that night shift people are not good people to take a look at but you then start to see a change in the circadian rhythm and try and compare a night shift person to a regular day person will affect how you look at that data. When you start to take a look at managing variability, you then want to take a look at the number of readings that you're capturing per hour. Uh, there's a difference between what's done in clinical care to get that vision of what that individual's blood pressure changes versus in a clinical trial and how many readings should be taken per hour uh, to be able to draw a conclusion of what is that delta change in blood pressure. Um, and then I think you have to look at ADPM and other blood pressure measurement techniques as complementary because, uh, as Dr. Townsend and others have said, ABPM is not something that is always available, at least within the, in the North American U.S. market. Um, so we do have to tie it to something, and we do have to tie it and improve uh, methodology of taking off this blood pressure and consider things like home blood pressure in some scenarios based upon the compound. But again, when you're looking at safety and we're looking to show the potential of a blood pressure signal, we do have to be a bit more rigorous in how we go about assessing and defining what is a good 24-hour ADPM. Uh, it's not just 70% valid readings. I want to make sure I have X number of readings per hour over the 24-hour with exceptions so that I can draw that conclusion. Just putting an ABPM on and getting a 24-hour mean, you could get a 24-hour mean and be missing eight hours of data if you don't put in criteria that says what is defined as the good 24-hour monitoring, again, more with the goal of being able to define a delta that might indicate a blood pressure signal. Um, and Sue, to your, your question, there is a blip in time where at least from the industry perspective, there were two articles that came out that said that first hour was potentially a technology response. I can speak for my own group. We don't, we haven't done it, you know, except for that one, there was one uh, hypertension drug where they, they felt it, but I, I don't think any of us are really removing that first hour anymore. Okay, great. Thanks for that so comment. Greg, and, uh, Frank, go ahead. Yeah, just a couple quick comments. I just want to at the point Bob Temple made that any selection criteria you put into the study, whether you're looking at normo or hypertensive patients, will generate some degree of regression in the mean, which will get attributed to the drug if you're not using a placebo group. And also to point out, I quite like Mitch's idea of the crossover design. Um, I guess you have to think about how long you want to measure them. It could get to be a long study if you wanted to do or three periods of the washout, but that is one way to, to uh, maybe meet both masters there. Okay, great. Uh, so I'd like to thank the panelists and presenter for a wonderful um, session. Believe it or not, that's the end of our session one. Uh, and, uh, run right into session two. So thanks to our panelists, and I'll invite the next ones up. Yeah, my, my thanks too. And I would like to ask uh, the session two panelists to uh, come on up while I'm introducing the session. So you might think, well, we've been here a lot longer than what seems like one session, but there were four parts dealing with some of the, key, the four key issues uh, that we laid out at the top that were um, raised in the draft guidance. Uh, you all, in discussing those issues, um, uh, raised some issues that I think are going to be relevant for the remainder of the day, too, as we focus on some key design issues, especially around um, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and uh, other methodologic issues um, in uh, uh, designing presser studies. So uh, right now, for session two, we're going to focus squarely on ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. This came up, uh, has come up all day, including at the, the end of the last session. We want to consider how to efficiently design ambulatory blood pressure monitoring studies, including some discussion of the metrics for evaluation, what to do when studies are complicated by missing data, and how sample sizes affect the study statistical power. So some of the issues that you've already touched on uh, and uh, a bit more. And as in our previous session, we're going to begin with a presentation from an FDA colleague, 
Uh, Lars Johansson is a clinical analyst in the Division of Cardiovascular and Renal Products. Uh, we're then going to hear perspectives from uh, a set of panelists, uh, Charles Benson, Senior Medical, Te uh, Medical Director of Clinical Farm uh, for Diabetes with Eli Lilly, uh, uh, and then uh, Frank Rockhold, Professor of Biostatistics and uh, Bioinformatics at, uh, at Duke again, um, uh, Dr. Johansson uh, again, and uh, um, uh, uh, I think that uh, covers the group, right? Okay, great. So, uh, Lars, uh, over to you. There we go. All right. So thank you for the introduction. I'll be providing uh, some discussion on some design uh, suggestions for efficient AVM studies. And the usual disclaimer. So my presentation consists of three parts. Uh, in the first part, I'll be uh, discussing some key protocol features I will be focusing on throughout the presentation and give, uh, go through two recent AVM studies and how Contrast to compare for these key protocol features, and the key protocol features I'll be focusing on relates to the primary endpoint. For example, it was a 24 hour mean, a daytime mean, a nighttime mean, whether a single arm was included, uh, the number of readings per hour, and definition for whether or not APM session or recording was valid. In other words, what was, what was, what was the criteria that triggered a repeat APM session? In the second part of my presentation, I'll be uh, discussing how these key protocol features impact. Um, the study size increase when the true effect is zero, in other words, power, and how um, the impact of false negative rate, in other words, the fraction of studies have failed to exclude a four millimeter mercury increase when the, four, when the true effect is four. And again, I'm using a four millimeter here just as an example of my presentation, and this part here will be assessed using uh, a simulation study. And in the end of the last part, I'm going to put all the pieces together and some suggestions for uh, considerations when designing efficient AOPM studies. So, C talk a little bit about this. I'm just going to repeat some key points. We have an APM research database that consists of 22 studies conducted between 1986 and 2017. Each of these studies have a arm. Of the 22 studies, 11 of them included a placebo arm for a total of 456 subjects, and the median study duration in this database was approximately six weeks. Each study in our database included between one and three post baseline visits and a median number of three measurements per hour during the night time and uh, four measurements per hour during the daytime. So, that, so at, at the beginning of my presentation, I just want to contrast and compare two recent APM studies I found literature, precision APM, and the synergy study. Uh, both studies used a 24 hour mean systolic uh, BP measurement as a primary. One used, included the same one, not one not this morning. In terms of the number of subjects per arm, it ranged 170 to 180. In the precision that was accounting for dropouts in the study. In terms of the number of uh, measurements per hour, it ranged a little bit more densely during the daytime of two measurements per hour to three and four during the nighttime, with slightly vari slight variation in the day and nighttime definition. I was un un unable to find the criteria for the pre precision study that triggered a, a repeat session, but in synergy, it seemed to be the 70% criteria that was proposed in a recent uh, in the, by the European Society for Hypertension. I'll be elaborating on that a little bit later on in my presentation. So before I, I discuss the simulation setup we did, I just want show, uh, to show an example of what drug effects we see in our database, because I need to simulate studies. I need to have a sense of what drug effects we, we saw in our database. So what I'm showing here um, on the left part, I have that button does not work. OK, I'll try and point then. So on the left part, I have time on the x-axis and I have hourly averages so starting with orange being post baseline and black being baseline. And what the point I'm trying to make in the left panel is that for this drug, the delta on an hourly basis is approximately constant over the 24 hours, whereas I have another example on the right one showing a, is an extreme example of a time varying change, where the change between the black baseline, post baseline, and orange is minimal in the early morning and late at night uh, compared to the other parts during the day. But again, the most common pattern was a constant shift pattern, which is what I'm showing on the left, left panel on the slide. With that in mind, we set up a simulation study to evaluate these key protocol features and how they impact the um, uh, number of subjects required to include, exclude four millimeter mercury effect or the number of subjects that fail to exclude an effect. And again, I'm using four millimeter mercury as an exemplar. 
As I noted before, the most common pattern we saw of drug increases was a constant increase, and for that reason, I'm simulating a drug increase in that manner. Lastly, these simulations were conducted both for systolic, diastolic, and arterial pressure. I'm focusing just on systolic pressure because there are similar findings across the board. So um, in, a, in a simulation study, I calculated three different time averages, either the 24 average or the conventional night and day time average, which I'm showing on the, on the right-hand portion, so I'm not going to elaborate on further. All right, so we saw this presentation on the slide in Dr. Medal's presentation in the previous session, but I just want to pause a little bit and elaborate on, on, the, on the further results and also methodology. So what I did was I simulated a thousand studies, for example, for 20 subjects on active and 20 on placebo, or 20 on active and zero on placebo, and I repeated the exercise over and over and over for a different number of subjects in the both arms, and I calculated how many of these simulated studies excluded a four millimeter mercury effect when there was no drug effect added, and then I plotted uh, the fraction of studies that, that managed to do this as a function of total number across both arms. And the point I'm trying to make here, acknowledging this a different hypothesis, that is an approximate quadrupling of the sample size when comparing it with placebo and the solid line to the actual line of placebo. And again, this is for the 24-hour systolic average blood pressure. And the same holds true for the daytime and the nighttime. Again, approximately a quadrupling of the sample size needed to maintain 80% of the power. And for reference, I'm including the standard deviation of the change from baseline in our database on the right-hand portion of this slide. I want to focus on later to how to define, determine if an APM session is valid or not, whether if it needs to be repeated. And I'm showing the right-hand portion of this slide is the, oh, it's still there, uh, are the key, are five protocol, uh, five criteria proposed by the European Society for Hypertension. And as uh, what I want to, the point I want to make here is that the criteria are not centered around uh, the timing of the missing data, but more a number of measurements within either the 24-hour within the day or night time, respectively. Additionally, the authors of, this, of, this, of the paper with this, with these criteria ref, uh, note that the recommendations are not based on firm data. So before uh, conducting the simulation study to evaluate the impact of missing data, I wanted to explore what missing data patterns look like in our database. So this is a fairly basic slide I'm just going to walk through carefully. Uh, on this slide, I'm showing missing data patterns for the baseline to the left, post baseline in the middle, and the second post based on to the right. And each uh, panel has time on the x-axis and have subjects rank order from least missing data to more missing data on the y-axis with the same ordering between visits. And I have the two conventional uh, periods of day and night time color coded in the blue and the green uh, areas respectively. And then in each panel when there's a little black dot that represents a missing hourly opinion. The point I'm trying to make here is that when you look at the, uh, the length of these missing data segments, they appear to be isolated. In other words, most of the missing data is one hour here and one hour there. Um, another point just I, need, I need to make here is that, like with most APM sites, there was a criteria triggering a repeat session. Like here, again, here I'm looking at data before the repeat was taken, so looking at the data that triggered the repeat for some subjects. And then the other point is that there's slightly more missing data at night. So based on this observation, I'm, I wanted to evaluate the impact of missing data on uh, on uh, precision and accuracy of the treatment effect from, from in my simulations. And the way I did that based on this observation was I dropped hourly data at random. In other words, if I'm simulating dropping one hour, I might drop 1 p.m. at one visit and 1 a.m. at another visit. And I would repeat that over and over again, and then do it with two, do it with three, do it with four, and repeat that, so on and so forth. And that allows me to evaluate how dropping data impacts accuracy, which is I'm showing on the left, and precision, which I'm showing on the right. So what we're seeing here, and this, this was based on a 24-hour average blood pressure with 100 subjects, systolic. So the, what I'm showing on the left-hand portion is as we go from least missing data to more missing data, when I'm simulating a true mean effect of 4 millimeter mercury, there's, not, there's no bias in that estimated treatment effect as I'm, as I'm losing more and more data. However, when we look in the right-hand portion where I'm showing the standard errors of the precision of this estimated mean effect, as we go from least missing data to more missing data, that's a loss in precision. So the key takeaway here is that when you miss data, it's not going to bias your estimate, but it's going to decrease your precision. And in both uh, panels, I'm showing a vertical data model line, which is the 7% criteria that was, I meant, uh, discussed earlier from the European Society of Hypertension. So I also looked at how this impacts power and conclusive studies. So now I have the same data, but now I'm simulating sites without a drug effect in the left panel, 
and we can see that it is an impact. As we lose more and more, more data, we start to have more and more, st we start to miss power, uh, lose power, and that's because of the loss of precision. And again, I'm dotting in this 30% that was previously, uh, previously discussed. On the other hand, when I look at diffraction of inconclusive studies, such as a study with a true effect of four millimeter mercury, when it could did it exclude it, or did not exclude the millimeter mercury effect, we see the same pattern by the other way around. As we miss more and more data, we need more, more inconclusive studies. So the point I'm trying to make here is that under the, <coughs> sorry, under the conditions simulated, that this 30% criteria might be uh, too conservative. Um, the last protocol feature I want to discuss relates to number of measurements, power, so power measurements within 24 hour, now I'm going to be focused on, on within hour. To assess that, I took a subset of our database with all where the entry criteria had to have at least three measurements per hour every 24 hours at baseline and post baseline. From this subset of patients, I simulated studies with either three measurements power, two measurements power, one measurement power. And then I calculated the standard deviation of change from baseline for when you have one measurement, two measurements, and three measurements. And then I translated that into number of subjects required to maintain 80% power. That's what I'm showing here. For daytime on the left, nighttime in the middle, and uh, sorry, daytime in the middle, and nighttime on the right. And I'm showing you as we go from one measurement black to two measurements in orange as a, a slight in, uh, dec uh, decreased number of subjects to maintain 80% power, but there's less of a benefit going from two in orange to three in blue. I still want to put, synthesize all the results of the simulation in terms of some suggestions for consideration in terms of the primary endpoint, 24 average per metric seems reasonable. Again, the caveat is that if a time varying effect is anticipated, another metric might need to be considered. In terms of placebo control, it's not terribly surprising, but there's a cost in the inclusion of placebo, so suggest not including a placebo, <coughs> unless it's discussed by Dr. McDowell in the previous session, there might be some uh, consideration that might support inclusion of placebo, for example, a durational study or if APM is used as screening data. This regression to the mean that was discussed previously. In terms of the threshold, I used four millimeter mercury from a presentation. I only did that as an exemplar, and as we discussed earlier this morning, it would need to depend on therapeutic area and target patient population. In terms of power, at least two power, and when it comes to validity criteria under the conditions I simulated, 50% missing data seems reasonable within an individual. Again, that would depend on what type of, if there's a time-bearing effect expected of, of, uh, of the drug effect, missing data, uh, a, a validity criteria that minimizes missing data around peak effect might be warranted. And that was the thing for time, uh, thank my FDA colleagues for their input on the presentation. Um, uh, Thanks very much, Lars. Uh, next, we want to hear perspectives from our panelists, uh, starting with Charles. Well, thanks for the invitation. I um, want to start with the I'm not actually a, a blood pressure specialist, but have been in early phase drug development for almost 20 years, and that is where this potential blood pressure study is being proposed to be used is an early phase. Uh, about half of those 20 years I've spent working on uh, QT, uh, and although uh, there are differences, I think that there are reasonable similarities between QT and blood pressure that might be illustrative to have a brief discussion on. And, and so it was uh, mentioned this morning that uh, blood pressure is not QT. Uh, some, um, w one of the uh, audience members said that uh, QT is instantaneous and is not dependent upon patient characteristics, and that's not correct. QT, just like blood pressure, does increase your risk of torsades. It does not mandatorily give you torsades once QT goes out to a certain uh, amount. So for example, you could have a QT of 500, like long QT syndrome patients, uh, and only have two to three percent per year risk of torsades, because of course there are also characteristics which are necessary, such as uh, hypokalemia or hypomagnesemia or structural heart defects, which also increase your risk. So what we potentially learned from working on QT for um, the last 20 years or so uh, from a drug development standpoint was that the E14, which was written, was helpful uh, actually because they did uh, come up with a cutoff of 10 milliseconds. Now, certainly we uh, talked um, for a very long time about 10 milliseconds and whether that's appropriate and whether or not there's also risk at 5 milliseconds or 3 milliseconds or maybe 1 milliseconds 
extrapolate out across millions in a population. However, we had to cut it off someplace, and we thought that 10 milliseconds was a reasonable place to cut it off because um, although you can extrapolate uh, risk across millions of patients, you also have to extrapolate benefit across millions of patients as well. And we hope the number needed to treat from a benefit standpoint is considerably less than millions, and so you then would balance that cutoff from uh, the, the benefits that you would see from uh, a drug with, um, with potential um, issues. The other piece that we're still actually dealing with from a QT standpoint is that uh, we uh, learned that it's more effective rather than just have a single clinical cutoff is to look at the totality of evidence across the uh, potential for a signal, including both the non-clinical and the early clinical, and even what we understand, all sometimes uh, not so much, about mechanism of action of any particular drug. And that combination of these uh, leads to a much better operating characteristics from a false positives and false negatives or positive and negative predictive value than uh, we would have otherwise. And lastly, what we found was that if we've done a reasonable job in our discovery and uh, 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 chemists in coming up with a compound uh, the prior probability going into whatever study you do is low, and that influences the uh, positive and negative predictive value. It's very simple statistics. But if we have a low prior probability, and even we do a very good study with 80% uh, uh, specificity, the false positive rate uh, then actually closes the true positive by quite a bit, and that's what we saw with, um, with some of our early QT trials as well. And lastly, uh, one I thought I'd touch on is we also learned that instead of just doing a, a single dose uh, and crossover, we get a lot better data coming out of these studies looking at dose response or even more importantly, concentration response. Uh, and so I have a few slides with a, uh, a couple of more comments I won't spend too much time on. There are uh, almost sort of stream of consciousness types of comments. If, uh, if you could pull up the slides, it would be great. If not, then I might even... Um, Here, just click along. Oh, well, if I can do it myself, that's even better. <laughs> All right, so good. So then uh, I, I wanted to start it, and we've talked about a, about a number of these things already, but try, trying to actually decide what the signal is here, that certainly with terfenidine and QT, it really got us going, that we really needed something here um, to, to spur us forward, but uh, whether or not the size of the signal uh, that we are now seeing from a blood pressure problem um, is uh, worth the additional study here, I think, is a, is a reasonable question. So are we really missing these signals, especially when we put into account uh, the non-clinical data that we're getting from our dog studies or, or other animal studies, um, for example? Um, the next bit I think we touched upon, uh, in the guidance it says that we should do a thorough blood pressure study and uh, again, if you're looking at things with very low prior probabilities, uh, you might have problems with false positives rather than true positives. So for example, um, very well characterized antibodies, is that still going to need a blood pressure study? Uh, no non-clinical signal whatsoever, uh, very low risk populations, uh, all of these things probably should be taken into account. Uh, the question uh, on my next bullet is about whether we could use something similar to what we're doing now with uh, QT, that if we definitely do measure blood pressure in phase one, and maybe if we start doing triplicates, could we increase the power such and utilize the advantages of pushing the dose in your phase one studies from a dose response to find small signals uh, that we could then um, use to trigger whether you would do an additional study like an ABPM study. And that's actually the way we're doing it now at Lilly. So if we see something non-clinical, uh, or if we think that this is a mechanism of which we know is associated with blood pressure issues, or if we see something in our early phase clinical trials, then we go off and do a, an ABPM study from there. Um, the next bullet is, is just sort of a, a, a warning. We want to be sure that this is um, e an effective approach, that we don't want to repeat some of the issues we had with ThoroQT and that it turned out to be an extremely expensive fix to a, a, a problem which uh, probably did not have a huge overall risk for the populations um, that we were uh, studying. Uh, and so um, because most drugs don't uh, work and you're doing these in early phase, the uh, costs can be have a, a knock-on effect uh, and make it not very cost effective. Uh, we've already gone over the last bullet, which is, has to do with this um, negative and positive predictive values with a, a small prior probability. 
Uh, so, so just a couple of responses to some of the questions that were in the guidance. One of them had to do with um, what you should, uh, what, what we should be asked to do from a, um, when this is done. First of all, it doesn't need to be done early, and then we've already made the point about this, then it exaggerates the cost. Uh, what the cutoff should be at two to three millimeters is certainly stated several times. However, looking at what we just saw from a sample size standpoint, even four, including four millimeters, um, re is, uh, takes a very large study and um, can then result with still a very substantial false positive rate. He used a cutoff of uh, 80 percent. Um, and if you multiply that, again, times um, the prior probabilities, it can lead to very poor positive predictive values. Uh, the question was asked, is there a specific increase across development programs that would be cause for concern, or should each program have its own threshold? And so I was stating that perhaps we should try and do both. Again, similar to what we've done with QT, if we have a reasonable screening criterion based upon our totality of evidence of what we have in the early phase and non mechanism, then we can use that to then go off and say, well, we need to identify and characterize this blood pressure response further uh, with, the, uh, with a, an ABPM, which then that cutoff could then be based upon all of the things we talked about this morning, with, which has to do with the benefit risk in the patient population and so on. Uh, is probably one of my weakest, and that's whether or not you have to do it in the patient population. Historically, we've done well with healthy volunteers in phase one. Uh, certainly, there are some caveats in this case. I think I would go back with my original argument that if we push the dose and really exaggerate the pharmacology, many times we can see these signals in healthy volunteers, but uh, that's perhaps not uh, my strongest. So from a, just a conclusion standpoint, blood pressure is certainly important, but there's lots of important signals we try and find in early phase drug development. Uh, and so going and saying we have to do a, a dedicated blood pressure study, I think, is very analogous to being told that we had to do a thorough QT trial back in the day. We don't have to anymore. Now we can just look at that in, within our current phase one approaches, and it works well. Um, exploration by signals with non-clinical mechanisms of action early phase has been reasonably successful historically. Uh, we have to be careful with unintended consequences similar to the third QT with unknown study characteristics that might have poor positive predictive values. Charles, thanks for, for all the specific comments. So, um, uh, Norm, you want me to go to you next, or you want to? I mean, I'll, I'll make only a couple of, okay. uh, a couple of comments. Uh, cl clearly, our intent is not to make this any more onerous than it needs to be to um, and it's not clear you can get patients to do more than two ABPM, 24-hour ABPMs, so study designs that involve having people do three or four probably aren't going to be uh, well tolerated. Um, uh, we're obviously thinking about how to make sure that any given ABPM uh, <coughs> uh, doesn't get thrown out for arbitrary reasons, and we're trying to make sure that we've sort of thought through arbitrary reasons, and we're trying to make sure that we've sort of thought through uh, what, what, what missing data, because there's a lot of missing data possible with an ABPM recording. Um, there, Presumably, are going to be other things to learn. Uh, uh, the application of exposure response modeling uh, is is appropriate to think about, um, and there may be other things that we'll uh, that we'll uh, find along the way. Um, so, um, you know, I think I think. Uh, you know, th this this will evolve hopefully faster than our thinking did on the QT business. Um, so I'd like to get comments from the from the group Great. here. Um, thank, thanks, Norm and um, uh, Frank. If you can still hear us, um, any comments to add at this point? May have lost Frank. 
All right, well, um, in that case, let me um, open this up to uh, comments and questions from, from those of you all, all who are here. So uh, thank you all for, for teeing this up well, please. Are you asking me this question? So, so I'm not in the agency. I'm not an agency person. So, yeah, right. So to clarify, I, I heard this morning that there are certainly are, and I understand that there are differences between an 80-year-old and a 20-year-old from a blood pressure standpoint. What I would like to have further discussion on is whether we can get around some of those drawbacks by, um, by exploring a full of dose range, uh, as uh, wide of a dose range as possible. Because that's what we've done in the past with other potential safety signals. In, in phase one, we push the dose as far as we believe uh, is reasonable. But in order to cover um, those perhaps more rare events or those smaller signals that you'll see um, uh, later down the line, and I thought perhaps the same thing could work um, in um, in healthy volunteers and blood pressure. Don't know. Um, Lars or Norm want to comment? Yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, you know, this was this was a large focus of the meeting that we held in 2012 as well, and I and I and I suspect that um, uh, unlike the QT business where what you really wanted to know was whether or not you were blocking herd channels. Um, here, the system is more complicated. And I think most of us think that you actually do need to study the blood pressure presser effects in the target population, um, not, not in healthies. Uh, to get to get reasonable inferences about what's what's likely to be important. So, just m one more clarification: we would just use it as a screening tool, like we do with all of our our, our phase one. So, certainly, phase one doesn't tell you what's going to happen in your patients, but w we think that that would then give you the information to say now you should go off and look in your patients to see what happens because we've seen a signal. So, you can do it from your non-clinical as well, actually. So just a, just a, a question that's I, I suppose it might work for some mechanisms but not other because some mechanisms might take a long time to sort of mm. evolve whereas some might lend them some more to short term picking up and I think that's one of the strongest contrasts to the QT business is we're dealing with a biomarker that reacts fairly quickly to changes in plasma level that might not necessarily be true for all blood pressure mechanisms I suspect. I agree but we've got plenty of biomarkers that we measure in phase one true. which have delayed you know, tachyphylaxis True. and other and other delayed responses. Thanks. Um, I, I, uh, I know there are a number more comments in the room. I, I think we do have um, Frank on the line. Uh, Frank, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I think I was, uh, Nicholas had me muted. So just a couple, just a couple of quick comments. <laughs> um, so um, on Dr. Johansson's uh, simulation study, which was very interesting, uh, he was commenting on the amount of missing data that you could tolerate and comparing to the European guidelines. And it's very sensible um, assumptions he made. I guess I have a question. You used, you assumed that these observations were missing at random, and yet also pointed out that they're greater likelihood they're going to be missing in the middle of the night. So if I were, if I had missed all of my nighttime measurements, I could still qualify for 50 percent of having my expected number of measurements. Did you simulate what effect that would have on the sensitivity of the study? So I did not simulate that directly, but I did do the same with just looking at daytime average and a nighttime average. And again, it's just, it's just affect a four millimeter constant throughout the day, then if the patterns look the same, if you look at daytime compared to 24 hour, a daytime average would be the same as you could lose all your nighttime data. Again, it depends on your assumptions of what kind of drug effect you're operating with. Because, because then if you have a, a time course too and you're missing all the data around the peak time, then that's pretty important. And Frank, any other I guess, I, guess I would add that, 
Yeah, just I would add just the same comment I made before. We're, we're and this probably was discussed earlier. We keep focusing on the mean, but I guess I'm wondering if the variability based on the pharmacology, whatever the engine is, matters during the day and the rate of rise of change, if that matters. But um, that's probably, and I think that's a topic for future work, I suppose. I think it's a very important point, and, and was sort of alluded to this morning, but I think it'd be worth talking a little bit about, a little bit more about, is the influence of outliers on outcome. So again, from a QT standpoint, certainly 10 milliseconds doesn't do anything, but it's, we're looking for those patients that have significant outliers greater than 60 milliseconds before we really start to run into uh, to risk, and, and it certainly doesn't translate perfectly to blood pressure, mm -hmm. but likely a, a two millimeter increase for any particular patient doesn't do anything, but, uh, but if there's an outlier effect, you could choose 10, 20, whatever, that's when you really start getting into trouble from, uh, from a stroke uh, standpoint. Um, and could we do something similar uh, from a blood pressure where we, again, use a, a, some real, uh, some sensitive uh, cutoff to then go off and look at for your out, uh, number of outliers in your phase three uh, population? Okay. Uh, thanks. And any further comments on this? Doug, did you have a, and I'll go around there. Charles, I'm, I'm struck by your, your, your parallels to the QT. I, I agree with you. I think there's some important lessons that we could, we, we want to make sure that we capture there. You're suggesting looking at early phase trials intensely in, in, in a way that we're thinking, you know, we're working with QT to do. Um, I don't know that that's been summarized systematically, where someone has gone back and looked at drugs to determine whether early phase studies like that are capable of detecting the kinds of, of mean of blood pressure changes we're interested in here. Do, do, do you know about that? And the reason I'm asking is my, my heuristics, of course, are captured by my own recollections. So I was the cardiovascular reviewer for, yes, salicoxib. Um, and the phase one studies looked wonderful. I, I don't remember if there were some small non-trivial effects that were identified, but, but there, was no, there was no signal seen there at all. And so I just wonder if we've looked at that systematically, because it would be a great thing if we had. I agree. I think it needs to be done. Not that I know of, and to my knowledge, no one's doing, for example, even triplicate measurements on, on blood pressure in phase one, and that turned out to be a real boon from the standpoint yeah. of variability. You, you improve your, uh, your uh, accuracy quite a, quite a bit by just measuring just a few times in a row. Okay. Get some more comments in uh, here. Go, go okay. ahead. Yeah, and and I think Charles, you're 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 right on target. Uh, I mean, we're already doing blood pressure in the phase one trials. You know, if you look at the the schedule of events, they're there. And right now, we're seeing a trend uh, and an increase in both the SAD and the MAD for people being more rigorous or diligent in their blood pressure assessment. You know, the, the rigor and diligence has been on the QT and the ECG, but if we're looking to get the biggest bang for the buck out of conducting a study, you already got it in there, and just be a bit more rigorous in how you can do it. Now, it is a little bit different in how you build in that triplicate. It's not always feasible in some cases, and it has to do with the Clin Farm unit and how you're going to collect that triplicate data. Is somebody going to write it down or things like that? But there is definite, I think, value. But in the same light, I absolutely think that our focus here on the guidance in that area is taking a look at the, the patient population. But we're making a mistake if we don't get that data in, in, in the healthy volunteers and standardize it in an environment which allows us to do it. The other comment, uh, Lars, for you, would that 50% number scares me uh, a bit? Uh, again, only because we don't want to do this study twice if you're looking at a patient population. And I think we can be rigorous in a controlled environment because the question that's going to come, we've talked about it now, is it two millimeters, is it four? If we do not do a good job of rigorous data collection so that I can look at hour one, hour two, hour three and compare it within that patient and across patients, and I, I think, uh, Charles, you might have said it, if I miss my nighttime data, I still get 50%, or the, the gentleman on the phone, if I miss my nighttime, I still get 50%. What does that do to my analysis? So I, I think in this phase 1B, phase 2, I think in many of the studies that 
myself and other labs are involved with, we are getting a bit more rigorous to what is an acceptable hour. And in some cases, you can't repeat. We understand that. You want to get that first exposure because some drugs, you do see that response right off the bat. Um, and so you have to be more flexible and it shouldn't limit a patient's participation in a trial. Uh, but I do think we, we have to take the, the best approach to getting quality data right off the bat. No, no, I, I completely agree with the points. I, I, the, what I was just trying to make uh, the argument was that maybe if you're just looking at, if you're looking for a 24-hour average effect, the 70% is probably a little bit too conservative. That was the point I was trying to make. I completely agree with you. And that was the other point I was trying to make was that if you are interested in time course, then having a missing data card that says, I want 20 during the day, day and I want seven during the night, you could miss hours consecutive and then you would lose that completely. That was the, one of the arguments I, I wanted to make. So, so I completely agree with the points I'm making. I know there are a number of additional comments. Go in the back first and then uh, over here. Uh, Daichi Shimbo from Columbia. Uh, one question is the distribution of daytime is actually much wider than the distribution of nighttime blood pressure. So is that a fair comparison of four millimeters of mercury during the awake period compared to the nighttime period? I wonder if you considered that in your power analysis. So I, I did not. I used the four uh, throughout because in some of the in 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 my in my in my research database, most often I saw a constant during 24 hours. So I simulated under those conditions. Of course, things would change the moment you put a time course into it. And again, this becomes a little bit more complicated because a drug that has an average increase over 24 or 4, is that the same as something that peaks at 8 and goes down to 2? So it, it gets very complicated very quickly. The other thing I want to highlight, it's an interesting debate. The ESH guidelines are not imperative. That's, they just got together and decided what the minimums are. On one hand, you could argue that since during a typical clinic visit, you're only taking three readings. Mm -hmm. So why isn't on ABPM the minimum number of four? So, so, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, so, so this is where it gets, you talk about the number of readings per, per hour, right? right? So this is where it gets, that's another interesting contrast to our Q2, uh, Q2 wallet well, we've drawn some parallels to. In the Q2 space, we pay for replicates and no read. We don't, we pay a different price when we come in APM. I suppose if you do a lot of readings, just let's say 10 power, you're gonna probably see people drop out or they don't sleep with it, take device off, I suppose. So the cost for replicates is a little bit different in the, in the APM space and QT. I don't know where how that operationally works out, but it's a little bit different in terms of cost from what we've seen other uh, scenarios we've been drawing parallels to. Okay, Um, uh, Milton Pressler, uh, Pfizer. Uh, I uh, certainly would like to agree with Dr. Benson very much about uh, utilizing the uh, normal volunteers, uh, but I'm not sure that it will completely de-risk the questions we're uh, bringing up here for a couple of reasons. One is, what do you do about drugs that are too toxic to give to normal volunteers? Those are the ones often in oncology that, uh, that uh, we also have the most uh, difficulty doing even thorough QT studies because of the trying to control the studies. So that's first point. And second, I'll uh, thank you, Dr. Throckmorton, for reminding us about uh, silicoxib. Uh, but um, I... Uh, <laughs> I... Uh, also, just remind everybody about uh, torcetrapib, our CETP inhibitor. Uh, that did not have any uh, blood pressure effects in normal volunteers that we could discern. It was only when we went into the patients that those blood pressure effects emerged. So um, we have to be careful at, uh, in trying to make assumptions from normal volunteers. Yeah, points well taken, but we are doing patients much more often in phase one. Probably over half of my phase one studies now are, are in patients. Diabetes might be an exception, and certainly oncology is the rule. I know we've got a, a number of additional comments so, uh, over here. Yeah. Um, Dr. Benson, I was intrigued by your comments, many of which I hadn't really thought about, but I'm, now that I'm thinking about them. so. I understand the, the parallels between a thorough blood pressure study and a thorough QT study, but the thorough QT study was used to make, you know, some regulatory decisions, some you know, company made decisions and killed various drugs because of signals. 
Here is not, the idea isn't to do a thorough blood pressure study to, to uh, make or break a drug. It's really for labeling. So what the FDA would like to be able to do is say, here's a drug for osteoarthritis. Your typical 60-year-old woman at the, at the to be marketed dose can expect an effect of X millimeters of mercury. It's not helpful to say that normal volunteers in their 20s at a dose of eight times X had, in fact, an eight millimeter you know, increase. So it's very different from the, the thorough QT uh, study. So let me push back on that a little bit because the, the issue for us, it, it, even with QT, they, you, we were never told that, that we were going to have our, our, uh, a, um, our drug rejected for QT. It just was going to result in some labeling. But labeling is everything. And so if we can't get a label that says that uh, our, uh, um, our osteoporosis drug will not impact blood pressure, we won't go forward. And so therefore, we have to know what study to design in order to avoid a label that says we've got a blood pressure effect. And therefore, now we're back to this question of how to design that study. Well, either we can do an a ABPM with 120 patients for every drug that we've got going forward uh, from now on, which is onerous, and we're trying to avoid being onerous, um, or else we try and figure out a different way to do it. And as I mentioned, I don't know whether what I, what I mentioned about the healthies or doing it in patients and it, it will work or not, but I think it's worth thinking about, at least thinking about that mindset that we're going to actually have to start excluding some signal, not trying to, you know, it, 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 and you could say, well, it's just going to be, you know, a little bit of a label, but that's not how my boss is going to interpret it. Got a lively discussion going here. There, there are a couple of comments over on uh, this side, and then I want to go over to that table and back to the middle. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Philip Sager, Stanford. Coming back to the healthy volunteers versus patients, I, I, I agree with your comments totally about doing it in patients. There are examples, numerous examples, particularly drugs that may affect sodium homeostasis that you would not pick up in healthy volunteers. And just to remind people, earlier we saw some data from a drug used for urinary incontinence where the patients had really a minimal effect, much smaller, one-fourth of what was seen actually in healthy volunteers. So there clearly are differences. And Charles, I, I do understand that we all want to have clean labels, but I'm not sure this kind of blood pressure labeling would translate into the same, you know, kind of reaction that having a QT labeling would. I, I don't feel as, I don't feel this is as big of an issue from a, let's say, competitive standpoint as, as maybe the QT is. Well, maybe because you understand QT and you understand blood pressure, but, but uh, actually knowing my understanding of both of those, I'd be much more worried about a blood pressure effect than a QT effect. Um, one, one more comment here, and then I'm clearly going to generate some good uh, discussion. From a reality of day-to-day -day operationalizing this as far as healthy normals versus to be targeted patients, um, I, I'm Preston Dunman. I'm one of the clinical reviewers in Division of Cardiovascular and Renal Products. Um, I consult frequently for other divisions around O&D on this very subject. And what I see is that the early phase studies if you go look at the protocols, hypertension is excluded, any kind of cardiovascular disease is excluded, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the patients are dramatically younger. Um, so you, you've got age knocked out and the people who are on any hypertensives knocked out. And extrapolate those people to how an older group of people on any hypertensives are gonna behave when they get exposed to a presser effect I think you, you can't accurately do that, both as far as the mean of the population effect, as well as some fairly dramatic outlier effects that can occur. That's why you'd study it. If you saw something, you'd study it thoroughly with either your ABPM inpatients or in your phase three population. Whether it would work as a, um, just as a trigger, I don't know. So you might be right. I you know, uh, appreciate everyone's patience. We try to get all these comments in. Please go ahead. Over. Yeah, this is more of a question. Um, since uh, it was proposed to run these studies more in the target population, um, would you then also control dietary, particular um, 
salt intake? Would you also control for routine exercise programs? Um, because some of these studies are going to last for some time. Uh, they are not just done over quickly. What are the criteria which you think should be part of the control mechanisms in such studies? Any comments? I, I have no idea what right. to do. All right, well, um, if, if others have uh, comments on that too, we've got a, a few minutes left. I'm going to try to get in as many as possible. Please go ahead. So um, I just wanted to make sure I heard this right. The, this whole notion that if you see a signal on blood pressure, you're not going to develop a compound to somebody outside of the industry seems really kind of out there. And uh, be, because, so for example, in osteoarthritis, we probably wouldn't have virtually anything on the market if, if that were the case. And so since these drugs are not being pulled off the market and there are only a few of them have, have warnings, um, maybe it's just because I'm not in the industry, but that strikes me as as nirvana seeking a compound that has no off-target effects uh, that and all and for blood pressure um, as a clinician uh, I worry a lot more about QT than I will blood pressure because even though it may be infrequent if it happens it can be definitely lethal and, and compartmentalized to, to that people with those risks whereas blood pressure we know how to mitigate the risk of blood pressure by controlling. So if I know a drug raises blood pressure, a patient comes to see me, and if they can't get off of it, I intensify their treatment, diet, lifestyle, whatever. But I, it just strikes me as, as, as really kind of tough to say I wouldn't develop a compound just because it raises the blood pressure two or three or four millimeters of mercury if it's highly beneficial. The reality of our current situation is that drugs have to be more and more effective and more and more safe in order to, have, to get them paid for. And um, that's just the way it is. And then and we don't need to argue QT versus, versus blood pressure, but there's also asymptomatic blood pressure increases that you would worry about that you don't see um, in your doctor's office or that you get, get um, over-diagnosed in the doctor's office as well. So it's, it's, it's not an easy problem either way. Yeah, uh, a, a little comment on Dr. Benson's uh, question earlier, what kind of study uh, will be needed to uh, rule out increase in uh, blood pressure with a, your new drug uh, before you market it. Um, let me uh, propose another uh, way of assessing uh, the effects of uh, the new drugs on blood pressure rather than doing repeated um, ABPMs that are probably cumbersome, patients don't like them, and the uh, industry and, uh, dislikes them because of the cost. Um, the, recently, you all know, there was a very important study published by Dr. Cushman and, and co-workers, the SPRINT study, that used a unique way of measuring blood pressure uh, that was very carefully done. The patient uh, seated in a quiet room, attended or unattended with the uh, nurse present or not, and the patient waiting for five minutes uh, with the legs uncrossed and the back supported. That's the right way of uh, uh, sitting the patient, waiting to have his blood pressure checked. And this study gave us uh, tremendously good results and, and impressive outcomes uh, with blood pressure reduction. This uh, uh, method of assessing blood pressure has been uh, discussed and others like it, others they dispute it, others they think it's, um, me it measures the blood pressure too low, other they don't, others they don't think so. We and others actually compared with other uh, types of uh, blood pressure in the office with ABPM, with home pressures, and uh, we found that actually, if it is well done, the sprint way of measuring blood pressure is equivalent to ambulatory blood pressure. In fact, we just published the first paper uh, in JAHA with 146 patients, and actually the daytime ABPM was identical although there was variability with ABPM. Um, um, so the um, sprint way of measuring blood pressure, I think, is reliable, is reproducible, is easier to do. And if you do it two or three times uh, to uh, exclude the visit-to-visit -visit variability, it can give you pro probably results equivalent to ABPM, easier to get, cheaper, 
and more acceptable to the patients. Didn't they use a replicate design in that? Or, or no, they did, right? Yeah. So, and, and again, that's analogous to what we learned with QT, that we learned that you had to do it right, you had to lay them down and keep them quiet, and it was not easy, but figured it out eventually. Yeah, other comments? A very lively discussion. So we are just about uh, on time, uh, which is nice, uh, later, later on in the day. Um, we're going to take a break for about uh, 10 minutes or so and, um, uh, and then uh, uh, reconvene. So I guess, we're a little, I guess we are running a little bit late, uh, but not, not too bad. So uh, maybe uh, 2.55 uh, aim to uh, start again. And uh, thank you all very much for uh, uh, stimulating this discussion.
ask our uh, panelists for uh, this session three panel to uh, come on up. That's uh, Mitch Krukoff, uh, Philip Sager, um, Michael Weber, and then uh, William White's going to be joining us by phone. Um, while they are, uh, come, while you all are coming up, let me um, introduce this last session. Um, so we've covered a lot of methodologic issues during the course of the day. In this session, we want to highlight some particular methodologic concerns and outside and outstanding issues in the realm of presser study design. Uh, for this effort, uh, for this uh, session, we're going to have two presenters to highlight uh, two different uh, issues, followed by some reactions from our panel uh, and then uh, input from those of you who are here with us in the room uh, and joining online. Uh, the two presentations are by uh, Daichi Shimbo, uh, who is Associate Professor of Medicine and the UIG Clinical Scholar at uh, the Columbia University Medical Center. And Daichi is going to present on ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and risk assessment. Uh, after that, uh, we have a presentation from Rajnikanth uh, Madabushi, who's team lead for guidance and policy in the Office of Clinical Pharmacology at CEDAR. Uh, and uh, Rajnikanth will present on clinical pharmacology considerations pertaining to presser study design. So uh, uh, we'll get these discussions going now. If you look at your agenda, the next session after this is a session on open audience feedback, which obviously might blend into this one. But I want you to be thinking ahead for uh, any questions or any <laughs> topics you want to make sure are addressed before we wrap up today. Uh, we will have some time to uh, uh, do those uh, topics, uh, even if it doesn't quite fit into the uh, the schedule of this session. But right now, let me turn to uh, Daiichi for the first presentation. Good afternoon. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, and if you speak, uh, try to speak uh, kind of directly into the microphone, it helps. So I'm going to give you a five-minute overview about is blood pressure and ambulatory blood pressure monitoring the right metric for assessing risk? I do have some disclosures. I don't have any financial conflicts of interest, but I am currently vice chair on an upcoming in press uh, scientific statement from the American Heart Association on blood pressure measurement. I'm also chair of a new uh, uh, policy statement on self-measured blood pressure, and I'm a voting member on AAMI, which sets standards for blood pressure measurement. Uh, I will say that uh, I, my opinions are mine only and do not reflect the American Heart Association, the CDC, or the AMA. So I think you know this. There are two primary ways to measure office blood pressure. This has been the mainstay of the diagnosis and treatment of hypertension. There's the <laughs> auscultatory method and the oscillometric method. If I had more time, I'd probably bore you to tears about the differences between those two. But I will say that currently, the oscillometric method is now becoming uh, probably the standard in clinical practice due to environmental concerns because of the uh, auscultatory method, which is typically in the past been done by the mercury uh, column. I think the issue is that this kind of method relies on making sure that you have well-trained staff. And I only list some of these here, but I think you all know this, which is that there are multiple quality control issues about letting the air out, there's digit bias, failure to allow for five minutes of rest, patient position, and so forth. And something that I'm prone to, which is expectation bias, as a cardiologist, I keep taking that blood pressure until I get the value that I like. <laughs> I think the other issue is that there's a small number of readings that you typically take in clinical practice. And, you know, it's usually one or two, and even the best research studies, you're taking at most three and possibly four. And if you actually look at recent guidelines, in order for you to get really a good estimate of office blood pressure, you're not only supposed to take multiple readings at a single visit, but you're also supposed to take it across multiple visits. So for example, the 2017 AHA guidelines on high blood pressure actually mandates two plus readings at a single visit and having it on two plus visits. And then you average all of those readings Data from my shop, there's an investigator named uh, Ian Cronish actually showed that 
more confidence is gained by actually increasing the number of visits rather than increasing the number of readings per visit. And that's particularly important because if you're looking at safety issues, really can you rely on a single office blood pressure visit with maybe two readings to estimate whether a drug is safe or not. The other thing I want to uh, tell you about is something about ecologic validity, particularly when it comes to out-of-office monitoring. It's very interesting. Even when done under the best of circumstances, you're trying to do blood pressure on a validated, standardized way in the office setting, but aren't you really trying to estimate what the person's blood pressure is in the real environment? So the example I used to give is, or I always give, is if a FedEx driver has a clinic blood pressure that's 110 over 60, but yet is uh, lifting heavy boxes during the entire day, sweating, and their blood pressure is 200 over 100, I would argue to you that the out of office blood pressure is actually more an ecologic blood pressure than the well-conducted clinic. So in fact, we have two different methods of actually looking at out of office monitoring. Of course, I'm focusing on ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, but there's another one called home blood pressure monitoring. It's an estimate of what we call ecologic blood pressure or true blood pressure. It's less reliant on clinical personnel, particularly ambulatory. Ambulatory method is actually an automated method. Just goes, keeps going off on a set frequency, and you're not reliant on actually the patient or even clinical staff to actually set that up. And importantly, there's more readings on ambulatory than there is in a single office visit. So this is a patient. Uh, you can see the this, this circled red is a systolic. Uh, you know, the blue line is systolic, and the red line is diastolic, and the circle is the office blood pressure of this person. And then 24-hour ambulatory monitoring was placed, and you can see that you can get daytime during the awake period. There's a blood pressure dip at night, which you're aware about during sleep, and there is a morning surge when someone wakes up. And in fact, you can average the daytime or awake readings to get average daytime. You can average the 24-hour readings, which is the readings across the 24-hour period. You can discuss whether or not you're gonna weight those averages during the awake and sleep period, and of course, averaging the nighttime periods. Just to show you this is you get it that it's outside, it's ecologic, and in addition, you're taking many more readings that you would typically have obtained during a single office visit. This is just primary data. This is a meta-analysis. In the black box actually is uh, estimates, the hazard ratios for the rows are different kinds of cardiovascular outcomes. You can see there's mean 24-hour, mean daytime, and mean sleep. The black box is before you adjust for office blood pressure. You can all see very consistent increased risk of cardiovascular events per increase in 24-hour, daytime, and then nighttime blood pressure. The red box is after you adjust for office blood pressure. It's important to signify these are blood pressures that were done very well in a research setting. And you can see here that the hazard ratios are only slightly attenuated to signify that, in fact, out-of-office monitoring, in this case, blood pressure on ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is a significant predictor of cardiovascular events. There's a lot of these kind of meta-analysis. What's very interesting is in these meta-analysis, office no longer becomes a significant predictor when you adjust for both office and ambulatory. And that's not just an issue of multiclinearity because there's actually a poor correlation between office and any of these measures on ambulatory monitoring. We can also put people into different categories. If you have high and low clinic blood pressure and high and low ambulatory, I think you know these categories. If you're high on both clinic and ambulatory, you're what's considered to be sustained hypertension. And if you're normal on both, that's considered to be sustained normotension. And these categories that sort of cross are the discordant categories. I think you all know white coat. White coat is high clinic and normal ambulatory. And then mass hypertension is normal clinic and high ambulatory. I'm only showing you this, I don't have time to go through all the data, but you see the ones that are in black font. The data are pretty consistent that the ones in black font are actually associated with the highest cardiovascular risk, and the ones in white font are actually associated with the lowest cardiovascular risk. And I should show you this is, if that's the case, do you see that ambulatory is actually the most important predictor of cardiovascular events than clinic, because really the high-risk categories are determined merely by ambulatory. Now, uh, 
I have to be thorough. I was asked to discuss multiple metrics of blood pressure. The other out-of-office monitoring is actually self-measured blood pressure or home blood pressure monitoring. Slightly different. It's not an automated, it's semi-automatic. The patient actually has to press it, measure their blood pressure frequent times a day, and then get an estimate like we see here. This is a person that actually measured a blood pressure two times a day. At each occasion, measured, took two readings, and then did it across a two-week period. So it is slightly different than ambulatory, where in ambulatory you're getting it over a 24-hour period. This is getting it over days to weeks. And I don't have data to show you, uh, a lot of data to show you, uh, just because of the time limit. The data mimicking home to cardiovascular events and office to cardiovascular events mimics the data on ambulatory, which is that home systolic and home diastolic both are associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular events, but office is not a significant predictor of cardiovascular events when you adjust for home blood pressure. So in this reason, at least in the United States, we're now beginning to embrace actually for the routine diagnosis and treatment of hypertension, it really should really uh, not only rest on clinic blood pressure, but also on out-of-office monitoring. This is a uh, level, uh, you know, class of recommendation one from the ACC AHA guidelines in 2017. Now, I'm often asked which one is better for cardiovascular risk. We did a meta-analysis actually, and we found that the data are too small to actually say that one is superior to the other. I will say that most of the body of evidence, if you just look at the evidence across the past 40 years, actually heavily weights toward ambulatory. It's not that ambulatory is better than home, it's just that there's more evidence. In fact, that's why, for most reasons, ambulatory is the de facto reference standard, at least for blood pressure monitoring. So this is my last slide. I was asked to talk about what are the evidence-based gaps. I have to be careful. I have esteemed randomized controlled trial scientists in the audience, and in fact, there are actually very few uh, randomized controlled trials where people are randomizing to treating their office to a particular goal versus treating their ambulatory to a specific goal. We just don't have those outcome studies. However, I would argue to you that's probably not the right question whether treating ambulatory blood pressure is good or bad because I believe personally if you have high blood pressure, it's bad, and lower blood pressure is better. I think the better question is, what are the treatment goals? What are the thresholds by which you have to treat to? And in fact, the thresholds on ambulatory and home are virtually all dependent on observational studies. They are not dependent on uh, CVD events from, uh, from randomized controlled trials. So that's a huge evidence-based gap. The second thing is I just highlighted is, yes, I'm here standing at an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring conference, but really we don't have empiric data to suggest that it's superior to home. It's just that there's just more evidence with ambulatory compared to home. And then I've heard a lot of people talk about dipping or nighttime blood pressure. It's an important debate because there's lots of evidence that should suggest that nighttime blood pressure during sleep is a significant predictor of outcome, independent of the awake blood pressure. The problem is that we don't have many randomized controlled trials where what we call chronotherapy, where treating nighttime blood pressure actually is better than treating daytime blood pressure. Now, there is one trial called the MEPEC study from Spain, but that's really it. And in fact, I only note this because if this is an epiphenomenon rather than a causal factor, then really do we have to do ambulatory monitoring during the 24-hour period? It may be better just to do it during the awake period, which as you showed, actually has less missing data. So I just wanted to throw that, throw that out there. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and next is Raj. Thanks very much, A.T. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting and providing me with an opportunity to provide some thoughts on the clinical pharmacology considerations here. Uh, many of you might know uh, clinical pharmacology is a multidisciplinary science that is concerned with translation uh, of the relationship between drugs and humans. It's a very simplified uh, definition. Uh, there are many sub-disciplines under this uh, field, uh, many of which are very relevant for designing studies, uh, conducting analysis, and informing use. 
Some of these uh, are pharmacology, which talks about the mechanism of action, pharmacokinetics, the time course of blood levels, uh, pharmacodynamics, the time course of blood effects, uh, the drug effects, as well as the relationship between the drug exposures as well as uh, the effects and many others. Uh, for the purposes of today's presentation, I will focus on two aspects, which is the pharmacology and exposure response, and I will provide some considerations. I'm, I'm happy that the previous session happened because there are going to be some of the themes that will be reflected here. Uh, the first most important is the concept of uh, understanding the pharmacology of how these drugs uh, manifest their pressure effects. Uh, we have some understanding of some of these mechanisms based on what we have seen in past. Uh, broadly, I have put them into three categories, but many of them do have mixed mechanisms. Uh, for starters, there are the central acting agents, which are generally associated with sympathomimetics, uh, or your antidepressants, or stimulants, and also associated with some of your weight loss drugs. Uh, the latter of those are also associated with some of the heart rate effects. The other is a classic salt or sodium or water retention phenomena, uh, generally associated with uh, the NSAIDs uh, and some oral contraceptives uh, which contain estrogens or progestins. Uh, and, and third is the category which is uh, involved with the nitric oxide activity, reduction of it, or the endothelin uh, one uh, production increase, uh, which we know uh, the best examples are the VEGF inhibitors, uh, also associated with some of the calcineurin inhibitors, uh, as well as the glucocorticoids. And, and there are some which exhibit uh, mixed mechanisms, parts of all these three mechanisms. It's very important to have a a priori understanding of what might be the mechanistic basis for some of these processes, because uh, I think they are going to help inform uh, some of the study design considerations, mainly uh, with respect to study duration, uh, or even uh, choosing the study population, which has been uh, the focus of discussion earlier in the day. Uh, so how is pharmacology important for, for figuring out study duration? There are some mechanisms which where which, are, uh, which evolve very quickly. Uh, in those situations, shorter duration studies may be possible. Uh, for example, uh, for deloxetine, uh, there was a study which showed that as early as around four days, the effects on the depressor effects could be demonstrated. Uh, it was almost like a QT kind of a study wherein it was titrated to reach to the supratherapeutic dose and with every titration within four days, the the steady state levels uh, of the blood pressure effects uh, could be demonstrated. Uh, the other example is with the tyrosine kinase inhibitor uh, sunitinib, wherein within one week, blood pressure effects were demonstrated not only in normal tensive patients, but also in hypertensive patients, and it was maintained at that particular level. So in those situations, shorter duration studies can be envisioned. Uh, however, for some mechanisms, this is not possible. Uh, the classic example is that of Ibuprofen. This goes back in while this is around a 1987 publication where they did uh, an eight day study uh, uh, with uh, 2400 milligrams per day, 800 milligrams TID, uh, and they did 24 hours blood pressure monitoring. At the end of the day, Ibuprofen did not show any difference compared to placebo in pressure effects. However, we heard from the precision trial clearly roughly around a four millimeter mercury increase. So some effects which are slow evolving, short duration studies may not be possible. So, so uh, having some understanding of how these pressure effects are manifested is going to be very useful to inform the study duration. Similar thought process could also be put for identifying the study population. Those which are fast evolving are those which are, uh, those mechanisms which are more prevalent in a particular population might be a population of choice because they would be more sensitive for manifesting these effects. Uh, the examples uh, are those which uh, act uh, through the sympathetomimetic pathways, uh, wherein healthy volunteers which do demonstrate this kind of a pathway are going to be more discriminative or sensitive in demonstrating the pharmacological mechanism of action. Uh, we saw this uh, for Mirabegron. Uh, we, we also saw this for Duloxetine and many other stimulants. Uh, wherein uh, healthy volunteer studies were possible uh, to, to be discriminative. However, for the uh, 
uh, ibuprofen situation where it is on the sodium retention, uh, a healthy volunteer study could not be uh, discriminative because there are compensatory pathways which are going to mask the signal compared to those of a target population where these pathways are impaired and as such they are going to amplify the signal and we are going to be able to discriminate. So pharmacology or the understanding of how these pressure effects manifest is going to be very useful uh, to inform the study design elements. Hmm. Now I'll switch to the second topic, the concept of uh, dose response or exposure response and why it is important. Uh, primarily, we are looking for small, modest effects. We are not looking for large effects, which would be self-evident. So the evidentiary basis for calling something as a potential presser, uh, having supportive information is going to be very critical. Uh, for example, if, if a dose or a concentration response relationship is demonstrated, that could be very powerful evidence that the, the drug in question is presser uh, or you could call it as. I'm showing here an example which we presented at one of the advisory committee meetings for Merabagron for overactive bladder. This was also presented earlier in the day. Uh, on the left, uh, I'm showing you three different doses, 50, 100, and 200 milligrams once a day. Uh, there is a clear dose ordering or arranging. And in, this was from a thorough QT study where moxifloxacin was used as a positive control but was used as a control or a negative control for blood pressure purposes. Clearly, there is a rank ordering here. Uh, they also had collected PK for the purposes of QT, uh, concentration QT relationships. And we took a look at it, and we were able to show a clear positive slope. Uh, it is possible in some situations, especially for something such as fast evolving in a sensitive population, one would be able to utilize uh, dose response or exposure response relationships uh, to be able to identify a drug whether it demonstrates pressure uh, properties or not. However, there are some caveats. Uh, there are a lot of learnings we have from the uh, concentration QT experience, but not all of them are directly uh, translatable or applicable in the same fashion. Maybe there are some principles. Uh, for example, uh, when the effects are slowly evolving, uh, we cannot utilize the one-to-one -one relationship with the concentration, such as the entire time course, uh, to be able to uh, derive a relationship like we have in QT, because the effects are very proximal and a time course could be utilized there. Uh, in this particular case, for slow evolving uh, effects, maybe summary measures of exposures uh, should be utilized to try to understand what is this nature of relationship. Maybe it is an area under the plasma concentration curve or an average uh, concentration at steady state or a trough that could be utilized. There are a couple of advantages uh, of having characterized an exposure response relationship for pressure effects. This would be very useful for trying to project what might happen in a supratherapeutic kind of a situation, uh, specifically with respect to drug interactions, wherein uh, if the drug in question is a, is a potential victim and there are going to be exposures beyond what is on an average that is seen at the clinically relevant doses, uh, there might be a possibility to extrapolate what might be the effects in that situation. Uh, however, this might not be possible to extrapolate to unstudied populations of interest. Uh, it's still unclear or there, there, is, there is enough uh, of a concern of the ability to extrapolate to different populations. Uh, it's not sure whether we can use a healthy volunteer uh, relationship and assume that that exposure response relationship will be similar or it will be steeper or it will be blunted. So there is some uncertainty. However, having exposure response does provide you with information whether the drug can manifest pressure effects. So in summary, uh, I think clinical pharmacology considerations could be very useful uh, in not only designing the study, such as the study duration or study population, but could also provide valuable evidence whether a new molecular entity in question has pressure effects or not uh, in a sensitive and discriminative population and may have the ability to project to what might happen at a supratherapeutic exposure, uh, a concept that is similar to that of uh, QT in, in some QT assessment in some, some relationships. That's a summary. I would like to thank many people who helped me in, in coming up with these thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Raj.
All right, so we've had uh, two presentations on different methodologic issues in presser study design. Um, and I'd like to turn to our panel to kick off the discussion. Uh, Mitch, we'll start with you. Well, Mark, bear with me, but I'm, I'm a little troubled sitting here toward the end of the day because on the one hand, uh, I think we risk tipping into kind of flailing over two millimeters of mercury. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think we've seen unequivocal evidence at a population base that there's a darn good reason we're talking about this guidance altogether because at that level, at a population base, we see a significant rise in events and, and meaningful, clinical, bad events. The trouble is the, the gap in between because blood pressure, as we mentioned earlier, like heart rate, is a signal that's driven from multiple different directions in a human being, one of which is drug exposure. And whether that correlates with the whole story and the outcomes or part, you know, if you get down to an individual level, we've heard a lot about the technical challenges in a single individual really understanding whether this is a two millimeter blood pressure change, that's one. I think clinically, uh, as a clinician, you know, if my pressure's if my patient's pressure is 160 or 162, I don't care. They're, they're both bad. And if it's 120 or 122, am I really going to say he's at higher risk? I don't think so. And, and patient confusion, if the label says, well, this drug's been demonstrated to have a 2.5 millimeter rise in blood pressure, is that going to be confusing or helpful? Or And I, I think it's, it's in that disconnect between what we know is the population-based reason that we're here, which is a public health rationale to talk about a safety concern and a guidance toward that concern. On the flip side, also as a backside of potentially debilitating a lot of uh, innovation. And if it's not really carefully crafted, leaving the sense that here's another Pandora's box, here's a door that opens with a minimal signal, meaningful signal, but that comes with what that follows that. More burden, more and, and you know, I think we have heard we could be back to where we were in 2004 when Janet started Critical Path Program because rising costs and dropping productivity were, were barrier-based approaches to our clinical evaluation of stuff. So I think concentrating on the high-risk side, where really is the high, high, high-risk domain is, is key number one to keeping this right. But I think the second part maybe is uh, what worries me more is that a lot of the conversation today to me, and particularly when we get to this part of the discussion, where do we go methodologically, is incredibly conservative. Uh, I mean, in the, in the 21st century, the tools that we need to take a signal that's driven by multiple sources like blood pressure and figure out what the drug's role and risk and benefit really are, we're not talking about the right toolkits. We're not if you have to do multiple prospective clinical trials and then flail the data into extrapolated overextension, we're in the wrong zone. The toolkits in the 21st century for this kind of thing are mobile devices and patient-centered approaches and patient-empowered internet sites that have 450,000 patients in well-identified clinical syndromes, diabetes, Parkinson's, patients like me, et cetera, who are already putting their experiences and sharing their experiences with one another. We have Google and, and all of these big data owners who use all of their firepower for marketing data. Well, why not tap some of that? And I, you know, my erstwhile boss full-time is now my half-time boss, but his other half-time is, what if you put a public health app on those same resources instead of marketing? And to what good, could we use the ability that if in a sort of a standard preclinical evaluation, a drug appears to raise the blood pressure by two millimeters of mercury, we have public health oriented resources that could really help us sort out based on what and in whom and who really is high risk. And if we need sub, sub, subsets, patients who have vascular disease and hypertension and a history of an MI, they're really the high risk. Why do we talk about 100 of them as opposed to 100,000 of them uh, potentially taking a new blockbuster drug? 
So I, I really look for that as the frame shift of where do we tap on behalf of the public health and the, the ripple effects of that are, because it was mentioned several times, uh, pick your number, but a half to two thirds of human beings in the United States with high blood pressure are undetected. And frankly, in this country, our children, by the time they reach puberty, are already fat and hypertensive at an alarming rate compared to any other country on the face of the earth. And we're going to start treating them with pills very early in life. How do we sort out lifestyle versus pills versus... So there, there's a very big public health resource here that is essentially untapped. And all we're doing, based on the discussion I'm hearing, is potentially opening a door that dumps the responsibilities back on industry. Why don't we think a little more broadly about how all of us and the whole question of undetected hypertension plus drug safety risk could be sorted out by thinking more widely about our ability to lock and link in prospective trials that may have a safety signal into public health information resources that could help us sort out really what that safety signal means. Th thanks very much, uh, Mitch. Uh, next, uh, Phil. <laughs> No, Mitch, you, you raise uh, some great points. I, however, I do think, you know, the direction of having this kind of guidance to me makes a, a lot of sense, that this is an area where we really haven't paid very close attention to blood pressure effects in clinical development unless they're pretty extreme. Uh, having said that, I, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time kind of alluding to a two millimeter increase. You know, I, I think the guidance needs to really be kind of drug and patient specific and maybe it is a two millimeter increase for some drugs in very high risk populations but a different threshold in different populations. I think I don't think there is any one set number. You know it does um, having a careful evaluation makes sense. I think we talked a little bit about healthy volunteers, patient populations. I think there's been a lot of data presented in discussions today that do focus on this needing to at least be definitively done in a patient population, but it seems to me adding ambulatory blood pressure monitoring in a phase two study is not really all that onerous or difficult, uh, and it's a study that has to be done anyway. However, we've also discussed healthy volunteers, phase one, and that is an area where, well, I don't think it's definitive having Evaluating blood pressure more carefully in phase one than it's probably done now, potentially in triplicate, having a standardized protocol for blood pressure assessments. Uh, seeing a signal early there could be very useful in designing the future clinical development program, but typically the blood pressure data we see in phase one is really hard to make anything of. And again, it, even for a drug that really affects blood pressure, you may not see it in healthy volunteers, but if you do, and potentially using exposure response modeling, Raj, as uh, you, you talked about, I mean, if there is a signal and it does have a relationship, that, that might be helpful. Of course, there are a number of mechanisms where you would not expect to see an exposure response relationship because of delayed effects. So you're not gonna have a relationship to PK. But still, I think, to me, this makes me think that we probably should be looking a little bit more, care somewhat more carefully in phase one. That's really easy to do. It's a very minor adjustment to how we currently do phase one trials, because if we see a signal, that, that could be helpful in terms of uh, further drug development. Thank you. Sure. If I can quickly, quickly, yeah. Uh, so you're correct, not, not every mechanism is going to manifest that quickly. Uh, even for slow evolving, uh, drug effects, if the appropriate exposure metric is available at the steady state of the blood pressure effects, uh, an evidence of a, a positive slope is going to be very powerful uh, information to say that, okay, there is a drug-related component despite all the noise and, and, and all the difficulty in having a precise measurement that we are talking. So that, that's going to be useful no matter what, but the way one goes about uh, uh, planning for, for evaluating the exposure response will change from, from, from mechanism to mechanism. Exactly, that's right. 
Thank you, uh, Michael. Yes, well, first of all, I, I do agree that if we're looking for modest or small changes in blood pressure, then placebo-controlled studies with ambulatory blood pressure monitoring are appropriate. And I don't think uh, anyone has expressed a, an opinion different from that. I do think, though, that, that the way we manage this and label this problem has to go directly to patients. I, I agree very much with what uh, Vasilios uh, Papadimitriou said uh, earlier, that well-measured blood pressures away from the office or in the office uh, can be a very good alternative. Anyone who's done ambulatory blood pressure monitoring on himself or herself knows that this is not a procedure you want to do more than twice, and even that is pushing it. It's not comfortable, it's not easy. Uh, the sprint method, I believe, it should become the standard in everybody's office, uh, and, and I feel that very strongly. It's not hard to do, it's not an expensive device, it's about a $500 device, it's completely automated, Everyone in their office, even in busy offices, there's always an examining room where you can put a patient for five or ten minutes and let the machine do its work and give you a reliable measurement. In Canada, this has been the standard now for a couple of years, and uh, it, I think it'll soon be the mandatory method for obtaining blood pressure measurements in that country. And I, I think we, we should be encouraging that here as well. I think this issue of some drugs causing increases in blood pressure should be labeled. And just as the FDA now says about antihypertensive agents that high blood pressure is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events and that treatment of high blood pressure or reduction of high blood pressure reduces the probability of strokes and heart attacks, we should have the converse labeling for drugs where we think there is an increase in blood pressure. We should simply say flat out, increases in blood pressure are likely to increase the probability of strokes and heart attacks and other cardiovascular events. And we should, anything that can be done to prevent this from happening should be encouraged. We should label drugs that have blood pressure raising potential, even and said, right on the label where patients can see it, that this drug can raise blood pressure and it is recommended that you check your blood pressure on a regular basis, whatever the wording uh, would be. Home blood pressure monitors now are easy to use, they're reliable, and we should strongly encourage that. Uh, uh, you showed that, you called it the ecological blood pressure, and I think that's, that's terrific. People don't have to get obsessed about measuring the blood pressure, but if they measure it once or twice a week, and maybe after a while, if it's consistent, once, right. or, or once a month or every couple of months, that's super. And if they see a trend they don't like, they know to talk to the doctor. And I think we can initiate that process through labeling and education from the FDA. I think that, that is, is, a, is a big step forward. And I think uh, by sharing this problem with patients, we, we're gonna make a major progress. Thanks very much, uh, Michael. Um, I, I think we still have uh, uh, Dr. White on the phone. Uh, William, are you still with us? I've been with you all day, <laughs> not just in spirit. <laughs> Please go ahead. I just want you to know that this, the census has dropped from about 122 to 80 on the um, webcast. I've been following that, but we still got a pretty good group <laughs> listening Thanks. in. And I've, been in, I've been in pain for the last three hours because I haven't been able to speak about many um, of the comments that were made that, in a sense, for having been in this field for almost 40 years, and like Michael Weber, having done ambulatory monitoring in research and practice for, I don't know, 35 of those years, I started to see, sense a lot of reinvention of the wheel in some of the comments. So what I decided I will do right now is focused primarily on the guidance 
that Norman asked for comments on in ways to make this as non-onerous as possible in the appropriate situation, keeping in mind that doing a study in order to evaluate whether a drug does or does not raise blood pressure into a clinically relevant um, level is different from clinical practice, it's different from epidemiology, it's different from pharmacology. It's basically a simple test. Now, so here's my comment. Standardized clinic blood pressures in this scenario are far better than home blood pressures. Home blood pressures are not reliable in clinical trials of short durations to evaluate for a drug effect. It's less likely to pick up a signal. Of course, these standardized clinical blood pressures have to be done properly. I don't care if they're attended or they're not. If they're done properly, they're going to relate very closely to daytime ambulatory pressures. There's a lot of data, a lot, that shows that to be the case. Second point, really placebo is not needed if you really just want to determine whether a drug at baseline, at treatment versus baseline raises blood pressure. What's important to control is the environment of the test on those two occasions in short-term studies. If one day somebody's laying around watching TV all day long and the other day they're working actively, you're going to have a very substantially different blood pressure because of that. So the condition of the behavior of the patient has to be controlled. And I'm not advocating for inpatient studies for ambulatory monitoring. I think that's a terrible idea because you completely reduce or remove the circadian rhythm or circadian biology of blood pressure by doing so. I'm in total agreement with what Mike just said, that two ambulatory blood pressure studies is all that people can really tolerate for um, the retention into the study. Uh, and it doesn't, if you, if you want to study a drug that's got a typical half-life, uh, you probably can do it in four weeks. Crossover, nice, but reduces retention and compliance. You've got to worry about washout and all that stuff. If you were, had to rule out a two millimeter um, difference in blood pressure in an ambulatory monitoring study, you have a huge sample size to contend with. And I heard somebody from, I think, Eli Lilly say that 120 patients for every drug was onerous. Well, this would be a hell of a lot higher than 120 patients in order to rule out a two millimeter um, effect of a drug versus baseline or even versus placebo. Or versus placebo. So, and then what would, what would you do if you found out that, you know, 150 drugs on the market raise blood pressure by two millimeters mercury, like Tylenol and, uh, you know, low doses of uh, NSAIDs and so forth and so on? What are we going to do about all those drugs? Do we label all of them? Do we even know to label that? I don't, I don't really think that we have an answer for that question. And finally, the idea of healthy volunteers versus patients with the target disease, I, I am in agreement healthy volunteer data will not be satisfactory for a situation like this. If you know what the target is, that's the study the population should be utilizing. And then if the population is a low-risk population, not very likely to have hypertension, not very likely to have diabetes, not very likely to be old, study them. I don't disagree that enhancing the population with those populations that increase the, the chance of, um, you know, bringing out the signal are reasonable, but not if the patients are never going to take the drug. So I think that we have to be thoughtful about that when requesting sponsors to increase this and that subpopulation when that, population, that subpopulation will never be treated by that drug. So those are some of my comments, not just from the last session. By the way, both speakers did a beautiful job, but it's my comments from about the last three sessions because I finally got the stage. Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, Dr. White. Thank, thank you very much. Um, let me ask any um, um, reactions to the comments that have been heard so far from those of you on the panel? Great, very good discussion. Okay, I would like to open this up uh, again to those of you in the room for comments on the topics we've talked about here, keeping in mind that if there's something else you'd like to talk about, we do have a session coming up right after this one. Um, Sid, was that you? Okay, great. Yes. There we go. Uh, just a small comment about uh, what Dr. Shimbo's discussion and it seems to me that uh, here we're t trying to determine what a drug does. Right. So whether a dr so is there any real difference between a, 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 a drug that raises 
someone's office blood pressure from 130 to 140, uh, and you, you know, and it raises their ecological blood pressure from 120 to 130. Either way, we know we know the drug is having an effect. Yeah, one thing I didn't say, and it was partly built into my question, is the the distribution of ambulatory is actually narrower than the distribution of office. And I only mention that because that actually it has implications for um, you know power analyses. Because again, a four millimeter office change is different than a four millimeter daytime blood pressure change on ambulatory. The second thing is, uh, and I don't know the non the literature on uh, meds that are non-antihypertensives, but antihypertensive drugs actually have differential effects on office compared to ambulatory, which is that there's a greater effect on office than on daytime ambulatory monitoring. So I'm just bringing that up. There's slightly different kinds of oranges. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I have nothing else to say. Thank you. <laughs> We'll see. Um, other okay. questions? Yeah. <laughs> On the bottom. Right. So, yeah, so back there first, then up, up here in the front, uh, Robert. Okay. Yeah, go, go ahead. So, uh, hi, I'm Chris O'Connor. I'm actually a heart failure uh, yeah. clinical trialist, so we actually, uh, in our class four patients, like to see two millimeters of blood pressure elevation in our patients. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. But uh, I, I really like the uh, comments made by Dr. White and others about the SPRINT methodology. I mean, I think if we're thinking about the number of uh, development programs that are out there for the whole wide range it's going to be very hard to be embedding large uh, sub-studies of ambulatory blood pressure measurements uh, of sample sizes that are going to be sufficient. And so I think um, getting our clinicians and our colleagues to use the SPRINT methodology, which we should be using in practice because it has afforded such a great benefit, this is the way we should be practicing medicine now. And we shouldn't be saying, listen, the sprint methodology interrupts office flow. It's too cumbersome to do. It's probably the most important thing we would do in a clinical uh, visit with a patient. So um, providing guidance on uh, around the sprint methodology, I think, would be a, 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 a pathway, a swim lane that we could start with, uh, uh, potentially, that would not be onerous, I think, for, uh, for drug development. I have a comment. In my opinion. Oh, yeah. Do you want to? So, uh, you know, Bill Cushman's in the room, so I, I'll defer to him. But you got to be careful about the sprint method because, you know, the sprint method is often thought as to be an unintended approach. A person's put in a room, the coordinator leaves, pushes a button, it's automated, measure three to five blood pressures. But in fact, it wasn't done at all patients in sprint and all visits. And so I know people often say it's a sprint method, but uh, we currently don't know actually if there's a benefit to actually using the unattended approach where you're putting someone in the room compared to if you're just standing in front of the patient and taking a good a standardized blood pressure measurement. And if you look at the Canadian guidelines, they're based on data where they're comparing a sort of a casual, crummy clinic blood pressure to this unattended method. And this unattended method typically is lower, and the argument would be, oh, gee, it eliminates white coat hypertension. The problem with it is that in those studies, the comparator group wasn't blood pressure well done in a standardized approach, just like in the AHA guidelines, and oftentimes participants were not randomized. It was often the crummy blood pressure that came first, followed by the unattended office blood pressure. For that reason, in the Canadian guidelines, although I do like this approach, it's actually a level D evidence, uh, which is that they are recommending it, but it actually is very poor evidence in its support. And I think that more, more work has to be done in this area. I think there is promising data, but I don't think it's there yet to actually say that it should be imp implemented in clinical well, practice. I'll let Vasilios respond first, and then. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm gonna give the microphone to Dr. Kushman next, but I, I have my own opinion here, and I, I mm -hmm. respectfully would disagree with mm -hmm. Dr. Shimba because <coughs> This has been discussed extensively <coughs> and researched appropriately. 
By now, there are at least eight studies that compare attended and unattended, and it's identical, it's the same. So we don't have any questions there whether the nurse was in the room or outside the room, if there is any difference in the blood pressure. They are just about the same. The SPRINT study also did an analysis of those centers who did attended versus unattended, or they did mixture, whether there was a difference in outcomes and there was no difference right. in outcomes. So the, the SPRINT methodology, if you follow the guidance of uh, having the patient seated in a quiet room uh, with the legs uncrossed and the back supported and not talking during the blood pressure measurements, provides a very reproducible mm -hmm. and reliable blood pre pressure measurement either attended or unattended, and I think it should be adopted as the standard of care, as Dr. Weber said. So a couple of, uh, couple of other comments before we finish this. Okay, uh, three others before we finish the session. Okay, am, am I on? Yeah. I, I want to very much agree with Dr. Weber's comments that labeling is, is the key to this and perhaps helps bridge the gap between the epidemiological data and the individual data. Yeah, that <clears throat> if a drug is, that raises blood pressure is identified by the FDA, and the FDA, something that says this drug raises blood pressure, the next sentence is absolutely key. Some of the sentence, as is, as is, is worded now, is this drug is associated with increased cardiovascular risk is not nearly a strong enough statement. Santa Claus is associated with Christmas. Turkeys are associated with Thanksgiving. <laughs> we need a statement that, that conveys causality. Right. Because we believe, I believe everybody here believes, that blood pressure is causally related to cardiovascular events. So if the next sentence is elevated blood pressure is known to increase cardiovascular events, heart attacks, and strokes, a statement that conveys causality, and even another sentence that patients and their physicians are advised to work together to manage their overall cardiovascular risk. Yeah, I, I think it really depends on the patient population and the degree of blood pressure. I, I think that as a blanket would be probably not consistent with scientific data. All right, two more comments before we wrap up this section. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think Dr. Papinimitro said most of it. As far as uh, Sprint, I, I won't go into how it happened, but everything was very standardized in the way the blood pressures were measured. Um, and the most important thing, I think, was the uh, waiting five minutes and, and taking multiple measurements and not interacting uh, with the patient. Uh, some sites did do it with the uh, staff person in the room and some did it with the staff person out of the room and I won't get into why that happened. But it, anyway, we analyzed it. It didn't seem to matter even right. though we didn't do that randomly, but others, uh, such as Dr. Papandreou, have done studies um, looking at random order. And uh, so I think the, um, you know, and I can just say that in large clinical trials, it's just never been considered affordable to do ABPM on, on the entire population and to have your entry criteria and your uh, titration based on it, also for the reasons that have been mentioned that you just can't do. Uh, ABPM over and over again on an individual patient and have them tolerate it. So we were frustrated over decades and decades of clinical practice and clinical trials and not being able to get well-trained um, uh, research nurses even to measure uh, escultatory blood pressures consistently correctly uh, as, as well as they wanted to do it. And so that's the reason in, in recent decades, such as in Accord and Sprint and others, uh, we have abandoned the uh, manual escultatory yeah. method and gone to uh, uh, isometric method. I just want to quickly respond, because I don't want there to be misunderstanding. I think the blood pressure measurement in Sprint was very high quality. I think when we say the sprint method, I think some people are thinking unattended, while other people are thinking, oh, highly standardized. And I'm just saying that I'm not convinced yet about the unattended piece, but I do think that uh, the high quality piece is extremely important, which was done in sprint. 
The, and, uh, the technically correct uh, term, by the way, is not the, the sprint method, it's the automated office that's blood right. pressure. That's what it's called. Yeah. You don't have to use the word sprint. Good, Good to know. And then uh, last comment. Yeah, uh, along those lines of consistency, of course, using the, the replicate or triplicate automated system with the, the proper time in between, we often overlook the, the simplest of that, and that's actually selecting the right cuff. Um, I think there does have to be a, a point that individuals should have their arms measured in a clinical trial and because not all cuffs are the same size and we know that there is a significant potential of, of getting a, an incorrect blood pressure for not using the right size cuff. So that whether it be guidance or just in your clinical care or in your clinical trial, making sure you use the right size cuff is important. And the other component going more to the clinical trial side of things uh, has to do with, again, trying to remove variables that can affect blood pressure. And I don't know if it was discussed, uh, but there is a consideration, I think, when you take a look at a patient population, not the healthies, uh, of doing an orthostatic assessment, either for screening or at some point in the trial, because the idea is to try to remove the potential other effects that could affect blood pressure on the individual other than the drug. So I don't know what percentage of the population has an orthostatic change. I don't know if you're just looking at CNS indications, but is there value in implementing an orthostatic assessment, maybe at screening? I don't know. I would leave it to Dr. Weber, Dr. White, uh, Dr. Cushman, Dr. Papadimitrio, uh, you know, how that would affect it. But I'm looking at more from a clinical trial and addressing potential variability in what could change the blood pressure. We do know that in certain parts of the population that we do see orthostatic changes. All right. Well, I want to thank our presenters and panelists uh, and all of you for a, a wide-ranging discussion on some important methodologic issues. Thank you all very much. And uh, for our last session, for topics that you haven't had a chance to discuss yet, we're going to have our FDA colleagues back up here up front uh, to bring up any remaining issues. I'll turn this over to Greg. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So this is the uh, last session for open audience feedback. Uh, um, as if we haven't already done that throughout all of the sessions. This is the opportunity for you all to get any points or comments or questions on the table before we adjourn. And I'd like to invite uh, some of the FDA leadership, uh, uh, Dr. Doug Throckmorton, Deputy Center Director for Regulatory Programs at Cedar FDA, um, in addition to um, those that you've already met, uh, Norm Stockbridge, uh, Bob Temple, and Ellis Unger to um, also join me up here. Um, so we don't have prepared remarks uh, for this particular session, although at the end Doug will help uh, uh, summarize some takeaway points from the day. So let me go ahead and just open it up to the audience for any additional comments, um, things that you heard that you think are really important that you want to make sure um, are on the record and, and, and are considered, or uh, questions or, or other comments that you might have. And I'll also invite the audience from online uh, also to uh, e email questions to uh, presser at um, uh, edu uh, to go ahead. So uh, any, open, any thoughts? Oh, okay, great. That table back there, it's been an active table all day. Uh, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go back to that one. Um, eh, no. Maybe I'll speak talk up more loudly. Okay. Um, yeah. Citizens Health Research Group. I'm trying to put together a lot of the things of the day, which is, I guess, what the session is about. And just to quote from one part of the guidance that has come up, it said, "quote this is, quote small sustained increases in blood pressure, two to three millimeters of mercury." Chronically at the end of the quote, and they cited the fact that there is logic evidence that this can cause a problem. Um, I was interested in thinking again about the whole dose-response curve when Dr. Matabushi had his very nice presentation. And I was just thinking that
Great. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, I won't call on any of the FDA uh, um, uh, uh, leadership up here, but if any of you ever want to, um, you know, comment, just wave your hand and, and, and I'll, um, I'll go. Okay, Bob. <laughs> well, I'm not 100 percent sure I understand what Sid was saying, but it certainly is true that, among other things you should know, is the dose-response relationship for effect on blood pressure. And that's important because it's going to help you decide whether to increase the, uh, the dose, whether the, uh, the improvement in effectiveness is enough to justify it. And it'll make you more conscious of looking for that when you raise the dose. So there's no question that kind of information should be available. Um, it's also, I just want to just support what Raj was saying before, it's very, I mean, we, we never have enough doses in our trials. Uh, and I don't expect to. But the concentration response relationship data, which our ClinFarm people almost always look at, is a source of information about what you should be thinking about and what you should be looking for. I just want to put in a plug for that. Okay. Um, okay, over here. Okay, Ellis. 
Yes. Um, so you threw out the, the 160 number, and someone uh, about a half an hour, also half an hour ago, also threw out 160 as a as a blood pressure of concern. He didn't care whether it was 160 or 162, and likewise didn't care whether it's 120 or 122. And I think we all would agree. So maybe what we really do care about uh, is the outlier population, and maybe you want to know, you know, what percentage of patients, you know hit 140 at some point or hit 160 at some point, um, because maybe that would be uh, a more informative way uh, to look at the data. Um, I, I just want to point out, you know, we, um, well, I'll, I'll wait to one of the things I want to say, but um, it's not like we don't get blood pressure data. So as I mentioned this morning, I mean, I'm looking at, at a, uh, a drug for a neurological indication. We have 44,332 measurements of blood pressure in that development program. Here's a psychiatry drug. We had 33,443 measurements of blood pressure. Blood pressure is being measured, but the problem is I think we're getting what, what you refer to as crummy, crummy office blood pressures. And maybe if we instead tr tried to improve the, the methodology so that we got good blood pressure measurements that we could hang our hat on, realize for, for chronic use, uh, a drug, uh, typically we get uh, a data on 1,000 patients, right, for a year. Well, that's a lot of data, right? So it's just a matter of measuring blood pressure well, well enough that we can, we can make something out of it and explain, okay, X percent of people hit 160 and X percent of, and Y percent of people hit 140. And maybe that's where we should be going with all of this. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I would just um, amend some of the things you said, Ellis. Um, First of all, I think we have lousy blood pressure measurements because in most studies, particularly if it's not a cardiovascular drug, we're not that interested in what the, blood, the, the patient's <coughs> blood pressure is if it isn't 80 over 50 or 250 over 160. It's purely, these things are generally done just to make sure the patient is safe. And that's, that's where it goes into that category. And then, the fact is that we have lots of data and, and we could improve their measurement. But the, when we have lots of data, it's also analyzed very, very poorly. Uh, we, you know, they throw in these integrated summary of safety, and they don't care what the randomization is between, among studies. They don't care you know, differences in when, the, when blood pressure is measured, anything like that. They don't, it, it, I don't think we've even really tried to do that. And I think, do think we do get a, a tremendous amount of information that's lying there and because we have so many patients, and because so much of it is placebo controlled, we have a lot of information about uh, within patient variability. And the whole case that's being made about ambulatory blood pressure monitoring that we can only do twice in a patient, which isn't a good indication of with, within subject variability, is that we think that within subject variability isn't a problem. But I think it's, it's in there. I think we, there are lots of ways in which we can demonstrate that a drug elevates blood pressure. And it, does, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. You just need to do, need to make a confident determination that, 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 it's, that the evidence points in this direction. Then we can put that on a label. And I think also, uh, the entirely separate comment, since I have the microphone, is that... Um, and it's working. <laughs> yes. Is, well, we, we, we label a drug... Can be with, removed, though. For, you know, if we put a warning on a drug, say for Stevens-Johnson syndrome, we say this drug, you know, uh, has been associated with or can cause Stevens-Johnson syndrome. When a patient is taking a drug, we know whether or not they have Stevens-Johnson syndrome. But when we put a label on the drug saying it, on, on the average it raises blood pressure four millimeters of mercury, I don't know whether it's raised blood pressure in this patient at all or whether it's raised by 10 millimeters of mercury or, or whatever. And even if I know that, Blood pressure in itself is not the, the harm, it's a risk factor that may or may not lead to some morbid event going on. So that's a couple of degrees of separation that we're dealing with. And uh, so I think there's, a, you know, there's an element of false precision and false certainty that we're, that we're trying to build into the system. Uh, Bob. Maybe everybody already knows this, but I think what we're trying to defect to detect is the possibility that the drug increases blood pressure. And we said, we, we say, oh, at least 
two uh, millimeters of mercury on average. It's not because everybody thinks that a two millimeter increase from 120 to 122 is going to kill anybody. But you know that if it increases it some, there's going to be a distribution. Some people will have more and some people have less. And that it will do that in populations at all levels of blood pressure. So it tells you be on the lookout. And that's what we want everybody to do. Um, what your threshold uh, is going to be depends on other risk factors, the age of the patient, uh, all those other things. It reminds you that you're supposed to look, and I think that's all we're really talking about. So we want to detect it, whether it should be an average of two or an average of three could be debated. That's not what's critical. But you're going to look at it because going from 160 to 165 probably increases your risk. And we care about that. We have all kinds of data showing that risk is a continuous measure, uh, a continuous variable. It increases with, uh, with, uh, with the increase in blood pressure. We know that. It might take three or four years to happen, but for a chronically used drug, that matters, and you're supposed to worry about it. And I think that's all we're talking about, detecting the drugs where you have to pay attention. Uh, OK, back to the table. Um, I, I think the, that's an excellent point to take away. And, and the other point is that we talked about before is enhancing the, the quality of the assessment itself it is a key factor. Again, going to what data do we have to take a look at. Um, I, I'd like to continue to, to support a term called complementary blood pressure assessment. If you take the, the ground floor of doing better office blood pressure assessment, standardizing the process, identifying that potentially the compound has a signal, then using a decision tree as to what's my next best method of defining that potential blood pressure signal. Some things may be longitudinal because it's going to take time to see that. Some things are going to be better done by ABPM in two series to see what's my initial dose and is there a dose concentration? The more am I exposed to that drug, do I see that signal? And that goes back to the clinical pharmacology and what we understand about the drug activity. So I think it's not one or the other. I think it's, again, doing a better job at, at part one, which is getting good office assessment, and then taking that next step as to what am I learning about the drug. In that early paper that we did at the CSRC, there was a decision tree, and it was something, you know, again, that we, we adapted a little bit from Dr. White and Dr. Pickering of when to use ABPM. Um, so I, I do want to emphasize the fact that the, the concept should be complementary. It's not, you know, one or none. Um, and again, to, to focus on the, the quality of the collection, we have examples before this guidance ever came up of companies doing a good job of defining a blood pressure signal. One of them is clearly there was a, a drug, uh, Treximet, that, uh, that had a blood pressure signal. Um, there was a post-marketing requirement for them to assess the blood pressure. In this case, it was better to use home blood pressure because the patient was taking the drug at home and they were able to assess it. They got some 50,000 blood pressure points, and at that point, the reviewer is able to say, no, there's no you know, dangerous signal, but there should be something put on the label that says this drug does affect your blood pressure. So I think that's important. If we take a look at sinitinib and axitinib, really good work done on the blood pressure there, which defined the change between cycle one, day one, and cycle one, day 15, and was there a, a continuous change in blood pressure or increase in blood pressure? There wasn't, but it did define that there was a blood pressure change, benefit outweighed risk, but now the clinician, he or she knew that there was going to be a change in blood pressure, and I think that's as Dr. Temple is saying, it's kind of what we want to be able to people tell people. So I just wanted to give those two examples and to emphasize the fact that the component is complementary assessment of blood pressure. Okay, go ahead. Not yet. Okay. Samples of uh, compounds with small changes in blood pressure that were detected with the lousy blood pressure monitoring. 
So we need to be very careful that we, in order to optimize the <coughs> pressure that is critical, is, is, is very important, that we don't move the pendulum too, too much. Uh, I think there, there's definitely a room for every PM. Is it every PM for all at all the times? I'm not sure about it. And a, and a good example is what was shown here with the data from the FDA with the placebo data. Based on that, there are a couple of placebos and I'm going to be a little bit facetious that require a labeling change because it changes the blood pressure by two millimeters of mercury. So we need to be very careful where we would put the pendulum and, and not to ask, ask too much and hopefully learn within what we have and not an extra for the solution is not thorough everything. Thorough blood pressure, thorough renal, thorough liver, thorough CNS, et cetera. Great. Uh, Anna and then... <coughs> There is something that we also need to talk about. We don't have interoperable data where we can understand the outcomes, you know, in electronic medical records to be able to go back to data that is traceable, fully traceable, that we know that it was exchanged in a way that is still uh, accurate, then uh, until we cannot get the outcomes of this type of measurements, the final outcomes, uh, it's very difficult to communicate at this point when we are trying to, we have data in Cerner or in EPICS and we are trying to transfer that information, we have a moving target because the, the, the bugs are being fixed constantly, new functions are being added, and then all of this makes, uh, makes the data become unreachable, cannot be configured to uh, improve comprehension, then uh, we need an interoperable healthcare system. Okay, thanks, Anna. In the back. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify what I think Bob was confused about what I was saying and then extend for 20 seconds more about what he was saying. I think the reason I read what was in the guidance was that FDA did have some discrete amount, didn't say whether it was two or three, but I think that just as there is a uniform labeling now, which I think is appropriate, even though there are degrees of difference for all the NSAIDs, just basically says this essentially may increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, it would be a binary thing. If you met whatever the threshold is, two or three or above, you would get a standardized label. Because I think what Bob was talking about, when I was talking about this before, is that our a public health effort that will inform more people about something that's well documented, would be better documented. doses where you go up on both the blood pressure and that's, I, I was not saying to stick in the label which a couple of people thought what does or does not increase the risk differ on how old the patient is but it will precipitate I think more often than not Okay, um, other comments or questions? Okay, uh, great. So um, with that, I'll th turn things right over to Doug. Um, to, to in, in the re rest of you can stay up here as we'll be wrapping up pretty shortly um, to summarize some uh, takeaway points uh, that, that he came, came out with. Yeah, thanks, Greg. And, and, and thanks to Duke for, for holding this. Uh, I was. And, and thanks for letting me come. Um, I, you know, I've, uh, I'm not allowed to attend meetings and of this kind very often anymore. And it's it's been a real pleasure, a tremendous learning opportunity for me. So it's not um, due to past uh, 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 behavior at Duke events. It's other. <laughs> uh, look, look, there's a lot that, that, that you guys have talked about that I'm not going to comment on. Should should we be looking at blood pressure in ways that we're not to date, ways to improve it? Um, if so, how we should do that, 
know, was this conversation about different kinds of measures and things like that and when we should do it. Those are conversations I think that we're going to listen. We've, we've heard a lot of good conversation about today, and we're going to need to take back. Uh, fr from where I am, the, the thing that I came to this meeting with uh, an ear towards more than anything was what would this guidance, what would the ideas that we had in the guidance mean for product development? And I think we we'd some, had some of the conversation about that this afternoon, and I, I really appreciated that. Um, I think we do have to take into account the lessons of QT prolongation, but I'd also say we have to take into account the lessons of drug-drug interactions and the lessons of LFT measurement and the, all of the safety measurement things that are discrete that we perform as a part of product development. And, at, and, and for each one of those, as they've been added on to the drug development paradigm, we've had to work through how we did them, what we asked for in terms of guidance. We're, we're, we're in the process of putting out a guidance on um, a food effect um, measurement, um, how to decide whether or not there's a food effect in a drug de during de during drug development. The guidance is highly detailed and, 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 and in, in many ways dovetails with some of the things that you guys are talking about. And I'm going to be watching that one really carefully because it, it's a, you know, there is going to be an additional burden that's going to be placed on Thing, and we've tried to be very thoughtful in the ways that we've laid that out to minimize that to the extent that we can. So I think we have to talk about all of those paradigms, whether it's QT and the current concerns that you all have voiced in the past about impact on product development. I think you know we need to avoid those the, the, those those lessons to the extent we we possibly can, <coughs> um, but also LFT and all of those other things. So that that's the first thing because <coughs> as I think about them, um, what others have described as false numeracy. The ability to quantitate these effects has led to overemphasis on them, and 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 you know whether it's QTs or it's LFTs or it's white blood cell counts, the ability to count them and create thresholds has led to them being the focus of early product development in a lot of ways, um, and, and it's made the thresholds that we set in our guidances more than usually important because they're sometimes misunderstood. The threshold for the that's described in the guidance that, that, that Ellis and the group have been talking about is, is a threshold for determining a pharmacologic property. So you, we're, we're looking for a, a way to identify or exclude a meaningful pharmacologic property in, in, a, in a product development. That's different than saying, if you're over that threshold, you're in big trouble, your product can't go forward. And, and we've not always message, messaged that as carefully as we could have, and I think we need to hear from industry about what we can do to make certain that that doesn't happen again. Yeah. We, don't, we don't want these thresholds to be viewed as barriers that prevent products from going forward because they're never, they were never intended to be that way. Um, and and I, there may be FDA reasons for that. There are also, in, also industry reasons for how those guidances have been interpreted. And I hope that you all comment on ways that we can, can perhaps message those barriers, those, those, uh, the thresholds if they're included so that, that we don't have that problem. The, 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 you know, the second thing to think about is what the guidance is about altogether. It's, it's to guide medical product development. And, and we, know, we know something about the kinds of information that we need to include in guidances like that. They need to have clarities of outcome to be straightforward and easy to measure to the extent they can be. They need to be easy to measure, that is, within the normal practice paradigm to the extent possible. And, and quantitative measures are preferred over subjective measures just because they're easy for all of us um, to assess when we're looking to determine whether or not the product exists. So as we think about the guidance, to the extent you're recommending changes to it, think about the goals of the guidance, the need to be as clear as possible to guide medical product development that is efficient and transparent and, and scientific. Um, in that sense, one size fits all um, is not an insult. Um, the way it was used, I think, in, in some sessions earlier on in the, in, in the day. It, its intent is to make it transparent and common to have an, a, 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 a straightforward single way to go forward and not, and not something more than that. Um, uh, so where do we go from here? Um, I'm going to take issue with uh, Charles Benson, and I don't see him around here, so I can't tell if I'm taking issue with a person that can't defend themselves, but it, anyway, ah, uh, all right, so, so he, 
Ch Ch Charles and I have, have, have had wonderful uh, dis discussions. One of the things he said at the end of the morning was um, that from his perspective, medical product development was, was becoming, uh, drugs were required to become more and more effective and more and more safe to get onto the market. Um, I, I don't go back to the 70s or the 80s, Bob, I'm sorry. I do go back to the 90s. Um, in terms of my in terms of my time in, in, in the agency and, and I just don't see that I see the natural progression into product development product development begins with products that have high risk and and can have high risk and have high benefit and as the product area matures there is a natural progression towards products that have fewer adverse effects, a natural progression towards understanding better the risks of those risks and making them known and labeling and managing them and mitigating them. And I, I see that playing out in a variety of places. It played out in antihypertensives. This, this group knows that better than, than, than any. You, know, you, you, you look at the, the hydrochloroth, the thiazide diuretics and things that were available in, in, in the early 70s for treating, anti, for treating hypertension. You had to be hospitalized to start some of those medicines. I mean, the you know incredibly complicated, highly potentially adverse re, uh, re reactions to them. We've gotten better. That transition, I think, occurs in all therapeutic areas, and I I think it behooves all of us just to understand that's a natural thing. It's instead what we have to do is make sure that we are are one identifying those risks as cleanly and clearly as possible, and then finding ways to manage them better. And here I think the FDA is making progress. And I'm, I'm looking at Peter Stein, who's the head of O&D sitting back there. I think we've made some progress in a few things. One, I think we're better at systematically identifying and evaluating all of the risks and the benefits. Um, through the benefit risk template we've got, I expect the reviewers to find, to, to, to bring in and identify all of the benefits and all of the risks. I want to try to do away to the extent possible with the, the um, undue focus on one, one benefit or the undue focus on one adverse effect. In fe instead, the benefit risk uh, template is about a systematic looking at the totality of the data and then transparently saying what you think about the benefits and risks. And about. I think it's a good thing. I think that's the, the mechanism whereby a pharmacologic property like an elevation in blood pressure following a drug uh, being administered gets integrated into the larger spectrum of benefits and risks of the product, we're going to make better decisions when we have that. I also think we're doing better at managing risks. Um, uh, the, the, the 2000s were a time when we had to struggle to manage risks of identified products in the post-marketing space, and I think we've gotten better. I think we understand now that we can't just reach for the most restrictive risk mitigation tools that we have available to us. Yes, we have restrictive tools available. Not allowing a product on the market is obviously the most restrictive tool that we have, you know, one of the most restrictive tools. We now understand those things aren't necessary. It's not in the public health interest. It's not the kind of way we should be approaching drug regulation. And I think under Peter's tutelage, I think with Janet um, uh, in, in the position before, we're doing better looking at products in the full uh, range of their, their benefits when we think about whether or not a product can be on the market. And so I think these kinds of pharmacologic properties will be viewed in that broader context in ways that they may not have been viewed, you know, back in the day when I was a medical reviewer in, uh, in, in Cardiorenal. So the last piece is alternative options, uh, alternative approaches. I think that's another strength of the Cardiorenal pro uh, a division. And and I would say FDA's approach in general. They are sincerely and genuinely open to alternative approaches. You all have raised a few of them that I think that we need to, exp we need to talk through and understand better um, in, in the days going forward. I'd really like to understand um, ways to improve early blood pressure measurement in these clinical development products. The, the numbers that Ellis gave are pretty striking. 35,000 blood pressures measured. I'm sure many of them are not measured very thoughtfully. If there were ways to improve that and use that as a, as a marker that we could understand better, I think we've got to be able to think of, about the possibility to do those kinds of things. Um, critical path was mentioned. Um, it's all about being willing to question your assumptions. 
It's all about being willing to look at alternatives. Um, Janet set it up in 2004. It is that, that, that spirit still exists. And I, I guarantee to the extent an alternative is demonstrated to be um, supported by data, um, we're absolutely interested in incorporating it into our practice and re review paradigm. Um, so you all have a very challenging <coughs> task, a, a, a data task, a challenge on you to, to, to get some additional data, better understanding about how these products are being developed and the kinds of data that we might be able to bring to bear. But I, I, I see this as a positive, um, a positive opportunity. To, and I, I, I continue to believe that understanding this pharmacology, <coughs> given the public health impact that it could potentially have, is valuable for all of us. Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to speak and, uh, and safe travels for everybody. Great. Thanks, Doug. And uh, just as a quick wrap up from my perspective, uh, um, so the issue of, uh, you know, blood pressure effects of drugs uh, during clinical development, um, obviously, as we heard today, is not, uh, is not an easy issue, and there is no clear slam dunk uh, answer. But one thing that I would say, and I think is clearly evidenced by the folks from the FDA in the room today, um, is that the FDA is uh, taking the development of guidance uh, that is useful and practical uh, very seriously and, and is thinking about this very thoughtfully. We've heard a lot of, um, a lot of consensus today um, around some issues um, and a, a lot of uh, um, suggestions, really good suggestions on how um, guidance can be improved or how um, to t better deal with uh, measuring these blood pressure effects and when to do it and how to do it uh, d uh, across a range of uh, uh, different populations. Um, very good uh, uh, insight and um, discussion that could be and will be, I'm sure, useful to the FDA as they further consider um, uh, the, the guidance. Uh, so as for next steps on the Duke side, We'll be making the slides from today as well as uh, the wonderful video of, uh, of all of us all day long um, available online. Um, and we'll also be publishing a summary of, of today's discussion as well. Um, before you go, I do have a list of folks that I would like to thank first and foremost, all of you who are in the room today um, who contributed to the discussion and stuck with us. A lot of times we get, you know, trickling out after the lunch and you sort of thin uh, attendance uh, by the last session, but that certainly did not happen today and, and uh, as a testament to how important this issue is. So thank you very much for, for your uh, participation today. Um, we did work cl very closely with a lot of FDA colleagues um, in developing this event, um, uh, Norman uh, Stockbridge and, and, and the folks sitting at the panel up here, in addition to Naomi Lowey, uh, Meg uh, Peace Fai, Mona Fizat, Fred Senatori, Christine Garnett, and Z McDowell. Uh, thank you very much for all of your guidance uh, in planning today's session and today's uh, event. Uh, I'd also like to thank those um, experts that we uh, worked very closely with outside of the FDA to further refine the discussion points and recruit speakers, uh, Phil Sager, Billy White, uh, Michael Weber, and Mitch Krukoff. And then lastly, I'd like to thank and acknowledge uh, the individuals at Duke who helped uh, in planning the event. Um, uh, they weren't responsible for the microphones, but uh, were responsible for everything else, including uh, Morgan Romine, Nicholas Harrison, Sarah Saprisi, Elizabeth Murphy, and uh, Patty Green. So thanks again to all of you for today's uh, discussion, and have a very nice evening.